Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Session of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners into order. Uh, first item on the agenda is for Commissioner Thompson to provide the invocation and the pledge. Okay. Um, just like to say with a world that we live in, so confusing, so distracting, it can just really get you off your game and just really weigh heavy down on any of us that are looking at the TV or the internet or whatever every day. I just encourage us all to focus and focus on the right things. And so I'm just going to read the Psalms 23, which um, we had a great message in church yesterday, and our pastor would suggest us to read this every day, so I thought, well, I'm just go big or go home here. So, um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We're very blessed to live in this country, this state, this, this town. We've got so much Alamance County. I just pray we really protect that and guard that and always respect each other and listen to each other. So let's stand for our amazing flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, okay, next item of order is recognition. Have a recognition of central com uh, communication staff and award training certification. And I believe that is Mr. Haygood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, we have several folks uh, with us from 911 Central Communications and the Sheriff's Office that we'd like to take a few moments this morning and recognize. So I'm going to start off with uh, staff from 911 Central Communications, and I'd like to ask uh, Myra Williams and Taylor Smith to please come up and join me at the podium. And I see Stephen Sigmund, the department head, please come up to you, Stephen. Folks, come. Please stand right beside him, and I'll I'll read the uh, the recognition and information. So, Ms. Myra Williams was named the APCO, which is the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials, 2021 Support Personnel of the Year. Myra has excelled working as a telecommunicator and training officer. She is excelling in her current role as a quality assurance specialist. Myra was promoted out of a group of 15 other highly skilled applicants in the winter of 2020. She is compassionate about the citizens, first responders, and her fellow team members. Even in her new role as the QA specialist, Myra still ensures the shifts are covered and volunteers to work when knowing a shift is short due to a call out. Myra Williams acts and is a positive shining light working as a telecommunicator and QA specialist in the midst of serious and stressful calls. She ensures all her teammates, including myself, which is including Mr. Sigmund, uh, are okay if she notices something could be wrong or if they seem stressed. Myra has been there for other staff members when they have lost loved ones because that is the type of compass compassionate person she is. She is a role model for other telecommunicators and a role model for anyone in any profession. I've never met a more genuine and positive person than Myra Williams, and with that said, she is more, deserve, more than deserving of this award, the 2021 Support Personnel of the Year Award. So congratulations, Myra. Right. Thank you. And I'd also like to read a note of recognition for Taylor Smith. Taylor was named the NINA, which is National Emergency Number Association, 2021 Communication Center Employee of the Year. This is, these are both national awards. Uh, Taylor can be counted on to pick up shifts independently and at the request of supervisors whenever she is available. She rotates shifts and often makes extreme sacrifices in her schedule, either to train new employees or to accommodate the needs of others. 
Taylor is one who consistently looks for ways to improve as a telecommunicator and always volunteers to be more active with outside agencies and engage in any available learning activities. Taylor can also be commended for always being one of the first to complete her monthly trainings with accuracy. The hard work and determination that Taylor exemplifies on a daily basis does not go unnoticed. Many team members utilize her knowledge and strength when necessary, and she is depended upon to help the days go by a little smoother. Taylor does all of these incredible tasks with, with the most humbleness, and we are grateful to have someone like her on our team. So congratulations, Taylor, being named the 2021 Communication Center Employee of the Year. And uh, I'd like to recognize CECOM also, uh, CECOM's training program was recognized by APCO uh, on a national level and uh, their training program has been reviewed by APCO and determined to be high quality. This is very important for all the members of our emergency service community. They all depend on these folks tremendously. All of our 911 calls begin right here with these individuals, with this department. Emergencies in Alamance County start here and they finish here too. And we just uh, are very appreciative of Stephen Sigmund and Myra and Taylor for the hard work that they do. So thank you, thank you very much. Seven in the state, so we're the eighth that has the certification. That's awesome. fantastic. I really appreciated the work that CECOM has done to bring themselves up to national certification uh, levels and to be recognized on a nationwide basis. So congratulations to both of you. And congratulations, Absolutely. Stephen. Continue, please, sir. <laughs> and we do have uh, two of the, two of our highest awards from the sheriff's office, two life-saving awards, and I'd like to ask that the uh, sheriff, if you'd like to come up, and I think the sheriff is going to come up too. And then we have uh, deputies Henley and Fry, I believe, are present. Come on up. I'll, let me stand up here. I'll leave you. So, Commissioners, the Sheriff's Office has requested that uh, they be allowed to appear this morning and recognize the hard work and the life-saving activities of these two deputies, and I'm going to read their citations at this time. On June 4th, 2021, deputies responded to Pollard Avenue in reference to an overdose. Deputy Hen Henley was unable to find a pulse on the victim and began to perform CPR. He then administered Narcan and continued to perform CPR until the Elon Fire Department personnel arrived at the scene. The victim, who was still unconscious but at that point had a pulse, was then transported to the hospital for further treatment. Deputy Henley's fast response and actions helped to save a life that day. And on June 8, 2021, deputies responded to Deep Creek Church Road in reference to an overdose. Deputy, Deputy Fry arrived on the scene assessed the situation and administered a dosage of Narcan to Mr. Daniel Clark, who was unconscious at the time. Moments later, Mr. Clark became responsive and began to walk and talk on his own. Without Deputy Fry's quick presence and willingness to act, Mr. Clark's fate may have changed. And commissioners, I'm sure you'll join me in recognizing both of these uh, gentlemen, these deputies, uh, quick thinking, hard work, and uh, good training. So, Sheriff? I'd like to present to you, Deputy Fry. Uh, life saving awards in recognition of your action that resulted in life saved on June 8, 2021. Give your life saving pen that will go on your uniform. Good stuff. <laughs> Deputy Henley is pleased to and recognize your action that resulted in life saved on June 4, 2021. Thank you for your service. And that goes on your uniform, and I wish you your hand. Thank you so much. Thank you for your service. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. And Thank you. Sheriff, if you would still stand here and explain you? something oh. right behind you. Uh, <laughs> Chief Buffalo from Elizabeth City, North Carolina, we sent several of our people to Elizabeth City where they were having major protests down there. And uh, Chief Buffalo, Elizabeth City Police Department, I guess was so impressed with our people, I certainly was, 
uh, because uh, we were able to control the situation down there with other officers and he drove all the way up here to present this award to the Imanis County Sheriff's Office. And uh, I want to thank the men and women that were sent down there because it was long hours. Uh, sometimes you ate, sometimes you didn't. And uh, we have a group of great men and women with the Alamance County Sheriff's Department. And I'm not saying that just because I'm sure. I'm glad to be an Alamance County Sheriff's. Thank you. Mr. Sheriff, the High Sheriff of Alamance County, we recognize you, your entire department, and just want to say thanks. Thank you, sir. Okay, I understand we have one speaker. Is this uh, Madam Clark? She's not here. Oh, right here. Oh, I can't see you. I'm sorry. Uh, is this the front end or the end of the meeting? I don't think they specify. He's sitting on the back row. Mr. Walker. Uh, is this pertaining to a topic that's on our agenda? What you had to say? It's pertaining to trash down to the plant. Okay, we'll need to hold that to the end of the meeting then. We have two different segments. Uh, the first set of speakers are things that are on our agenda, and then the last set of speakers are things that are not on our agenda. So if you just hang on, please, sir. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank Landfill, you. Landfill is on the agenda today. Landfill is on the agenda? Mm -hmm. Okay. I've been reminded that part of the landfill information is on the agenda. Come, come on up. We'll hear from you now. I was up here probably about a year, year and a half ago, wasn't it, with the car? And <clears throat> talked about the trash. And we got y'all got the tarp put over the trash, people hauling it down there. But over the big trucks. Well, they're going down there now, and the pickups have trash piled way up over top of the pickups and one little strap around it. And they're falling bags. Is falling, I counted five bags coming up here this morning on the pole. They're falling off the trucks. They need to put a tarp over the pickup trucks and uh, tarp it down on all four corners, the middle and the back, and them bags won't fall off. So what I would like for y'all to do is make a ruling that they got to do that. Now me and Mr. Hill's been working together, and if I go, if I see him go by there, I got his phone. I call him <laughs> just as soon as I see him. Tell him what kind of truck's coming. And what they got, if I get the last number, I call Mr. Johnson, but I couldn't get it because I'm out in the yard working. But anyway, he's doing a good job too. But, and if his men would, you know, sort of check around and see when they come by, stop them and tell them either, or y'all start finding them down to the landfill, double the price or whatever, or something there to make them listen. So that's what I'd like to, for y'all to do, pass a law or something on that, where everybody is other than one or two bags sitting down in a truck. You know, you gotta use a little common sense. But when you come down the road and they're piled up top of the cab, they gonna fall off the truck. Mm -hmm. They ain't gonna get there with just one little strap hanging across there. So make them put a tarp on it all. Pickups and all. We appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. All right. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Um, Mr. Albright or Mr. Haygood, is that something that we can look into? And, um, and Mr. Walker? Yeah. We'll have the county manager and the county attorney look into this matter and see what, if anything, there are already uh, state wide laws, all kinds of laws. Uh, yeah, that, that indicates that's not a legal activity. Well, it took uh, so. a long time for y'all to. I mean, before, they finally, Mr. Hill finally got the tarp signed up, but that, but I think it needs to, people that works down there needs to start telling them more. I think that's a little slack on that deal. We appreciate your help. Thanks, sir. Okay, are there any commissioner responses? I know we had mentioned about getting some signs concerning littering because um, 
like anything, we get out of the habit of doing it. We don't get caught for it and have accountability. It can be real easy to start old bad habits. Was there anything that come out of that? Was that something Mr. Hill was going to look in? Because, I mean, I think we'd started picking coming. on Mr. Hill. I think he's amazing. <laughs> I think we had started a uh, conversation with the county's maintenance department about their ability. They do road signs out in the county, mm -hmm. the, the street signs, about their ability to possibly create uh, some limited number of no littering signs and post them particularly on roads if we're getting reports of uh, heavy trash on roads and we were going to team that with the sheriff's uh, inmate program so once the sheriff starts picking up we kind of know these are heavy heavy traffic areas so i believe that i believe the county maintenance department is capable of making those signs but i don't, I don't believe we've issued any at this time so okay well, if we don't have them we don't read them we don't disobey them so gotcha. we just got to really I mean, that's just typical of everybody. I live on a corner right behind Gold's Gym in front of a school, and everybody that drinks Michelob Light likes to throw their bottles and cans <laughs> in my yard. And, uh, and I'm out there picking them up, and I'm thinking, you know, you just slack. That's all it is. So we just need to really take better care of our world. We'll get with the sheriff's office, and maybe they can give us some insight into particular roads out in the rural county that they're either working or getting calls to. Um, and we'll look at those. Those would probably be the best places for the signs. Thank you. Thank y'all. And Ms. Thompson, you need to call the Burlington Police Department. <laughs> I need to pe quit drinking make a lot of y'all. Okay. <laughs> so I was not going problem. there. Thank you. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, do we have a motion to uh, approve the agenda? Motion to approve. Second. Motion second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And motion carries. Okay. Mr. Albright. Yes, Senator General. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You're right. We have a motion pertaining to the approval of the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. Motion second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Now, Mr. Albright. <laughs> ah, this must be my cue. Mm -hmm. All right. I received a letter from Ashley Carter. She's an attorney here in Alamance County has an account with the Register of Deeds office, and she indicated that her account was uh, tapped twice for taxes on a closing, $432. And so I have prepared a resolution of uh, authorizing refund to Ms. Carter's uh, account, which was paid in error, paid it twice. Do you have a question? Any questions? Does that happen often? It's happened once or twice in my tenure here. It sometimes happens, but this is a computerized system, so I'm not sure exactly how it happened, but it did. She checked her account, and it was she had to pay twice. So we don't want her doing that. Absolutely, I just appreciate her telling us. That's nice. I'll make a motion to approve the request. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, Mr. Hill, looks like you're the man of the hour. <laughs> Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. So, yeah, there's issues with trash getting to the landfill, and then there's issues once it gets there. <laughs> so, um, appreciate Mr. Walker. He does call me regularly, and we've been able to uh, take action from time to time. Um, in, in tracking these people so um, community input is a is a big thing it helps um, today we have representation from municipal engineering who's here to kind of give you a technical review of a couple issues uh, that we have going on at the closed landfill and the Austin quarter landfill um, mr. Carter has been helping us and been with us for the last couple of years regarding the swept and field issue uh, we had a letter about three years ago, in essence, um, DEQ letting us know that we need to take some action, corrective action at Swepsonville, which is a cl closed landfill from 1993. So we, to date, have done everything requested. However, that doesn't eliminate all the problems. So today, Mr. Jay Zimmerman from ESCO will give you a review, talk about the past, present, but also a letter that is ready to go out to DEQ proposing some corrective actions going forward. In addition to Mr. Zimmerman, uh, Wayne Sullivan is here 
to talk about the new 30 acre landfill. We are in the final stages of engineering. We plan to go out for bid most likely in the fall, early winter, and for construction to start sometime around March of next year. That is a huge project. That 30 acres will be 16 active acres with 14 in reserve. Um, several years ago, the county manager asked us to be aggressive, to build as much as we could afford, cheaper now than later, and to also give us life of uh, the landfill, which is important for the community. So we've taken that, direct, that direction. And there's a map here that'll give you an estimate on how many years we're talking about. In addition to that, um, back in February, we had an issue with a liner fail. As we were progressing in the last stages of the existing sale, um, we found there was an issue. We've spent the last six months, along with uh, our friends at DEQ and MESCO, uh, doing a lot of testing on soils and a lot of testing on geosynthetics. All of this was required to get the okay from DEQ to make the liner repair. Um, as of about a week and a half ago, we did get a verbal from DEQ that everything looked ready to go. Uh, Wayne is working diligently on getting everything prepared, and as soon as we get the written okay from DEQ, we plan to go forward this fall in making that repair. So, a lot going on um, from here. Unless you got questions for me, I will uh, defer to them to give you the review. Just one question. This liner, have you ever gotten any word of any other liners across the country that may work with this type of landfill that they've had the same problems? I know with the school system we had a roofing situation that was across the state. Has this been like common with this kind of situation? I think MESCO would tell us this is somewhat unique. Uh, there have been other issues. Um, Wayne, anybody want to answer that? Probably well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it fails with the situation you had, so it happened other places. It's just it's unique to North Carolina, pretty sure it's nothing that's happened here before. Well, okay. Why, why is it North Carolina or somewhere else? It's dirt, right? Well, the <laughs> I'm just trying to understand. The geosynthetics that were put in were not there. They, they slipped down the slope because they weren't the right type. Oh, okay. Gotcha. This was construction done in 2006? Yeah. I think it was 2006. 2006. So we only uncovered it as we went into that area back uh, early part of February. So, so they might geez. would have really had a bad disaster if we hadn't have been back in there uncovering things for whatever. It was part of the natural progression to mm -hmm. how much space had to be utilized before we got into the new cell construction. But yes, <clears throat> um, it's good that we caught it when we did. We've got about two, two and a half years left in that area before we go to the new sale and we have to get that constructed. Mm -hmm. So between engineering, permitting, and construction, that's a year plus activity and a lot of money. So yes, it's good we caught it when we did. Rodney and his group have done an excellent job of working around a problem. Keeping in mind that uh, highly regulated issue we're having to deal with. So we're working trash around a suspect liner and having to make sure that leachate and other situations don't influence groundwater. And Rodney and his group have done an outstanding job in making that happen. It's not been easy. You'll see some slides that, that Wayne will talk about today that kind of give you a visual of what we were up against. That's a massive, when I was out there with you, that just blows my mind, that whole place. It's a city. It's its own city. You're the mayor. <laughs> it is. It is. Is Any that a parts liability issue? Or is that an installation issue? It what was caused. Uh, I'm not going to speak for MESCO, but I think from our conversations, it was a design issue. It was not the best of designs back then, which was approved by DEQ. Um, there were some construction issues. We went back and looked at a lot of aerial photography from the years. Whatever happened subsurface, we could, nobody could see it, seems to have happened very early on after construction. You can see that from aerial photographies due to the way the liner looks from the air. Visually, I went by it a thousand times myself and never saw anything that was suspect. So, from, to answer your question, um, any guarantee of construction was well passed. Uh, it was actually designed to be an active landfill much quicker than it did. Um, probably one of the reasons for that is Rodney and his group do an excellent job with compaction. 
by having higher compaction, you put off the need for landfill. That's what we do every day. We were probably a victim of our own success. Mr. Hill, are there other areas of the landfill that have this same geosynthetic that we're concerned that might fail as well? Uh, every landfill, by definition, has geosynthetics. There are nothing, there's nothing else suspect at this point. Well, are there other areas of the landfill that have the same geosynthetic that, sure. that, that failed here? Sure, are correct. We, are we looking to see whether, that's, whether there's an issue with other areas that are not yet filled? One of the reasons it took six months is that we did extensive testing of the active area and the surrounding area to, fact, to verify the soils had not been compromised, the geosynthetics met the QC parameters, and to look for uh, anything that could have influenced groundwater or any other environmental issue. There's no evidence at all. The DEQ has been very, very dogmatic in making us check all those things. Will this same product be used for the new development? That is a design issue. We will replace it with some improved product. Um, we've already talked to a company called Chesapeake who has this product available. Um, over the next couple of weeks, we'll be coming back to you for the approval to go forward with that line of repair. So what we're putting back is better than what was there. And the new sale will be, again, a step up. All the products that we will use and the design of that will be better. I think it had more to do with design than it had to do with the actual product. Wayne, would you agree with that? Yeah, the product for you is the wrong place. <clears throat> Other questions? I still hope all five of us can all go together on a visit to the <laughs> landfill. Again, Wayne will have some some visuals that will make this much easier to understand um, than just verbal. Any other questions? Just thank you, Richard. You're always sure. on top of everything. Sure. Okay, uh, with this, I'll let uh, Mr. Jay Zimmerman take over, and he'll be talking about Swepsa Bill. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Sir. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission, my name is Jay Zimmerman. Commissioners, I have handouts if anybody would like to read them. Anybody want one of those? Sure. Of the presentation? I do. Please, yes. Please. Let's see if I can figure out how to work the. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I do appreciate it. Oh, there we go. Maybe you did it. Gotcha. Richard, thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, my name is Jay Zimmerman. I'm with Municipal Engineering Services, and um, I'm going to provide a, a, a brief uh, background introduction about what's taking place at the Swepsonville landfill and then the current status of the uh, assessment that our company is performing for Alamance County. As you can see from the slide there, um, and some of this might be a repeat, this first slide, I think there was a presentation maybe a little over a year ago uh, to you. The uh, 1971 was the start of waste disposal activities. Um, the Alamance County Health Department began monitoring some nearby residential wells. There are about five wells that are close to that landfill along Swepsonville, Saxon Hall Road. Landfill closed in 1993 uh, prior to the implementation of RECRA, which is the Resource Conservation Recovery Act. That's the federal rule that governs landfill operations as well as hazardous waste operations. 1993, routine semi-annual monitoring began, as well as quarterly monitoring of landfill gas. Landfill gas is just a byproduct of landfill operations. You know, you cover landfill, you're going to trap gas, and so that has to be monitored and, and addressed. In 1998, a letter was received from Diener, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, requesting that assessment activities begin at that landfill. So we'll fast forward. And in June of 2018, <coughs> next slide, that, thank you. Uh, a letter was received from DEQ. And again, that was to request the, the assessment activities begin in earnest. 
the initial assessment activities uh, took place November and December of 2018 and those uh, additional assessment activities included the uh, monitor uh, installation of additional monitor wells there was an assessment of a concrete pipe that runs under the landfill I think that was brought up last time and then an assessment of the stream and as well as biological activity in that stream below the pipe discharge just to make sure that the biological activity hadn't been compromised as a result of landfill activities. April of 2021, another request was received from DEQ requesting two additional monitor wells to be installed on an adjacent residential property. So that initial assessment that was performed back in 2018 suggested that maybe some of the contaminants from the landfill may have crossed onto an, an adjacent property. That property is owned by Mr. Stephen Wall. So in April 2021, DEQ request, uh, requested that some additional wells be installed. Now this is just a simple model to help under, understand what's happening. You can see on the left-hand side of the screen is a potential pollution source. So those pollutants migrate down through the subsurface, through the soil, the unsaturated zone, into the underlying groundwater, and at times, depending upon the pollutants, can migrate down into fractured rock. So if you would consider, say, a landfill as a pollution source, that groundwater monitoring well to the immediate left of the stream would represent the wells that were installed back in 2018. And those had some pollutants in them, and because of the proximity to the stream, the state had asked for additional assessment to be conducted. And those assessment activities included installation of well on the other side of the stream, uh, represented by that well to the far right. You can also see that in that, in that simple diagram, pollutants typically migrate to surface water bodies. That's the general trend of groundwater flow. But they can get down into fractured rock. And if they follow those fractures, think of a fracture as like a pipe. And that could allow, under the influence of um, pumping wells and other, other factors, pollutants to migrate via those fractures and actually go under the stream and, and, and beyond it. So in May of 2021, we shared our results with DEQ, and they requested yet additional assessment activities, and I'll be talking a little bit about that here in a, in a few minutes. We also briefed the county manager's office, uh, county staff, including uh, solid waste and the health department, concerning those uh, additional activities that were performed and the request from DEQ for additional assessment activities. A work plan has been drafted proposing some additional wells to further delineate the extent of those impacts. Next slide, please. Now this is hard to see. You might be able to see it on, on, your, on your handout. Um, the, the columns to the left are uh, the wells that were installed back in 2018, 2019 timeframe and sampled and show that uh, a number of uh, constituents of concern were detected. Some of those are metals, some are chlorinated solvents. It's not uncommon to find chlorinated solvents associated with landfill activities. Um, uh, and 1,4-dioxane. One 1,4-dioxane one is a, uh, a new contaminant of concern. It's on the EPA's radar, it's on the state's radar. It is one of those contaminants that they're asking a lot of uh, permittees to uh, investigate, determine whether or not it's present. Landfills are an example of, of one of those entities, but also uh, wastewater treatment plants. Uh, a lot of wastewater treatment plants that treat waste and wastewater and discharge into surface waters are now being asked to monitor for the presence of 1,4-dioxane. To the right are the results from the service water samples that we collected, as well as Mr. Wall's well. Uh, we sampled Mr. Wall's well. Uh, the good news is nothing was detected in his well that appears to be associated with the landfill activities. We did detect a fairly high concentration of nitrate nitrogen, uh, typically associated with fertilizers. We don't know what the source of that is, but it wasn't in samples that we collected from the landfill, so it appears to be coming from a different source. And, and we've worked with Mr. Wall. He's been very, very uh, good to work with, very understanding. Of course, he wants the issue addressed by the right person, and we're certainly sensitive to that. Um, but he's been very gracious in allowing us access to his property to install wells 
sample the stream on his property the whole time navigating the, the cattle and the donkeys that he has. So they, they like a lot of attention. So, <laughs> so excuse me, have we been yes, able to determine the source of that, uh, the nitrates? Not yet. That We haven't been investigating that as a source since it doesn't appear to be coming from a landfill. Right. Potential sources could include, you know, him fertilizing his own lawn, his own septic tank, and then across the street is the city of Graham's or town of Graham's uh, land application site for their biosolids. They've been applying wow. residuals there for quite a bit of time, and so that's a, a potential source as well. Okay. And that's topographically and hydraulically upgrading from, from his well. Next slide. So since one for our dioxane seems to be the, the new um, constituent of concern that everybody is interested in, I thought I'd throw up a few facts about it. It currently is classified as an emerging contaminant by the EPA. It's a pretty common uh, industrial chemical used to stabilize a lot of things, including chlorinated solvents, paint strippers, waxes. It's even in cosmetics. It's in some of the things that we use every day at very low levels. Um, unfortunately, it can readily leach into soil and groundwater. It's 100% uh, miscible. It'll just dissolve into groundwater and surface waters pretty readily. Um, it's commonly found in groundwater in areas where chlorinated solvents are present because it was used as a stabilizer. So it wasn't a surprise that when we started seeing <coughs> chlorinated solvents show up, you know, adjacent to the landfill that we would find 1,4-dioxane. So it's not, a con it's not a concern if it's used as a topical, but you're not supposed to ingest it. Is that what they're saying? Well, I think it has to do with the dose, certainly. Um, I guess every constituent that it's found in, you know, is regulated by somebody, probably, right, one would think. Um, but when you, the landfill, as you all know, is, is sort of receives waste from all different sources. It's sort of the end point for wastes that humans generate. And so it acts as, a, as a, an area that can, I think, can focus those pollutants and, and concentrate them, which is why now we have line landfills and, you know, really robust regulations <coughs> and monitoring. Um, Unlined landfills, you know, people did things differently back before we knew better, and, and that's just what you all have to deal with and everybody else is having to grapple with. Uh, so there's no liner concerning the Swepsonville landfill? Correct. Okay. What's an example of a chlorinated solvent? Um, Perchloroethylene is used. It was used was used to um, uh, to, to dry clean, uh, clean your your suits. You, you would use tetrachloroethylene. So all the dry cleaners would use a solvent that's highly uh, volatile. It would remove grease, and then they would, you know, uh, evacuate it from the clothing. It didn't leave any residue on your on your uh, suits and shirts, and dry cleaners had to deal with that and as a matter of fact a lot of dry cleaners throughout the state had leaks of tetrachloroethylene <coughs> um, and they're they're dealing with that as well and the state has a dry cleaning program to help them mitigate those impacts uh, in North Carolina there's a groundwater quality standard of three micrograms per liter that's parts per billion that's that's pretty low um, <coughs> Benzene, which is a constituent in gasoline, is a known human carcinogen, has a standard of one part per billion, so it's slightly lower. In North Carolina, uh, there has been established a uh, in-stream threshold value, and that is 0.35 micrograms per liter, and that is the standard that applies to any surface water body that is used as a drinking water supply. So not all streams are used as a, as a source for drinking water. But some are. Certainly any streams that discharge to the Hall River that maybe Pittsburgh or somebody downstream Fayetteville would use as a water supply, right. then, the, then the streams up, upstream from that point are typically classified as a water supply. <clears throat> next slide. So the, the next step, um, based on our discussions with DEQ, is to install some additional wells on, on these adjacent properties. So specifically, they asked about Mr. Wall's property since it appeared that it had crossed one stream. We had installed uh, two monitor wells. We found it in the deeper of the two monitor wells, uh, the deep well that's in a fractured rock. So if you were, remember back that prior diagram, it appears that some of the chlorinated solvents, which typically are heavier than water, so they tend to sink in the water column, 
have gotten into the underlying fractures, migrated under the stream, and migrating towards his water supply well. Um, the shallow well did not, we did not find significant concentrations of chlorinated solvents. Um, now the good news is Mr. Wall's well is about 700 feet away. It's topographically and hydraulically up gradient. Um, we, we hope that it's not at risk, but it's certainly something that has to be considered. And the state has asked as a result of that for us to install some additional wells between the, the point that we uh, had just ins installed wells in his water supply well to get a better handle on the, the limits of that potential pollutant movement. What's the water supply, drinking supply for his animals? Just a basic stream, stream that's on his land? The and he hadn't seen any kind of anything showing up in them as far as sickness or anything <clears throat> like that? Not, not that I'm aware of. And we did, uh, on his behalf, with Richard's blessing, communicate with the uh, North NC State Vet School. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I communicated with a toxicologist who's well versed in animal toxicology, and uh, they didn't believe that his animals were at any appreciable risk or any harm. They did recommend that you know that they not consume water from the stream if they're going to be used for consumption, um, but it's just a a, a a recommendation to lower that risk, not that the animals would necessarily be at harm, but just out of a. a, a a desire to be as cautious as possible. That's that was a recommendation. I have one question. What do the um, what do the wells do for you? You mentioned several times you're going to drill it. How deep are these wells? You said one was shallow and didn't have any contaminants, and one was deeper and did. Yes. Yeah, so typically, in a in a groundwater situation, you have a shallow groundwater system. That's the, what people refer to as the water table and and, and groundwater that's typically fairly shallow. It's the groundwater that is usually first impacted by pollutants, whether it be septic from the septic tank, lawn fertilizer, over application of pesticides, landfills, underground storage tanks at gas stations. And so that groundwater gets impacted and it's going to migrate under the influence of topography typically. And over time, it'll eventually discharge into surface water bodies. Um, the deeper groundwater flow system in this part of the state is in the crystalline bedrock. So that rock is uh, laced with fractures. Some of those fractures are pretty extensive, some aren't. Um, you all probably know somebody who has a well and they can't get much water. It's a low yielding well. So that's a well that was probably installed in bedrock that's fairly resistant to fracturing and jointing. And, and that's the, those are the underground pipes that convey water to that well. Other areas you know, the, the, the bedrock is just ripe with fractures and they have a, a well that produces a lot of water and more than what their family needs. And, and um, again, that it's dependent on geology and some subsurface conditions. The wells here that we're talking about are, are monitor wells or test wells. The shallow wells typically range between say 20 and 30 feet below land surface. It's a two inch PVC pipe with a well screen at the bottom. The deeper wells typically are going to run 60 to 80 feet, might run a little bit deeper than that. The, the, the idea behind those wells is to install them down into bedrock to intersect fractures that we believe are likely transmitting those pollutants. So we're trying to find the zones within which those pollutants are moving so we can address them. What does address mean? What do you do once you find that? You say you're going to address it. What does that mean? Well, it, it, it depends on the pollutants, of, of course. Um, it could involve installing recovery wells that are used to pump the pollutants out of the fractures. So in other words, you would want to pump it back away from wherever it's heading. So in this case, let's say it's heading towards the stream or towards residential wells. We would want to install some <coughs> recovery wells um, back into the pollutant contaminant plume to try and draw those pollutants back and away from whatever is at risk. Um, there are certain types of chemicals that can be injected that have been approved by the state that tend to break down pollutants, uh, more of a natural process um, using injection wells. That's another technology that's used. Um, the technology that's selected would really depend upon the risk level associated with the, the pollutants, the particular pollutants that we're talking about and then the subsurface geology, the, the things that control pollutant movement. And all of those would have to be factored into what type of plan is the best plan that is most cost effective, but then also achieves the, the goal of 
keeping those pollutants from either impacting the stream or impacting the water supply well. And as far as water supply wells, you know, if there's alternate water nearby, that's all, always an option too, to consider some sort of uh, treatment on the wells or some sort of alternate water supply. I saw the movie in Rockwich. We're not talking about that, are we? <laughs> We're okay. not talking about that. Okay. I, would, I would certainly hope not. Okay. <laughs> um, so we're planning to uh, install some additional monitor wells or proposed in some areas on Mr. Wall's property and then we are also directed because of some stream sampling on the adjacent property owned by the Thompson family. Uh, they had some concentrations of the same pollutants, not as high, um, but they appear to be originating from maybe that property and, and migrating down the stream towards um, Mr. Wall's property and I'll have a slide next that will show you. Um, we're planning on conducting both surface water and groundwater monitoring and then preparing a report on behalf of the county to submit to the state. That report then will help us understand whether or not we know the full extent of the impacts and then what the remedies would be or if some additional assessment is needed at which point DEQ would be asking for that. Um, the county will also continue sampling residential wells as they have been. Um, and then certainly options to consider might be alternate water supply if those wells are at risk. Next slide. So here's a, a graphic. The, the yellow is the closed landfill, the limits of that closed landfill. Um, the purple line is the uh, property boundary around that landfill. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but the, the rectangular shaped property immediately to the right of the waste uh, residual application field, which is the pink. That property is Mr. Wall's property, and you can see at the bottom is the parcel ID. Right there. Yes, thank you, Richard. That's Mr. Wall's property. The stream is represented by the blue line that runs from um, the about the middle under S, where the you'll see a label SWA. That was the first surface water sample. The second was SWB as you move up to the upper left corner. SWC and SWD were collected on Thompson property. That's the property immediately to the north of Mr. Wall. The wells that showed the impact associated with the most recent assessment that we completed uh, a few months ago were found in the well identified by the symbol MW10 S and D, standing for shallow and deep. Because of the presence of the chlorinated solvents in that well and then one for dioxane in the surface water samples A and B, that is what led the state to direct us to install some additional wells. And so we propose an additional well cluster labeled as MW11 S and D. It's immediately to, about dead center of Mr. Wall's property, maybe just a little bit above. That's the proposed well cluster. His private water supply well is to the far left next to or close to the waste residual application field. And it's a little uh, blue circle with a sort of a crosshairs in the middle. That's his uh, potable well supply. The two areas uh, above in the, on the Thompson property that have the blue ovals are the areas where we're proposing to put additional monitor wells. Um, that the state has directed us to do to determine whether or not the pollutants are migrating from the, the landfill to the north. Again, we propose on both sides of the stream because we already have samples from the stream showing that there are, unfortunately, some pollutants at much lower concentrations, but they're still present in that stream. There's a spring uh, where SWD is located. That's where the stream apparently originates. We were able to pull a sample from there um, last month and that sample did have uh, low levels of chlorinated solvents and some 1,4 dioxane. So based on what we know that occurred on Mr. Wall's property and, and the need to install wells on the other side of the stream, we decided rather than, um, we didn't want to waste anybody's time, so we just are recommending that wells be installed on both sides of the stream. Uh, the state's likely going to ask for that anyways. They've already told us they want us to determine the full extent of the impacts associated with the contaminants associated with this landfill. And so that's the current plan and the proposal that's in a letter that's been drafted and shared with Richard and, and the county manager here to recommend three additional locations, one on Mr. Wall's property and two on the Thompson property. How deep is that landfill? 
Like if you could take giant yardstick and go all the way through it, about how deep is it? That's a good question. I don't know. How we know how deep the land None of us were working there, but what do you think, Wayne? We're down 15, 20 feet? At least I thought to say it, it could have been, because there's no regulations, it could just build all the way to and into the groundwater and get the land. Who are these people? <laughs> So it's not as deep as the one we got in Austin Quarters. It's nothing like that. No, I, I would suggest it's deeper. Yeah, probably. The, the old landfill without regulations, as Wayne was saying, was probably dug deeper. Um, for the new construction in Austin Quarter, we look at, at, at the water levels underneath the ground, and we have to be several feet above that. So we'll be much more shallow from the new construction and the existing landfill at Austin Quarter than the old landfill. So unfortunately, the, the bad news back in the 70s, people did things dramatically different than we do now. We learned from our mistakes. And current regulations, as Richard had mentioned, don't allow you to construct landfills into the water table. They have to be lined. They have to be monitored. So things have, uh, uh, are done much differently now, um, fortunately. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we still have to do, deal with legacy issues. and so. We're hoping that this assessment would give us the information we need to inform the county of what's going on in that part of the landfill. Um, we do conduct regular monitoring around the rest of the landfill twice a year. That's routine monitoring. I'm not aware of any other issues like this that uh, are, are in need of additional assessment. Periodically, that can crop up because these landfills are, are dynamic. They don't, they, they, they change over time pollutants migrate. You could have a really rainy period um, during a year that might mobilize some pollutants that otherwise typically wouldn't get mobilized. So that's why that's why the monitoring is required by the state. I was out that way the other day and there were somebody been belling hay because there was all kind of big donut looking things out there. Who eats that hay? Does any animal eat that hay that's grown on the landfill? That we're talking about. Oh, on the landfill. The mm -hmm. Oh, okay. no, we're not we're not harvesting anything off of the landfill. I think what you may be talking about is the property across the street. Yeah. Which is what Jay talked about right. in okay. the city of Brown. I thought. I don't want them donkeys eating that hay. <laughs> yeah, that's um, residual waste. I used to work for Division of Water Resources, um, and we permitted land application of wastewater and residuals. Um, those fields typically have to be cropped. The hay has to be cropped to remove the nitrogen. Mm -hmm. uh, but that nitrogen is, it's a, it's, a, it's a natural fertilizer that's a byproduct of the waste treatment process. A lot of facilities uh, use it as a cheap fertilizer. A lot of the, the towns and cities that generate it then use it on fields that they then use to uh, help feed animals and, and they'll crop that hay. Um, that's highly regulated by Division of Water Resources and the EPA. Um, but it is, it is um, uh, a source of nitrogen. That's, that's what we're really trying to get rid of is nitrogen. And use no. it to fertilize hay, and sometimes it can get into the groundwater too. And like when you have those days during the year, they say, okay, everybody bring their old paint. What happens to that paint? That's more of a solid waste question, hazardous waste um, days. You're talking the twice a year hazardous household waste. You know, we collect those and uh, have it sent to a company that takes care of all the recycling and any and all products that come to it. But what you're dealing with now is not anything related. Okay. Okay. Because all there's only person here that's ever heard your first slide is Mr. Carter. We're all new, so you're teaching the freshman class here. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to do so. <laughs> Any other questions for me? Mr. Zimmerman, yes. I, I'm trying to understand the magnitude of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that the North Carolina standards for groundwater is three microliters per, uh, I'm sorry, three micrograms per liter, is that right? Yes, sir. And yeah. 0.35 in, in uh, surface water. Surface water. Mm -hmm. Are there different thresholds above that which signify greater levels of risk? I mean, is, is, that, is that graduated? Like, at a certain level, it's whatever risk at a certain level above that it's high risk or there are graduations so the the speaking about the the groundwater standard that is a, a standard that's been established by the environmental management commission 
Um, they have authority to establish statewide standards. It is a standard that applies to groundwater that is intended to protect people um, at a one in a million lifetime cancer risk. That's okay. the, the threshold. One in a million is a pretty high bar. Um, all of the groundwater standards are designed to meet that threshold. Uh, the presumption is that if it is safe enough, uh, if, if you can treat it down to that level or anything below that level should be safe enough to drink. Um, typically the groundwater standards are lower than the federal drinking water standards which apply to the faucets in this building. Um, I don't know what if there is a federal MCL for one one for dioxane. Um, typically the EPA is a lot farther behind most states when it comes to establishing drinking water standards and they right now you probably read the news just like I do they're getting a lot of flack because of PFOS and PFOA uh, the perfluorinated compounds that are uh, commuters made famous. Um, that's an Aaron Brockovich movie right there. Just waiting to happen. Um, the standard for surface waters typically has to do with um, protection of a source that uses a drinking water supply, or it might have something to do with protection of the biological uh, integrity of that stream. So some pollutants are, are more harmful to the 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 life forms that live in a stream than they would be, say, to a human that might drink that water. And keep in mind that any water that's used from a stream as a drinking water supply is treated. It's, it's highly treated uh, before it ever gets to the tap. Uh, unfortunately, some compounds go right through the treatment process. And 1,4-Dioxane and is one of those chemicals that's suspected of bypassing the more conventional treatment technologies, which is why they typically have a very low standard associated with it. That's the point three five. Okay. So the, the levels that the state puts out, it, tries to get to one in a million risk of cancer over a lifetime. Do we know what, it looks like the highest levels of dioxane on Mr. Wall's property, 10.2 micrograms per liter of groundwater and 11.7 for surface water. Do we know what the approximate level of risk is at those levels? Um, I, I do not. Uh, I'm not a, a toxicologist. What we would recommend is that we use the, the endpoints of three for groundwater and 0.35 in surface waters as the point, that, that's the regulatory point that, that Division of Waste Management will be driving the county towards uh, to try and address that. Now, certainly we, we would do everything that we can to keep any dioxane from getting into somebody's water supply, drinking water. Um, another way of mitigating that risk is you provide alternate water sources so that the well isn't used as the source of drinking water. That's, that's another option, certainly. Um, point of entry treatment systems on wells is a short term fix that typically the state would be requesting. And I think a lot of this is going to be driven by the Division of Waste Management based upon the findings of this, this next phase of our investigation. Um, trying to understand not only where, where it is, where it's going, and how fast are some of the things that we would typically be looking for to help inform um, Richard and the county manager's office as well as DEQ. And then that would then uh, result in a some sort of a corrective action plan, and that plan could be something as simple as monitoring. Okay, it's yes, it's there. It's not moving anywhere. It's fairly static. It is impacting the stream. We might have to do something for the stream, but if it's not putting uh, Mr. Wall's well at risk or anybody else well at risk, the state may be satisfied with just close monitoring. If it looks like it's something that may over time impact somebody. Maybe that time might be five years down the road. Um, the state would want some sort of a plan to address that risk prior to it getting to somebody's well. Well, I know we had an E. coli scare here a couple of weeks ago, and um, Lord have mercy, it just really shows us all how fragile anything can be any day of the week. And when you're talking about the state, um, the Thompson here is all about preventive ways of thinking instead of. When you got chaos, then you want to fix it because uh, everybody just, it's, it's just a nightmare for everybody because um, we're awfully blessed to live here and have all these luxuries, which I think turning your spigot on your water come out is a big deal compared to some countries. And we just have to always be so smart with our thinking when it comes to taking care of things and being smart with our trash because that's exactly what it is. And I, I just learned how to say landfill, living in the city, we used to call it the dump. Because that's exactly what it is. Everybody dumps their stuff there that they no longer want. 
And, um, and I just think of all the stuff that goes in that landfill that we've just now caught on about styrofoam. You know, it'll outlive the rapture. You can destroy the earth. The cockroach and styrofoam couple make it, trust me. And um, I just, it's just very scary how close we can be sometimes to just, it just has to cut off. We learned that in Burlington with that E. coli scale. It was interesting, to say the least. Any other questions for me? And if not, I'll turn it over to Mr. Sullivan. <coughs> Chairman, commissioners, thanks for having us. Uh, I'm going to try to answer a few questions. If you go to the next slide. Is this thing a pointer? Uh, to answer some questions on the materials, the construction, that, get started there. Just kind of a little history that I know that uh, went on at the landfill. The area that failed was constructed about 2005. It's been constructed. About that same time, uh, the county took over operational landfill from a private entity. The private entity was operating the landfill up to maybe 2005, 2006. So when the, this landfill was constructed, they were going to use that space up a lot quicker than what you have with your county staff. Your county staff got a whole lot better life out of that landfill than what was being done by the private entity. So the thought was that they would have covered the bottom of this cell where it failed up the slope in a couple of years. That was the thought. You've been 16 years before you got there. So the thought was that once you start from the bottom with the waste going up the slope that you're buttressing this liner from sliding down the slope. So to answer the question, is there any other place in the landfill, every other place has been buffered or buttressed by waste. So no other place that the slope can fail. And the reason it failed is because the liner that was used was a smooth, slick liner that, and the best I relate to her is a slip and slide. I mean, basically is if it got wet and you stood on it, you want to, you want to slide to the bottom of the slope. <laughs> so what you did is you sandwiched different materials together, the slick liner with another slick material. It got wet. It had soil on it that weighed it down. It pulled it out and it tore the liner. That's what happened. The best we can figure out by aerial photos that it happened probably somewhere in 2009. <laughs> and the reason it couldn't be seen is because it was under a rain cover. There's five acres of that area that had a cover over it. That this all slid underneath that cover. So the only thing you can see is kind of a hump there. So when they removed the rain cover, they oh, we got this issue. Mm -hmm. So that happened this last winter. So all that was covered with that cover. As a matter of fact, there's five acres. The slope was covered. So what you're looking at here is where that failed. The, the, the area on the upper part of the, the picture is what's exposed. And it tore down the side. The soil on the bottom is what the weight, the dead weight that developed that pulled it out. So what we had to do, the state was interested initially, what you see on the upper part of that photograph is the soil that's exposed, they were concerned that might have got contaminated by leachate, which is the water that's gone through garbage. There's a water line, you can't see it, it's on the bottom part, so there's a water line that shows on the bottom <coughs> of that soil. So we tested that first, just to make sure there was no volatile organics, that kind of stuff in it, and there wasn't. They didn't, that wasn't good enough for them. So we had to go up and test the clay soil, which is what you see exposed on the top part of that photograph underneath, for this chemicals, to make sure that there's no chemicals or leachate that got into that soil. We felt pretty sure there wasn't, but we had to prove it to them, and there wasn't. So the next phase was is to test the materials that were used for construction to make sure that they were still conforming at least to the, what they were supposed to at the time. The state felt like that there was more exposure where there wasn't soil up that slope than just this area. So we had to test the materials outside of that area to make sure that the exposure to the elements, which would just have been heat at the time, were not, uh, didn't affect the materials of construction. So we'll go to the next slide, if you would, please. <coughs> Actually, next two slides. Uh, 
This was this is the other end of that area that failed. This is on the far end of it. So we had to take a test of conformance of, out of that area to show these at least the clay liner was still intact. Go to the next slide, please. And then this is the other area, which you can see where it failed, and then the area coming down is where the liner's still in place, the black area. That's the, 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 the materials of liner that are still in place. So we tested two spots underneath the tear and one spot on the end of the black area of the materials. Now some of the materials we couldn't test totally because they were initially supposed to be tested before they were put in the landfill, so they were separated. So we had to do the best we could. And all the materials conformed to the initial requirement, including, which we were all concerned about, the clay liner underneath. The clay soil, because the heat of exposure may have drawn the moisture out of it, which then wouldn't, the permeability requirements of that clay wouldn't be there because there's no moisture in it. Now that did happen up on the top part where the liner failed, but everywhere else that was okay. So that what that tells us is the materials that are there are still okay just as long as they weren't up in the upper part. So what we're proposing, what we're going to do is we're actually going to repair an area larger than the failed area, which is the area that you see dashed around. That's all this material that's going to be taken out to the clay and replaced with either new materials or the clay will be recompacted, moisture put in it recompacted. The material difference is, is the liner that I've talked about, that this, the slick liner will be replaced with a liner that's got rough on both sides, so there's, there's no slickness to it. It's, it's, there's a lot of friction there, basically, so that it won't slide down the slope. So that's being put in there for the replacement of that material, and then the new, <coughs> the new landfill is going to be constructed of that same material. So that's our conformance test. Now what we're waiting for the state is to go ahead and say, yeah, you're right, go ahead and start fixing this. So that's where we are now. We are <coughs> uh, waiting on them, like Richard said, to uh, get our, uh, our approval from them to go ahead and fix this. So hopefully we'll have that next week or so and be able to move forward. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. <coughs> the last slide, let's take up the time shows the, uh, the new area. What we're talking, Richard kind of explained this better than I probably could, but anyway, the, uh, what's shown on this as current MSW one, phases one through five is the existing landfill where we're at now, including the, the damaged area. The next area, which is what we're calling phase six, is what we're fixing to send in for a permit to construct. The, you can, get a life of site permit what this is so we're, we're going to permit 30 acres of which you will build 16 acres uh, and then that 16 acres according to if you kind of operate as good as you have been will last you in excess of 20 years and then the next 14 acres will give you another 20 years so you're looking somewhere around 40 between 40 and 50 years of life and that 30 acres we're, we're about to get permitted. Uh, so that's everything I've got. And I've rattled on here. If anybody's got any questions? On that little picture you got before of all that dirt and those black things, says yeah. repair area, was all that says repair area, were they supposed to be strips or were they supposed to be one solid piece? And just the fact that they were slip and slides, the pressure tore them apart. All right, what you see, the black area, yeah. that, was, that was the way. At the top. It, yeah, at the top. That was the way it's supposed to be. That's what it should have looked like around the corner on the top. What they, what they permitted to have done was on the end, which looked like they pushed the soil up three quarters of the way up that slope for the buttress is what they call for, additional buttress. That's a new word. I like that word. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that to keep the stuff up there, they, uh, they uh, buttressed that up, and what it was supposed to have done was kept everything up. Now, on the left-hand side, it did keep everything up. On the right-hand side, where that water line was, that got wet underneath the <clears throat> rain cover. And so when that soil got wet, it lost its buttressing effect and failed. Okay. So then that was dead weight on that liner, and it pulled it out. That, like it looks on the black, pull that out so that it's down in the pile 
right there. So Let's your see. new will be solid? The new will look like... No strips, because it looks yeah, like there's just the strips. strips. What you see on the top are strips of exposed. Uh -huh. Those are what's left over. Everything else is slid down the slope. So the strips you see on top are what's called the GCL, G G geosynthetic clay liner and the clay soil. That actually shrunk because of the heat, the, the strip part where you see the exposed soil, but it actually shrunk because the heat underneath the rain cover that was there acted like an oven, so it drew all the moisture out of all that area, and the GCL shrunk and the clay lost its moisture. Now, are you going to, is whoever they is, are they going to dig all this up? Yeah, they're going to tear all that out, including the black area. Okay. Then including the, the soil, where you see the strips and you see the soil part, that's mm -hmm. clay liner. That's everywhere too. That's all going to come out, re, repurpose, so to speak. And then everything, when it's back, before we put the soil on it, it looks like the black side is now. And then we'll push soil up on all, every, all of it. And just one question. When you dig all that up, you're going to have to take that to somebody's landfill, aren't you? Yeah, yours. Are you, are you going to pay <laughs> us to bring that in there? <laughs> Are we going to charge y'all? Then, then we then he charge, I charge y'all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you're going to put a, a tarp over that truck so none of that trash flies out on that road. Well, well keep, keep in mind, there's no trash here. Okay, well, I'm just taking <laughs> care of Mr. Walker in the yeah. back because he yeah, don't see, want this land on the side of the road. Up any trash. Okay. Your, your, your tarp okay. over your trash is right below that. I'm glad we got some trash. Okay. <laughs> Jeez. So the old liner isn't going to be. The old liner will be pulled up, all three, all three ge ge geosynthetics, and we will destroy them in the landfill. There's Mr. Sullivan, how do you get, okay. who's so going to be on the people. piece of equipment yeah. on that Just incline like digging that up? I want to know when that happens, because I want to watch that. All right, well, it's, it's going to be a contractor, does it? I mean, he knows they go what he's doing, right? Yeah, they go right. places I would never go. Oh, I'd but, like to watch that. Yeah, That'd they're going. what they're going to do is they're going to dig up a foot of that 18 inches of clay, mm -hmm. put it to the side, recompact the bottom six inches, then bring that other back. So okay. The plan down. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our health director is next. I'd like to get us some layout chairs. <laughs> that would be interesting to watch. <laughs> Good morning, Chair, <laughs> Vice Good Chair, morning. Commissioners. So I want to start out, of course, um, by thanking the staff at the Health Department, our National Guard, our volunteers for continuing a robust effort in, in vaccination. And I especially want to thank our communicable disease team. As cases begin to ramp up, they again are starting to work weekends and into the late night to investigate and monitor these cases. So super big shout out to those folks for putting in the effort. So this is our, our current state of uh, our current status of COVID here in Alamance County. As of yesterday, uh, we had 42 cases come in, 19,843 cumulative cases, 19,333 released from isolation, giving us 223 active cases currently, seven folks in the hospital, 287 deaths, and 168 close contacts currently being monitored. Our average weekly cases currently are 32 cases coming in uh, each day. Um, back when I presented to you back, I think it was in April, April 19th meeting, the last COVID update that I provided, we were right at 32 cases per day, but coming down. Um, we saw a nice lull in June and July where we only had two or three cases. We even, I think we had one or two days where no cases came in of, of COVID. Uh, 287 deaths, so we haven't had a death in how long? So if we, for the month of June and July, we've had one death that was in early in June. Uh, we had around eight or nine in May. Um, and then we had some deaths that were added that actually occurred back in January and February before we ramped up the effort. So I think that speaks volumes, especially with the deaths and as, as the increase in, in vaccinated occur. I mean, really one death in, in June, and I, and I don't know if they were vaccinated or not, but um, one death in June and nothing in July, so. Can you go back? And can we just really look at the last number, sure. 22,679? That, that's, that's a big number. We're always looking, because one death is too many, but we're always looking at all the negative, and there's plenty of it. But that 22,679 is a very big positive, and I hope that um, 
we can focus on that. Yeah, so those well. were, those were close contacts that were yeah. being monitored, yeah. right? And, and hopefully they're they even though they've been exposed and actually turn into um, COVID. And I, I don't know what the current percent of that is, but back in the day when it was a little bit high, it was about 20% cases yeah. were converting. So. So our, our current seven-day moving average, um, this comes from the CDC. We are currently in a substantial transmission, so the orange. Um, our neighbors to the west there, Guilford and Forsyth, um, are, have moved to high. Um, our mo neighbors to the east, uh, Orange County is in orange, um, as well as our neighbors to the south being in, in um, high transmission, our neighbors to the north being substantial. As far as how we're concerned, so our seven-day totals of um, cases per 100,000 is 94.98, which put us in that orange um, transmission. Um, typically, when I've reported to you, I've done that over a four-day period, so all you really have to do is double it because I would say we want that below 100. Since I just reported seven days, really, we want to see that number below 50. Um, deaths, I, I just talked about that. There's been less than 10, 10 deaths over the last really two months, and you kind of see that line is nice and flat there um, with our death count. And then our percent positivity rate is at 6.72, and you heard me say before we want that under 5%, um, so that continues to increase as well. So what's driving all this? It is, if you've seen in the news, the Delta variant is the main driver of this. Um, the Delta variant became the major variant uh, here in North Carolina on the 26th of June, so right about 50%. If you notice the graph there, um, currently, or as of July 11th, it made up to 70, 80 to 80 percent of the cases that were coming in. And I suspect it's way past the 11th. It's probably the vast majority, if not 90 percent above, is the Delta variant that's currently passing around. Um, now, I think you told me though the other day that we don't have a way to test for the. Variants. So here, here locally, we do not, um, and then the state uses the CDC or laboratories contracted by the CDC, CDC to do that sequencing. So they'll send the test to the CDC or to the lab that's contracted. They'll do the sequencing and be able to. How long does it take us to determine that? I do not know. But I can follow up with you and get you know. Okay. Um, so out of the cases from May 6th to July 11th, 94% of the deaths of cases and deaths were in people that were not fully vaccinated. So a very significant amount, but breakthroughs also occur for, for the vaccinated, if you, see, if you have been uh, following the news. And I think Secretary Cohen last week at the press conference announced that number is right around 92% of cases are unvaccinated currently. Are we following any of the... Uh new case counts for people who've already had the case once before, had COVID once before for reinfection? Sure. So there's no numbers or I'm not aware of any. I did, did do a little literature search on that or look for, the, for that data. Um, I, I don't know what that is. It, um, the secretary, the state medical director was asked that question last week and really didn't have an answer for that as well. I did look at the research literature. Um, one study did suggest about 4.9% of folks that um, had COVID before, um, out of 150,000 contracted COVID again, there are some limitations with that study um, because they couldn't conclusively prove that the individual actually cleared um, the virus. So that number may perhaps might even be lower. Um, and then there was a second study that really wasn't done and really didn't give a percentage. It basically just showed that you can catch COVID again. What they did was sequence the um, first, the first, uh, the DNA from the first material that. Um, the person had in COVID and then they, when they got COVID again, they resequenced it and noticed that there was two different variations. So they could say, hey, it's likely you can be reinfected again from, with COVID if you had it before. So um, our total deaths, so this has really been relatively unchanged since the last time I reported to you. Again, only a few deaths have came in, but currently total deaths, um, and this is from January 1, 2021 to um, all the way up until um, yesterday, uh, it was uh, 87 total deaths out of 8,801 cases, which puts us just under 1% um, deaths of cases. In our long-term care facilities, uh, 37 deaths out of 249 cases there. Looking at our age breakdown, we've had two deaths from the ages 20 to 39, three deaths from ages 40 to 54, 
Seven deaths from ages 55 to 64, 17 deaths from 65 to 74, and 58 deaths from 75 and older. These are our age breaks down to cases, and two things I want to point out here, pretty much from the 18 to 50 to 64 year range, we see cases that they just fluctuated the amount of percent from January on forward. Um, but two, two age groups I want to point out, so our 65 and older population in January, they made up 18% of the cases, in February 10%, in March to April uh, 6%, in June we saw a little bit of an increase to 11%, and the month of July at 6%. For the first, most part, that had, they went down a little bit of a blip up and continued to go back down for the, the amount of cases. But for our 12 to, or 0 to 17 year old population, in January it was at 12%, in February 12%, March to April 15%, June 18%, and the month of July 19.7%. So we've seen that age group 0 to 17 increase. Um, obviously those that um, are under 12 are not eligible for the vaccine currently. Do you foresee that changing? And so what timeline? For the 12 and, uh, under. For 12 and under, so yes, I do, do foresee that changing. Um, right now, the from my understanding, the vaccine manufacturers have, have put their data together. Of course, it's got to go through the, the process, the CDC and the FDA process. The scuttlebutt around, around um, the state is basically they're looking probably October, November before we start seeing kids under 12 to, to, uh, to be vaccinated. Let's talk about the effectiveness of masking. Okay. I noted you wore a mask until you approached the podium. podium. <laughs> uh, I see a few others, not many. Uh, there are all kinds of studies out of Europe showing the masks are not only not effective, but are harmful. Sure. Uh, most of the tests in the United States that are being released are to the contrary. Who should we believe? <laughs> So I, I did. I did do a little bit of a literature review before I showed up. So hopefully I can I can speak somewhat um, more educated on it. And, and yes, there's there's contradicting studies out there um, on masking. But you know, from my initial reading of this, I truly believe that masking is an effective um, and proactive public health <coughs> measure that we can use. Um, yes, you saw me wearing a mask today, and the reason I'm wearing a mask is strongly encourage masking in, in public places um, where spread is at substantial or high levels. Um, so that's why I, I chose to wear the mask today, but it's strongly encouraged for folks to um, do the same. Um, to ask your question directly, Mr. Chair, so um, coming from JAMA, uh, Dr. Brooks and company um, found that community masks were substantially reduced transmission in severe acute at, um, illness syndrome in two ways. First. Masks prevent the infected person um, from exposing under the, others from SARS, uh, COVID-19, COVID and, um, and also protect the wearer um, from inhaling. Um, that they also note in their study that the mask, the person wearing the mask is more effective from passing it on to somebody than the versus the person who's wearing the mask and inhaling. There's more of an effectiveness to knock down those particles. So the best way I look at it, I like to keep things simple in my head. Um, you always want a goalie in the net. So playing hockey you know, as a kid, having a goalie in the net to make sure that puck doesn't get by, and it gives you kind of insurance not that to go by. Um, I won't do the, I won't go down the whole rundown, but there's about there's about 10, 11 other studies that I have um, from the literature, but I'll just go down a few from Hendricks et al. This is over the past year out of 139 patrons in a saloon, uh, and the the salon or the the beauty salon actually put. Uh, put forth a masking policy, no COVID, COVID infections among 67 patrons were available for follow-up. So basically um, they found it, that their patrons were not um, getting COVID spread from coming into their business. Um, Payne at Alia on this location, this was the USS Theodore Roosevelt. Of course, I'm gonna point out the Navy study. Uh, this is out of 382 US Navy servicemen. They were self-reported mask wearing. Mask wearing reduced the risk of infection by 70% um, in those that, that wore masks, so pretty significant. Um, and then uh, and another one by Van Dyke at Alia came out of Kansas. This was state population, mandatory mask wearing in public spaces. 
estimated case rate per 100,000 persons decreased by 0.08 in counties with mask mandates, but increased by 0.11 in those without. So those are just a few studies. I truly believe that masks work um, when we wear them properly, and it's a great public health practice that we, we, can, we can put in play. So. If you're on a Navy ship, that's kind of a closed environment, isn't it? Yes, sir. Very I mean, smart. you're not going to have a lot of outside input unless you're going ashore. Correct. I would think that would naturally reduce the number, <laughs> reduce the count. Yes. But define use properly, and which masks are effective and which are not. Sure. So use properly, obviously, the so keeping it simple, truly covering your nose and your mouth um, in, a, in a simple form. Um, now, the tighter the, the, the fabric on the mouth, the more, more knit is in there, the better chance you're gonna have from stuff coming, getting through the mask. The bigger the, the, the holes in the mask, it's obviously gonna pass through. That's just the simplest way of, of providing it. So that's why you see with the, the surgical mask offer a very decent amount of protection. And we talk about N95, so actually form fitted to your face offer 99.9 .9 plus percent protection um, from respiratory. What about the cotton mask that most people are wearing? I'm sorry? The cotton mask the, that so, most are wearing. Yeah, so again, it's just on the material, the density of the material. Um, something is better than nothing, right? So go back to the goalie analogy, even if I've got a short goalie in that, in that net, <laughs> um, I still got a goalie in the net protecting the, keeping the puck from coming through. Any other questions? I just, I got the vaccine, and I'm not going to comment about what I went through after I got both shots. And it, it just really irates me to think that I went through what I went through. It was my choice, and, and they tell me I still need to wear a mask. <laughs> because I know every day with something like this is constant unknown. I can't imagine being on that side of this, trying to try to just get one foot ahead of this. But I think that's the frustration that everybody feels because it seems like every day, back to the news, we hear something different and um, that, that uncertainty can really divide and cause stress and people say things to each other they normally wouldn't. And when we hear about children, they have no risk, but if it's your, child, your child that gets sick, then that's all that matters. So, um, uh, I don't know. But I think if, if a retailer is selling masks with <laughs> really pretty signs on it. It makes me wonder just how serious that mask is. So it's, it's a lot of elements looking at all this from every different side. I just want everybody to be safe. And how do you know what safe is? And we thank you. Yeah, do you want me to finish? I got a few more slides. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you were good. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be real quick. Take your time. Yeah, absolutely. You are the thank man you of the year. <laughs> All right, so current outbreaks and clusters, there are no outbreaks in nursing homes, residential care facilities, congregate living. We do have one outbreak in our correctional facility and uh, no clustering or uh, in child care or K through 12 schools. All right, so people vaccinated in Alamance County, 49.4% of our population have received at least one dose of the vaccine. 43.3 are fully vaccinated. And that's total population. When we look at 12 and older, 57.6 uh, of our population has received at least one dose, 50.6 um, fully vaccinated. And then when we look at 18 and older, 60% uh, with at least one dose, 53% fully vaccinated. And our greater than 65 years of age, and um, at least one dose, 80.3, and fully vaccinated, 78.7. Do we have any numbers for what the daily vaccination rate? I know we can get, you can get a shot now just about any any pharmacy or doctor's office you can go to. So they, they fluctuate. So I, I I keep a spreadsheet, and one day you might see 100 pop up, and then 300 the next day, and there's no consistency. I mean, even even what I'm about to report at the uh, the health department, we're seeing anywhere from 30 to 70. We might have 30 walk in on a Monday, and then Tuesday, boom, 70 show up out of the blue. So you know, sometimes it's hard to project for that, and you just do the best you can and move forward. But um, there, I haven't seen a consistent pattern in quite a while. Have you seen an increase since the big Delta thing has come onto the scene now? Is that instilling fear, more fear? Yeah, not not yet. I don't think we've, like I said, we've been sitting right in that 30, 30 or 70 window. Um, 
so I haven't seen a bump in that. We didn't see a bump with the, the lottery. Um, it stayed pretty much consistent. So. It's just so ironic whenever you had to call to get an appointment and you had to wait in your car. And I mean, boy, we got some really friendly. <laughs> and I get it. But I'm thinking, you, it was unbelievable because it was so fear driven. And now it's everywhere. I mean, it's everywhere. And it's just slow pace. I'll never understand human nature, ever. Uh, Tony, is there any data on vaccination rates in the county for school age children? As far as 12, between 12 and 17? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I could pull that. I'd be interested to okay. know that, yeah. The vaccines that all of our children got every so many months, MMR, you know, that just killed their little legs. My pediatrician used to say, I just make everybody's day horrible. And um, those, those vaccines weren't like an emergency style coming off a pandemic, were they? They were tested long and, and they were pretty much not going to let a sure thing. Compared to what we're going through now, thank God for it, but you know, there's all kind of just so much, there's just so much to think about with all this. And, um, and I understand both sides not wanting to get it. I don't want to wear a mask since I've got it. I mean, we, we just get real defiant sometimes. And I'm just curious about this, this young child age because of, um, I mean, I had some severe side effects with mine and I was just one of those people and I'm sure so many other people did too. And um, I just, if I was a parent, my kids are older, I would, I would be concerned about that because it's just not what we're used to. It's brand new and I don't know, it's just very alarming to me because of side effects of some things. We've had people, I mean, it's just, it's all just so much uncertainty. I don't mean to be Debbie Downer, but I'm just real concerned about very young people getting this, this brand new vaccine that's just come out and, and here it is, take it. I mean, I don't know. If you back out those 12 and under, and those that have already had COVID, what's the percentage of those that are vaccinated? If you just back out the 12, 12 and under? And those that have had COVID previously. Because we don't talk about that part hardly ever, because that's a big part too with Huge. antibodies. We just kind of put them over in the corner like they don't matter. We don't I, don't, I wouldn't know the, the COVID piece that previously. I, I don't, I'm not sure how I pull that data, yeah, data set. It's tough. Um, but it'd be a pretty high number, it, wouldn't it? It would be a higher number, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, we know we've had 22,000 people that have had COVID, right? That are still alive. Yeah. So we knew how many of those hadn't been have been vaccinated. Then we know how many have the antibodies that have not been vaccinated. So yeah. I don't know if we track that combination or not. Do we? We don't. Yeah, we don't. And the state where we put the vaccine information is the state system. Yeah. yeah. The state. Oh, there are more slides. <laughs> there, there's one, so two, two, last, two, last two pieces. <laughs> um, I already talked about the children under 12 piece FDA um, moving for moving towards full pray, full approval with Pfizer. Um, I think I just saw it in the news over the weekend that look, they're looking to realign um, and basically get their meetings, get the band together so they can start discussing it, looking at the data, and hopefully make a decision sooner or later. And then the last piece I have is we continue to, to um, hold appointments and walk-ins at the human service campuses. I already talked about 37 a day, 30 to 70 a day. We continue with our mobile outreach. June, we were at the Juneteenth, Juneteenth celebration, sock puppets game. Um, we've been in the homeless shelters, particularly as well, not only for COVID-19, mm -hmm. but we're currently working a hepatitis A outbreak. Um, so we've made hepatitis A available um, and, this, and the reason for it is because it's most prevalent in the homeless population and the MSM population so we're in the homeless shelters um, we're, we're asking if they'd like to get their hepatitis A vaccine to prevent that as well um, we continue in high density neighborhoods so apartment complexes mobile homes um, just going door to door and it, we ask questions if, if they if folks want it um, folks have been very happy with that we had one young lady who was thankful she takes care of her father and just couldn't couldn't leave him and yeah. I was glad we were able to go to the door and take care of that and then this Saturday we'll actually be at the Dream Center with a whole host of partners offering not only COVID vaccine but childhood vaccinations for for the kiddos to make sure they're ready to go for Good. for the school year and make sure they have their physicals as well so and that is all I have thank you thank you, thank you Tom. we've had a request for a 10-minute break
So we'll take a 10 minute break and hopefully come back at 10 minutes. Yeah. Think about it before. We're back in session. Ms. Rollins. Good morning, commissioners. <laughs> So we have a PowerPoint for you today. And we're giving you five minutes. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> five minutes is fine. That's a lot of information. I am sure you have waited your entire career for this moment right here. <laughs> oh, please, please. So the PowerPoint was a little bit long. It was meant to be a reference document. I'm not going to cover every slide today. If you do have questions, um, there'll be time for that. I'd like to start, though, um, by talking about American Rescue Plan enacted in March. It's $1.9 trillion, and it's giving stimulus funding to individuals, to businesses, to education, transportation, to nonprofits, and state and local government. So the U.S. Treasury is the agency that is distributing the funding, and they're setting the guidance. And it's important, you'll hear it a couple of times today, they haven't told us the final guidance. They have given us some interim things. They've given us... Uh, some fact sheets, question and answers. They've given us um, a little bit of information, but we're expecting the final guidance to be released in the next few weeks, hopefully next month. Um, but at that point, we'll be able to answer more questions than we can now. So the main focus today is to just uh, uh, to talk about how Alamance County can develop a plan to spend our funding. So I'd like to share a little bit of information at the beginning about the federal law, the state government, and then um, talk a little bit about the details and how that applies to Alamance County. So what you'll see is that that $1.9 trillion was separated into seven different areas. They're color coded, the green is us. The green is what Alamance County received, the state and uh, our municipalities received funding through that particular source. The gray areas are going to other folks. So direct financial assistance is things like the child tax credits that the IRS is handling. Um, there was education funding that went directly to schools. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services is uh, receiving funding directly. Eventually that may flow through to our health department, but there are um, the assistance to individuals and families. That's Quick question. One. Sir. Money to the health department is not like what we're, our, our 32 million includes their funding or doesn't include their funding? Is there separate funding going to the There is separate funding for health programming that's at the federal level, also at state level. That will come to the county health department? It could. It could. Okay. Eventually, as, as they determine what hmm. programming. So all of this is, is flowing through federal yeah. government programming, and some of those could impact our community. Well, to tag him, there's a, there's a slide that talks about some requests from certain agencies within, and there's like a special nurse or something with the health department, communicable disease nurse or mm -hmm. something. And um, is that coming out of ours or one of those gray squares, so to speak? Because he just asked, is that separate to the health department or are we, are, are we doing the health department? So sure. we can do programs for the health department with our $32 million. That is allowable. There will be funding uh, in addition to our $32 million that the health department may receive or may be able to apply for. But that particular slide is talking about okay. our, our 32 million. Okay, just checking. So the important piece of this slide is the gray areas are not funding that Alamance County controls. Okay. The green area, there will be some funding there, 32 million that Alamance County can control. And the blue area was another area that I'd like to mention, if we could, could Scott, if you would help me uh, advance. So the blue area were federal grants, and that's another thing that Alamance County could participate in. These are not automatic, but there are categories of grant funding at the federal level that are available to us. We could apply for it. Our nonprofits could apply for it. So if we see something in these categories that uh, Alamance County has a need for, we don't necessarily have to use the $32 million that was allocated to Alamance County. We could consider applying for grant funding. Excuse me. Would our nonprofits have to apply through the county or would they have to apply directly to the feds? So I believe that um, on our website, we're going to have links for each one of these areas. They may be different, um, but I don't believe they have to apply through Alamance County. I think that anyone could apply individually. So right now we know that ABSS is going to receive about $77 million. Yes, that would come in through the, child, through the education and child 
portion from the federal it doesn't come through the county that's correct so then there's going to be additional funding that might come to acta to link transit that won't come through the county either that's correct that's now do correct. they have to apply for that too or is that just liable to flow in so it depends on which one of these funding sources and that's the main uh point that i wanted to make here is that art is a big funding source it's flowing through a lot of different government levels and their sub levels so anytime we have a program or something that uh, needs to be funded we would want to go back to this thought process to determine is there direct federal funding for it is there state funding for it is there going to be any kind of flow through that comes to us and then would Alamance County prefer to be the funding source so, using ARP funds so right now we know there's about 32 million coming to the county another 32 million coming to municipalities and then 77 million coming to the schools that's about 140 million but we still don't know that that's all of it correct so if as we're looking at making decisions about where to spend this money we've got to be careful not to make decisions to spend money on something that something else might come in for through acta or link or health department so that we're duplicating that effort and then what you're using money here that we might not be, might be able to better use someplace else and additionally we don't have all the guidelines that's yet exactly anyway, right yeah so we can't appropriate it so at the federal level we'll be monitoring that we'll make sure that there are links to get to information and let Scott? me slow you down what we keep talking about a grant writer at least i do with you folks in in management where are we with a grant writer so that will be one of the items we'll talk about when i present some right. options for the board to consider uh for funding immediately that's uh, that's one position that the board could consider and to me these would be these would be potential funding sources that a grant writer would be looking at not just for county government but for cities nonprofits or any of our other partners uh, volunteer fire departments groups like sheriff's that. department for example. yes absolutely sheriff's department it, the goal would be to learn as much as possible about these different pots and then have someone uh, on board specifically tasked with the application process. But we'll talk about that when we get to the funding piece. Uh, Sorry about that. That was a loaded good. question, and I knew that was already in the agenda. <laughs> no problem. So if we can advance, the green category is the state and local fiscal recovery funds. They're giving funding to directly to said North Carolina. You'll see... Um, and I'd like to mention on this slide, there's a coronavirus capital projects of $10 billion. Those are capital project funding available to states. And the state of North Carolina applied for some of those funding and, and was awarded some of those, those funds. Uh, the next category was the state fiscal recovery fund and the state of North Carolina got about 5.4 billion there. The next category is the local fiscal recovery fund and you'll see that Alamance County received its funding through this funding source and our municipalities will. City of Burlington was a direct allocation. It's considered a metropolitan city. All of our other municipalities have a population less than 50,000 people, which means that they receive their funding um, through the state. U.S. Treasury gave the funds to the state. The state will distribute them to the municipalities as well as give them guidance through the uh, NC Pro division of the state. Um, Alamance County and City of Burlington will report directly to the U.S. Treasury uh, on how we spend our funds. But if you see the local fiscal recovery fund, the guidelines for how to spend those funds will be the same for us. Whereas the state or any other funding source in the ARP plan could have different rules for spending. So when we talk today about how Alamance County would be spending, we would be looking at the specific rules under subtitle M of the law. So the grant writer that Mr. Paisley just mentioned could be funded from ARP funds, yes. am I correct? Yes. But he could also, he or she could also assist 501c3s or other agencies of that, whatever, in, in writing grants as well. Yes, sir. I, th I think one thing we would, I don't want to get too far ahead of Andrew's info, but I think one thing we, we would want to know for a grant writer's purpose is uh, you know, if the goal, if the board has priorities, specific priorities for our community that you'd like to see, that would probably be the direction we'd want to task a grant writer to go. So, you know, if there was something the board said, this is really important to us, 
we want the grant writer, if, if we do that, to focus on finding those kind of opportunities that support board initiatives. But they could assist nonprofits, cities, fire departments, uh, ACTA, any other entity in the county. I have a question um, directed at Ms. Thompson. Um, well, <laughs> well you, were, you were on the school board. No. <laughs> yeah. uh, don't they have grant writers at the school um, system? Dr. Boss does a lot of the grant writing for ABSS, and she is unbelievable. Could she help us? I, I can't speak for her, but I'm sitting here thinking about her, and she's going to kill me for mentioning her name. But, I mean, I mean, she is as accurate as they get. There's a lot of fantastic grant writers working for the nonprofits in in our county that know this game I mean because you got to have the font right the page right I mean they're real nitpicky about stuff but I mean they are they, there's some unbelievable grant writers that you could maybe subcontract out I don't know instead of hiring a position which I don't know that either but I'm telling you there's some really unbelievable grant writers in this county well mr. Haygood said that you know they could help with nonprofits and others I was thinking I know there's some folks over at the ABSS who I did not say Angela Boss name. Well, I had heard her name before. <laughs> She's gonna kill me. And I knew and I had talked to some folks over at the She's school unbelievable. System and She's thought good. that maybe they could help us do this. Yeah. Certainly. Excellent. It's, we're all in the same we're all in the awesome. same for the reason. You know, good gotta stuff. work together. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> I'm so dead. <laughs> so for the category of funding that Alamance County has control and our local municipalities will have the same rules. These are the five funding categories that have been defined um, for the spending in, in these funding. And there are some areas that are ineligible. They were very specific to say that uh, you can't make debt payments, you can't fund your pension plan, um, they don't want us using the funding for lawsuits or settlements out of ARP. There's a couple more uh, details in there, but um, those were the, the items that were ineligible. And then they gave five categories for uh, us as a framework for how we can spend our funding. So we'll go into the details of these with some more examples later in the presentation, but I wanted you to know that these are the things that the ARP legislation gave us as guidelines. The state of North Carolina will add to that. So I'd like to talk just a little bit about um, the differences and if we can advance that, Scott, I'm having trouble. One more. So I told you the state of North Carolina received $5.4 billion. They can budget that into their own plan, or they could subgrant that to local governments. That's the state's choice. Um, they also have control of the funds that flow through to the municipalities. They've chosen to um, allocate those funds to municipalities through their pandemic uh, response group, the NC Pro Group, which um, uh, could add additional requirements to the municipalities. So I mentioned that because even though we are not reporting back to NC Pro, our municipalities will be, we want to make sure that we understand what their what additional requirements they may be uh, adding for our local municipalities so that we're in alignment and that we understand what is the thinking around using ARP. Now does Burlington report back through them too or Burlington goes they back to the feds? They would go back to the feds. So we'll be sending reports monthly, quarterly, excuse me, quarterly back to uh, the U.S. Treasury. Certain fairly soon now, as soon as they provide us the framework. So Scott, if you would advance to the next slide. The <coughs> it's important for us to remind everyone that the local government, the school of government folks, everyone who is giving advice and informational trainings about using ARP, has recommended that we all stay in sync. They want us to wait for the state. They want us to wait for the guidance. They want to make sure that we don't finalize a plan that is not thoughtful. So um, we can get started, but they want us to make sure that we are paying attention and, and, and working to, uh, to do the best to align these funds with, with other plans. The state of North Carolina did release their preliminary plan. The governor proposed a plan in May um, I have provided a link in this proposal. It's, uh, I don't know, about 100 pages long. And um, they have five areas, I believe. If we advance to the next slide, we may see, nope, missed it. That's, for, that's uh, information is available at the, uh, in, as part of the slide deck. But there were five areas where the state of North Carolina wants to spend funding. And that proposed plan um, 
is under review. It's, I believe it's part of the, the budget discussions. So we're expecting the state budget and the state art plan this fall. And uh, we've been told September, but we're not sure. We have to, uh, to wait and see what their process is. I, One of, I think I heard too, excuse me, I think I heard too that they one of the things that I saw in the plan is we can't use money ourselves unless there's a state change in statutes for broadband expansion, but the state's looking at providing additional funding for broadband expansion, and I've seen that number run between 400 and $700 million. Does that sound right? I think, uh, was it $1.2 billion that the state was? It's uh, actually expanded to $1.2 billion. It's gone up, okay. So at this point, the state's talking about, in their five areas, they're talking about assistance to individuals, they're talking about infrastructure, and the biggest piece of their infrastructure is the broadband initiative. Um, they're doing workforce, the biggest piece of that is higher education, supporting technology, scholarships, grants. Um, they're talking about promoting business development, so that would affect the hospitality industry, uh, grants for economic development, the arts, um, and they're also talking about uh, spending money to position government to best serve North Carolina. And that's where um, they're providing some funding for some of this information, these trainings that we're getting. Um, and they're uh, upgrading hospitals and other public buildings and technology for telework. And so. that's all because of COVID. It's all funded in their um, their proposed art plan. What was the thing you said about helping government? What was that, the second to the last one you read? Positioning government to best serve North Carolina. Okay, so we got to have COVID money to pay our government how to best serve us. Just asking for a friend. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry, Adrian. I just find that really just ridiculous. <laughs> what do I know? So on this slide, Alamance County received $32.9 million. Half of it was received in May. That was the first tranche. The second tranche comes a year later. And this, this is, these are their, their terminologies. They're just making up words. <laughs> the, uh, the spending guidelines, once again, they haven't told us the final guidance. But it's important to realize that um, the spending authority related to counties uh, in North Carolina will still need to be followed. So even though I said the U.S. Treasury guidance for municipalities and counties will be the same, there are things that counties can do that cities cannot, and vice versa. And we'll be uh, aligning the federal fund. The federal funding ignored that. Their guidance will ignore that, but we will have to make sure that we follow um, the, the state law on that as well. So we're going to be audited by the, both the state and the feds on this? There will be federal guidance. They'll give a compliance su supplement that will be released to our annual auditors. So right. in a, as part of our annual audit, right. very likely because of the size of the funding, there will be a special compliance audit added to our normal audit process. In other words, yes. Hmm? In other words, yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. We'll be reviewed. Scott, please advance. So the guidance for us at the federal level is the U.S. Treasury. The local government commission is going to help us stay in compliance at the state level. The school of government, all the associations are constantly providing information. And as I mentioned, uh, NC Pro for our municipalities, they're called non-entitlement units. They're, um, the smaller municipalities will, will be following that guidance as well. Well, Andrew, what does non-entitlement unit mean? An entitlement unit is something to do with how the federal government grants for um, the CDBG program. Oh. And so if a unit is uh, has a population of 50,000 or more, they're considered an entitlement unit. Okay. And those who are smaller are not. Okay. Next slide. So this is one that we have um, borrowed from other presentations because in the state of North Carolina, they want to remind everyone that counties may not give grants to nonprofits. We can contract with a nonprofit for them to perform a service that the county would normally be allowed to do. So it's a distinction that we follow in our budget. So anytime that we have funded uh, nonprofits in our budget, we're following that distinction with them. And um, they're reminding us that the ARP funding works the same way. 
There's also very specific state parameters about employee compensation for uh, counties that uh, would come into play if premium pay were considered by this board as a good use of our ARP funding. Also, it's important to know that although the federal government allows us to distribute premium pay outside of our employees, there is no state authority for premium pay to be uh, distributed to private businesses. So ARP saying one thing, state of North Carolina rules will tell us something a little different. Um, same thing with broadband. There was funding in this, in this act for counties to uh, participate in broadband infrastructure, but there is no authority in North Carolina at this time for us to do anything past what is needed for county operations. So be fine, except it's needed for county operations. I mean, that's a wide open statement. So it just means their intent has been to. Um, I'm not even. I'm not even willing to say that. But there's legislation in place at the state level addressing this issue because they are um, interested in making it possible to use some level of ARP funding for local broadband initiatives. And that's and that part of what Ms. Gailey is now working on, is it not? That's my understanding. Yeah. So and that's, that's also to enable us to do what, they, what, the, what that statute that's being proposed is like, mm -hmm. allow us to find out, actually know where this stuff is needed ourselves. Right. So and I do have a couple of slides about local broadband initiatives that we'll get to very shortly. Um, the only other thing on this slide is that local government partnerships is a way to uh, accomplish goals. If, for example, a municipality has the uh, legal authority in North Carolina to do something that the county wants to see achieved, we can partner with them. Mm -hmm. So the funding can be used in that way. Next slide, please. So here's something that um, we've been seeing in uh, trainings at the conferences where other counties are um, trying to define for their community some guiding principles. And they made sense. I wanted to share them as examples with the commissioners because from our staff level, we found them useful. But clearly, we want to spend ARP funding on things that are eligible under ARP as well as state statute. Um, it makes sense to focus on one-time investments. We don't want to spend funds and put ourselves into a situation where we wouldn't be able to afford it when the ARP funds ran out. Um, focusing on projects where the county can leverage other federal and state funds. These are all very typical of the initiatives. And then uh, Wake County added that they were uh, had giving consideration to projects located in low to moderate income areas of their community. And that's specifically referencing some statutory language about a QCT. And I've got a slide to show you how that might affect Alamance County. Um, consider funding projects that are inclusive and to the benefit of all. I am clearly focusing on projects that address board goals. So this kind of guiding principles would be helpful. Our, our staff would find it useful in bringing information to the board and to, um, if you are interested in a committee to review projects for the ARP plan, um, this may be something that you want to consider. Well, I've had some conversations too with um, Burlington and they were very interested in partnering with the county on some of these issues and I think the other municipalities would be the same way. I mean, if, they, if they're bringing in $32 million and we're getting $32 million, we can figure out how to best utilize all those funds. So when we first found out that there was funding available, there was a presentation in April basically uh, just sharing that um, we needed to get started. So we came up with strategic actions. We wrote it down. We've been working this plan in the background. Um, we have a team leader. Mimi Clemens here is um, our team leader for planning for art. It's so nice to see you in person. <laughs> <laughs> I was starting to think you were imaginary. Uh, this entire presentation is due to her hard work. Um, so from all the various sources, we gathered information to prepare a, a guidance document. It's available on our website. We've shared it with the commissioners. It has to be updated weekly, bi-weekly, because of new information. Um, we've got, uh, Brian Haygood has the team meeting weekly. Uh, we're preparing reports to keep track and to keep us moving forward. And there have been phone calls. The, the public has called in. We've had 
uh, media requests and uh, community stakeholders have contacted us <clears throat> and we've tried to resp we have responded to um, everyone who has uh, contacted us with questions but sometimes the response is we don't know the answer yet we will be sharing information in future so part of what the team has been doing is to opening lines of communication with our municipalities uh, we've had stakeholder discussions internally so we've talked to all of the departments, Mimi has talked to all of our departments, and any nonprofit agency that is funded with, uh, in, within our budget to make sure that we had um, some information from them if they have initiatives or things that have not been funded that would be very helpful. We wanted to get that into a master list in order to share that information with the commissioners. Um, we also have agencies that are, would like to be stakeholders, that would like to help be helpful. So we have a list of those as well as um, we continue to maintain contact with those whose programs may be ARP eligible. So for example, there is the uh, Alamance Recovery Loan Program, Mimi's uh, and I think uh, uh, Commissioner Carter participate with that, that group. And there's a new group called the Digital Inclusion Alliance that has started meeting. Uh, to determine what are the broadband needs for our community. And as I mentioned, our finance department received funding, made sure that it's budgeted and invested appropriately. And now let's talk about what fits, what we have heard, the kinds of things that we can fund using ARP funding. So the first category is to support public health initiatives. We can buy equipment, we can hire personnel. There are data systems that we might need that would be allowable. Capital investments in public buildings to the extent that um, is allowed by the law, which typically talks about um, safe distancing efforts, ventilation efforts, HVAC is a, a huge need in a lot of our public buildings. The court systems might have needs that would fit into this category. And then, uh, Covering payroll for public health, health care, human services, and public safety staff is allowable, and we're allowed to be um, to, to apply that since March 3rd of 21. So those are things that were mentioned in there, as well as supporting mental health initiatives. So treatment programs, behavioral and mental health services, crisis intervention, services or outreach programming, all of that fits into that first category. From, a, from a, uh, investment in public facilities, the, the expense for the new chiller? It's possible because of uh, most of what we've seen is HVAC work. Right. Uh, and as Andrew mentioned, any kind of social distancing work or improvements you're doing to buildings to keep people safer inside the building or planning for those type of uh, improvements to be done. But HVAC work's been one of the, the bigger topics right. that we've seen as a possibility. So the second category of spending is addressing the negative economic impact of the pandemic. And they've given a lot of information here. I've picked examples of things that they mentioned. Delivering assistance to workers and families, um, job training, food and security issues, small business loan programs, recovery of our tourism and hospitality sectors. And then uh, they also have an allowable area for rebuilding the public sector capacity. And they mentioned serving the hardest hit communities. Sir. I'm sorry, One, another question. Uh, we've had a, a, an item that we've been discussing for a number of years, a divergent center under mental health. Is that something we could look at for some of this funding? I believe so, yes. Indeed. Could be, be uh, could be some portion of capital uh, if it were something that was going to be renovated or uh, or constructed, if it fits within the, the ARP guidelines for the capital piece, but also on the programmatic end, mm -hmm. understanding that, uh, you know, as the gentleman from VIA talked about, there's a desire to make sure that's sustainable right. going forward. So it may be these funds could help for a couple of years, but, you know, the hope will be um, VIA can work with us to help us find a way to keep that going uh, in the future. So the qualified census track is something that is in the legislation that I wanted to bring to your attention. 
um, we would get into the details of it if it if it came up as a part of your decision making. I wanted to mention that this is something that at the federal level they make it easier for us to spend funding if we're spending within a QCT. A qualified census tract is something defined by the federal government. Housing and Urban Development, the HUD, has set these tracks. They're defined, and um, we have a map for the, the QCT that is in Alamance County. Uh, but what they have determined is that anyone living in that area or whose business is in that area is considered a low to moderate income area automatically, so we don't have to do anything extra or special to, in our process to, um, to prove to them that we're spending in a low to moderate income area. So, so that was a low to moderate income area prior to COVID? It was. Okay. So here is a map of the one QCT that is in Alamance County. The line across the bottom, the yellow line across the bottom is I-85, I-40. And you'll see that the purple area defines the region that HUD determined was our QCT. And I think most people who look at it would believe that we would, uh, any programming that was offered for low to moderate income people would probably exceed this area. We wouldn't be defining it specifically to, to this area. So there very likely will be additional work that we'll want to do to make sure that we are um, substantiating to the government that, uh, to the federal government, that uh, our programming is uh, reaching the right people. The third category of spending was revenue replacement, and that was very exciting until we realized that Alamance County did not qualify for <laughs> revenue replacement. Um, the federal government defined the terms of how you compute it, and uh, they, they included quite a bit of revenues, and overall, Alamance County was very fortunate coming through pandemic without uh, a significant loss of revenue. However, that would have been a way for our agency to spend money fairly freely on anything that we normally would do. So it's important to know that because other agencies who did experience revenue losses are going to have, um, find it easier to spend ARP on some really creative things that may not be available to our group. We can re recalculate the revenue replacement calculations once a year and uh, we'll see what the future holds. But uh, at this point, revenue replacement is not an option for us. The fourth category listed in the legislation is all about premium pay. And there's been a lot of discussions about this uh, across the state. Um, premium pay can be retroactive. It goes back to uh, January of 2020. Uh, it could be prospective. So if premium pay is something that um, this board would like to consider as an option for ARP funding, uh, you'll need to know a little bit more about the, the rules on that. Um, there are limits. So if there is a prospective pay increase planned, uh, $13 an hour or an individual limit of $25,000 per eligible worker. Um, people who worked during the pandemic who were face-to-face -face are typically, um, that's the category, the way they categorize eligibility. So those who teleworked would not be eligible typically under the, uh, the ARP funding. So would that include teachers, DSS? So the federal uh, government said- Health department. Uh, there were a lot of categories that would farm workers, those who worked in warehouses, okay. grocery store workers. What are you talking about? private industry. The federal government included all of those as options for premium pay. However, the state of North Carolina right. does not allow us, the county, to distribute funding to those folks. Well, Which we can folks? to, excuse me. We're not allowed to. The private businesses. Probably. Distribute funding to private businesses. But we can to employees, county employees. To county employees and certain other, um, and there's, there's specific rules on this. So if that's something that this um, board would like to consider we'll pull out the lead each one of these is a separate discussion you can talk for about an hour about <laughs> all the rules related to premium pay but that's also not to say that they may not change the rules before we get to the end of this process and we may be able to do something like that so that's what's interesting the law won't change so the baseline but how it's interpreted is what we're hoping to find out more so category five was investing in broadband and water and sewer we talked before a little bit about broadband. 
right now, Alamance County has no water and sewer projects uh, on the horizon, um, but ABSS schools, the ACC Training Center, both of those um, agencies may have projects. There may be municipal projects that uh, would benefit uh, countywide that you'd want to consider. And I mentioned that there is legislation. So there's a State Bill 689 and there's a House Bill 947 that last time we checked, they were under consideration. And um, both of these bills, we're, we're watching them to see what happens. But as I mentioned early in the presentation, the federal government wants to spend money on broadband. The state of North Carolina has built broadband into its ARC plan. So there is, at those levels, funding for broadband. And these two uh, pieces of legislation appear to let counties to participate. There may be some matching funds. There may be some level of participation that they want to allow us to participate in using ARC funds. So we'll be monitoring that and uh, bringing updates as uh, action is taken. I mentioned that the Alamance Digital Inclusion Alliance has been created. Impact Alamance and the Piedmont Tribe Regional Council have gathered a group of folks together. Their plan is to promote affordable high-speed home broadband, digital literacy training, technical support, and the first thing they have to do is to assess what's the, the level of our problem. Uh, what's the digital divide specifically in Alamance County? To do that, they do need information from the public. There is a survey that they hope to get wide participation from folks who may or may not have adequate broadband. The survey, there's information about this on our website. There's we have flyers. Uh, this particular group is trying to reach out to people, probably through the school system, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, they're trying to reach out to get folks to please report in. Uh, the more participants they get, the more likely they are to be able to put together a plan that alleviates the problem. Has this information been disseminated to the media? I don't know. I believe so. I think Bruce and uh, folks in IT have been working to get this word out locally to try to get as many people as possible in Alamance County to take this survey. It's, it's extremely important. I know he's, uh, uh, Bruce in particular, has worked very closely with uh, the school system too to try to get, get that information out and get it home with kids, encourage families to, to take this survey. Can well, I ask have a about question? A six. I, I'm just really curious. When you're talking about broadband, because I know before I got off the board, we had a time when we had to go remote and depending on where you lived, you know, some kids may be at Starbucks, I mean, but you couldn't be there because of the, it was just a nightmare with hot spots that were very, very, very expensive. When you're talking about broadband, are you talking about laying the infrastructure for the house at all the way down in Sylvan Elementary, across from that school, being able to purchase internet? Or are you talking about broadband and everybody's internet is free? I think it's, I, I, I feel like this is two issues in the broadband problem. One is the infrastructure that gets it out, particularly right. to the rural areas of the county where there may not be a great market for the private providers, you know, they're weighing it out their cost per foot and how much they might get back by how many mm -hmm. people are out there, then that's another piece of it. What you're talking about is people's inability to pay for it. So you may have access to broadband in a highly urban area, but maybe those families are not able to pay for it. So it's two, it's two issues. I think what we have mostly spent our time talking about is the infrastructure, mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to see can the county become eligible to either uh, contract with someone to put the infrastructure in, uh, uh, that's been the primary focus, but I believe it's two, it's two pieces. It's, it's the existing infrastructure and the availability of it, then some folks' ability to pay. I think if I recall correctly, isn't there a maximum amount we can contribute in a partnership with a, with a provider such as AT&T or uh, Spectrum or somebody like that? There's a maximum partnership amount we can put into that, like 35%? I believe so. I know we had one project on the hook back uh, in 2020 that we were going to use some CRF funding for that was in rural southwest Alamance County. It was a new subdivision going in and we were working through Piedmont Tribe uh, <coughs> Regional Council to, to they were they were using funding from the state to try to encourage uh, private developers to pick an area, a new development and make that investment. 
the funding was going to come through the state. The county was the applicant, but it had to flow through PTRC because we don't have that statutory authority. We got right down to the point where the company had looked at it and agreed to do it, and then the funding was reallocated. I don't know what it was reallocated for. So the project didn't take off. But the hope is either the state takes this on as an initiative and really comes in and starts identifying these areas of counties around the state that have troubles. That's why this survey is so important. Uh, or we're going to have legislation passed that gives the county the ability to to not do it like Richard Hill uh, or, uh, excuse me, Buddy or Joel's people were out digging, but we're able to contract, find right. somebody to come right. Out. Advance the slide, please. So I did mention that we are putting information out on the website. We will share this uh, this document uh, and any other reference materials. And then as actions are taken, we'll share that as well. Uh, we're starting to get more and more phone calls from the public wanting to know what's going on with the uh, ARP plan. So it's going to be under government, county manager's department. You'll find the American Rescue Plan there. It's also available on the main page under the current topics. And the last slide, please, is next steps. Because all of this is to say we need to develop a plan. Um, you saw how the state's plan had five overarching areas. They had like 29 different initiatives underneath all of the, that, those five overarching areas. But that's kind of the thing that would help uh, communicate and help us justify spending under the ARP plan to be able to communicate with the U.S. Treasury that, um, for example, we think broadband is the biggest priority for our community, and then further define what that means and what the actions we took uh, in order to, to achieve something for our community, and then what we spent. So that kind of thought process will go into an ARP plan. Um, reviewing the community needs, currently we have um, only reached out to our departments uh, but reviewing the water community, getting stakeholder input, matching those needs to whether it could be ARP funded, is there another source, any of those gray areas, is there grant funding out there available for something, what's the best source of funding for what we want to try to achieve, um, and then being able to communicate not only um, out to the community but from uh, to receive input from stakeholders is important, and then there are going to be all kinds of funding considerations. So having some way of funneling that or organizing that um, would be useful. And that leads to, I think uh, Brian Haygood has some information to share. Any questions? Thank you. Just one thing, and you go ahead, you can answer it on your way. When you're talking about retroactive pay and all kind of stuff for county employees, is that correct, but not private sector employees? Is the hospital, where do they stay? Where do they lay at? I think they're private sector, but I'm not 100% sure of that. I see some uh, heads nodding, so I think they would be private sector. But again, the the federal level approval was, uh, you know, the local governments could give those uh, premium pay to any of these folks. State. State restrictions prevent us from doing it uh, for private businesses or anybody that would qualify as private like the hospital. Now, is, the, is that going to be a, is that a federal thing that would help hospitals? Because, you know, I find it real ironic, and I'm looking up a can of worms here, that the very people that wore their masks so tight that I saw lines in their faces and they were in every emergency room and in every ward of hospital while COVID was a total 10 on the Richter scale. And now these very same people that we held as heroes and some lost their life because of COVID are being told that you're gonna to have to get a vaccine or we're gonna let you go. I, I think that is just absolutely the biggest slap in anybody's face. And I, I think, what do you do if everybody says, fine then, we're gone. Who's, uh, who's is me and Bill going to go over and run the emergency room? God help all you people. <laughs> you know, I give you a Tylenol and that's about it. But I mean, I, I, I just find the hypocrisy of some, and I know this isn't a county issue, but this needs to be stated, that the hypocrisy of some of this, when we're talking about broadband, and we're looking at giving people all oh, this free, it's just free, free, free. It is not free. And it infuriates me that we're just talking about all of it. And once again, flying over the sky on a broom. 
it, it just astounds me how we can have these conversations. And there, I keep looking at Bill thinking, what are we doing? <laughs> you know, because it just astounds me how this is becoming our normal conversation and nothing about this is normal because I think a tasty bakery, 69 years and they've closed because of lack of help and other reasons in our town. And I think, what about them? But yet we can run infrastructure to do all this other stuff. And they, how many birthday cakes have we bought from them? And they were always there for us. And I'm, I'm, I don't know, I just get really frustrated. And I know y'all can't stand it when I get on a rant, but it just astounds me at what I'm hearing. Because Andrea's saying, we're gonna do this. And in the next sentence, well, we can't do that. I'm going, what the heck can we do? Because it seems so confusing to me and I, I'm certainly not genius, smart, whatever level compared to you guys, but what I'm hearing is we don't know what we don't know. And how are we supposed to lead with that if we go to promising folks money that really serve people hurting in this community and then the next week, oh, just pick and bring your money back. That, it's just so uncertain. I don't, I, it's very confusing to me. It, it is, it, it's very concerning to me too because I think, what are we supposed to do with all this? You're talking about one thing and the state says yes, feds say no. I got my own opinion about the feds. But, um, I mean, it's just, just, this is what I call a hot mess to the second power because I just don't understand how we're going to do this. I, I don't really understand how we're going to do this. I'm just glad we got a lot of time. Yes. There is a lot of time involved here. And I have a feeling that, and I was talking to other commissioners uh, about some things that we, Anyone is in the construction business, building schools, all these projects we have, there's going to be a lot of time that we're going to miss. Hmm. Like, we're not going to be able to get the projects done that we want to get done in the time that we need to get done. Because there's so many, think of that, everyone's rushing toward the door. Mm -hmm. Everyone's trying to get through. So you got to ask yourself, are you going to have this situation going on for the next six months? Absolutely. Next year? Huh. Very Probably. good possibility. Mm -hmm. Two years? Yes. You look at our time frame, we got three and a half years to get rid of this money. I have a feeling we'll get, get it done, don't get me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there's a lot of time, so I just wanted just to say there's some time to get this done. We don't have to rush through the door right now. That's, that's absolutely right. In fact, uh, Commissioner Lashley's hit a good point that the state and the local government commission, the folks have encouraged counties and local governments to to take their time, make wise decisions, watch what's going on around them, uh, particularly observe what the state does, where the state decides to spend its money in its final uh, uh, application. So, uh, and this is uh, precedent setting, uh, not something that you know county government or, or is used to trying to figure out having a $32 million allocation come uh, with these rather broad guidance, you know, and, and categories where you can spend, but having to balance that with what does the state allow the county to do, right? The federal government, uh, we don't interact with them too much on direct allocations uh, to the county, so we have to make sure we stay in conjunction with the state. But um, I just want to say, commissioners, I want to uh, thank Andrea and Mimi and Selena too, I think Selena's probably watching by Zoom, for they have attended every NACO Association of County Commissioner School of Government webinar that has been put on and uh, it has been a tremendous amount of information to try to take in and learn and sort. And I think we're in a good place right now with this information that you just received, some of the stuff you're gonna hear now because of the work that they've done. So I'm glad you get to see Mimi because if she's uh, not uh, sending you an email, she's on a, a webinar or a conference call somewhere. And uh, that has been extremely helpful because our goal is to stay compliant. We want to, we want to, help you think about how to spend this money in effective ways and also be compliant. Uh, so at the end, we're able to say, yes, we, we did this well and, and uh, we used the money the way that it was intended to do so. Well, I got a question for Mimi with all You're this, is it so rewire her brain? I don't know how you do what you do. It's amazing. Sorry. Uh, I said I had a question for Mimi with all this, is it rewired your brain? Because I mean, you, <laughs> <laughs> it's, yes. Just trying to keep up it on our up with it on our end is just bizarre. But uh, I mean, I agree with what Pan's saying. I mean, you know, SARS is just a cold, right? I mean, so a cold is SARS. So we've been having those. They've been going. They're not going to go away. And we've been dealing with the flu for how many generations now? It's not going to go away. I mean, we're probably going to wind up with an annual COVID 
vaccine and an annual flu vaccine and whatever well, else comes around. Israelis but, just gave a booster to their this weekend. That's right. Mm -hmm. First country to do that. So, so commissioners, the info that you just received from Andrea, uh, very good overview of federal, state, uh, and local applications of ARP, and then there are additional slides in that presentation that are further U.S. Treasury guidance. And the idea was, this is a good distilled version of the state and federal law and guidance that we'll use going forward uh, to help us figure out how to spend these funds. So. Um, what I wanted to bring before the commissioners is uh, some thoughts about, Scott, you may have to advance me, uh, about funding considerations in the very short term. Andrew is absolutely right. We have not received the interim guidance uh, from the feds. I mean, excuse me, we are operating under the interim guidance. We have not uh, received the uh, final guidance. But there are some considerations that I believe the commissioners could make, at, even at this early, early point in ARP spending that you may want to, you may want to do. Uh, our, our staff have engaged with all the county department uh, leadership and some of our partner nonprofits, as Andrea mentioned. Um, you know, we knew as soon as this money came down, we know our departments have uh, insight into community needs too, so we thought what better place to start, we'll get input from the department heads. Um, and we've reviewed all the information that Mimi has met with every department head, their teams, some of them several times, many of the nonprofits that operate through our budget and she has cataloged, uh, cataloged all of their responses, and we've tried to go through them and think some of these could be immediate, that the commissioners may want to consider funding um, immediately, or ones that we want to consider future because they may need some additional research, they may uh, need some additional cost data too. So we've tried to base these immediate and future funding potentials on their known cost. Do these things have costs that we know of, and do we feel that they're eligible from an ARP and state uh, perspective and we also in this that I'll talk to you that I'm going to talk to you about included a reimbursement possibility that's a little different than spending on some program or piece of equipment or on or, or on personnel so. so for the the commissioners to consider in the very near future we feel like there are a couple of items and potential uh, personnel that you could consider spending art funds on immediately they total a little over $1 million, and I'm just going to go through them to make sure it's clear what we're talking about here. You heard Andrea mention that ARP money can be used for mental health services. And as commissioners know, during the budget process, we had requests uh, from agencies to increase their budgets, particularly for mental health type services. We feel that um, family abuse services and crossroads sexual assault are both providing mental health type services. And what you see here is uh, allocations that would go over three years that the board could do. Even at this early point in, uh, in ARP guidance, we feel like these are going to be acceptable in the final guidance too. We're looking at uh, suggesting the board consider a little over $35,000 a year for three years for family abuse and $75,000 a year for crossroads. Those are uh, allocations the board may want to consider in the very short term. We also had two uh, needs for equipment that really stood out uh, as we talked with departments. One, uh, the detention center, as you know, the detention center has been battling COVID outbreaks off and on ever since last year and have done a fine job. They have been few and far between, knock on wood. I think that's a sign of the way uh, the sheriff's folks and the health department's folks have worked together to streamline how people come in, what happens to them. I think you heard the sheriff mention fairly recently that there would be value in having health software that would connect inmates medical records to our local hospital or our statewide hospital systems we believe that would be a very reasonable uh, use of art funds it's estimated at almost fifty thousand dollars so the idea would be inmates in the detention center as they receive medical treatment for COVID or any other uh, whatever they may have going on electronically it would be able to be shared with other hospitals or if they leave us and go to the care of a state prison system the information would go down there too. So and to the individual, that's kind of like my chart. That's correct. Yes. But to the isn't there a designation for that at the like the hospital and doctor level? There's a different term for it. I believe the health yeah. department uses uh, right. Y'all use it. Epic. Epic. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but that's fifty thousand dollars for the software. That is my understanding. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yowza. Yes, I think when the health department made the transfer over to Epic. I don't remember that cost, but it was significant. Again, the value was any health department clinic patient. 
then that data can be electronically transmitted to if they have other doctors elsewhere or if they go further beyond the health department's level of care, they're not carrying a hard copy with them somewhere. It's, it's in this EPIC system. So. Um, we also heard the need for ultraviolet sanitizers in our ambulances. You know, EMS has been, a health department and EMS have been on the front lines of COVID. There's no question about it. Uh, so our, our um, ambulances, we believe, would benefit from spending funding to install these ultraviolet sanitizers that are uh, clean the air and equipment and the people while they're in the back uh, from the COVID virus. It's, we would be two, uh, two spend expenditures of $65,000 a piece. That's our estimates. You put these things in, they're good for, I believe, three to five years. So we would plan for another replacement in our ambulances at the end of a three-year period, total $130,000. And then the commissioners could consider in the immediate future uh, funding for three new physicians. One, a communicable disease nurse. This was... Uh, something that uh, Tony has indicated is was important before COVID, but really came to the forefront there as COVID has developed. And as they are continuing to deal with vaccinations and the uh, um, uh, variants that we see, believe that uh, the, co the communicable disease nurse would be helpful. $213,000 is a three year estimate uh, of salary and benefit costs for the disease nurse. We also have included here taking the part-time after hour social worker uh, from part-time to full-time for three years. Uh, the funding would be $64,206. That's the salary and benefits. Uh, this person works with um, Child Protective Service and other functions at DSS that have been particularly hit. That's another group that, you know, social workers had to go into homes with COVID. It didn't matter if COVID's in the house or not. If there's a Child Protective Service call or an Adult Protective Service call, they had to suit up and go into those homes and investigate those calls. And it has been hard on our social workers, as you'll hear a little bit later, but uh, particularly on the on-call piece, it would be uh, to everyone's benefit if, if, that, if this position could be made full-time. And the final position the commissioners could consider, we feel like these three are all uh, eligible under ARP and state guidelines at this time, would be a grant administrator. I know Chair Paisley has mentioned this several times. Well, we've estimated uh, $236,000 for three years. We've tried to tie the three years of these costs to the three years of available ARP funding. It is true that with, uh, uh, particularly with the positions, at the end of three years, we'd have to make some decisions. Do we want to continue to fund these? If so, it may be county dollars that would kick in to fund these positions. I will say with the grant administrator, um, you saw the different pools and pots of money. If the commissioners are interested in county government pursuing uh, additional federal ARP funds or possibly other, other type of funds too for initiatives that the board's interested in or our community voice is important, this would be helpful. I think uh, uh, some folks here would can speak to the difficulty of federal grants. They are tough to do. It's a whole process just to apply. Then if you are awarded, it is a process of working those federal grants and staying in contact with them. I think Susan has worked uh, some of those before and just having one grant with the federal government is a time-consuming uh, task. We feel like there will be lots of opportunities. I did have the opportunity, I will tell the board, to attend a fire chief's meeting several weeks ago and uh, you, you probably saw on one of those bullets that there are funding specifically available for firefighter assistance mm -hmm. and emergency management and uh, we talked a little bit with the chiefs and they were very excited about the possibility of there being someone. You know, most of our volunteer fire departments have maybe one or two paid staff, not not really uh, suitable for applying for these grants. I think there would be a lot of support from volunteer fire, probably municipal fire departments too, in, uh, in us partnering if we do this position. So, Mr. County Manager there, uh, just for the rest of this board, this will give us three years with a grant administrator. Uh, if she earns the dollars, great. Makes the salary really easy. If he or she does not, then we don't have to continue it. So, so that would be uh, a contract position then instead of a... Not, not I think we could, it could be salaried or contract. It could be a county employee position, Sherry, uh, if, in, if at the end of the term, if the county or commissioners didn't feel like it was a productive position, you know, uh, then we would be able to let that person go. And again, that, that's something to consider, is that particularly with the positions, these are three years, and we're talking about ARP funding paying all of these costs, uh, but for the positions in particular, at the end of three years, it would be an evaluation of is this 
something that you want to continue to do? And if so, it would have to fall into the county's budget. Well, this would require a budget amendment, right? Yes, I think spend actually spending any of these dollars uh, would require, we have all the funds budgeted now in a special revenue fund, all the, the 16 million that we have received thus far. So if the commissioner said that you wanted to go ahead and do the uh, health software for the detention center, for example, we would do a budget amendment in that dollar amount to put the funding from our special revenue fund, our dollars, into detention sal uh, detention's budget. So they could purchase, am I saying that right? Or maybe I met, Susan's <laughs> looking at me, I'm not saying that right, so. It would allow us to expend within yeah. the, the funds. So you can track it all in one place. In one place I apologize, yes. commissioners, yes. It would be much easier to be able to track all of these ARP expenditures in one place. So we would spend it out of the special revenue fund. So the enormous strain on the top two agencies and DSS, that could go out like ASS, ASP. Whatever it is. <laughs> well, probably that too. Um, I'm talking like, can this be like now or does this have to wait for months? I'm just curious because I know the top two DSS, all of these have took a tremendous, like the grant administrator is not even real yet, but like all these people have took a tremendous hit because of this virus. I mean, like none of us even have a clue because none of the stuff they deal with has stopped. And now we're seeing just how much we're going to see what it really happened whenever you start collecting your stats and data, like, you know, DSS's reports tripled in April from last year. So I'm just curious, how long does this have to wait? What's me, the deal on the time Let me answer stand? that question. I'm going to make a motion now before we go on with the second part of uh, Mr. Haygood's presentation. I'm making a motion that we go ahead and fund now the immediate funding considerations to the tune of $1,025,764. And I make that as a motion that we approve that now. And I'll second it. Thank you, John. And that is appropriate if the board wants to do that, absolutely. Any other discussion? Yes, sir. Um, question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Haygood and maybe uh, Mr. Judge the communicable disease nurse, I understand that the health department does have its own COVID funding. Could that cover the communicable disease nurse? How is that funding that they're receiving, you know, how does that fit in and does it need to go through the county? Yeah, so our funding for that um, comes through the <coughs> agreement. And to answer your question directly, we could um, do that, but it's also used for the communicable disease response. So case in point, for example, testing went away so we currently the state currently pays a private provider to do testing for us here um, for the health department for us here in the county if all of a sudden that <coughs> testing went away the health department would now own the majority of that testing and we would likely have to contract with another private, private provider we could there would be no way we'd be able to take that on and that has a pretty significant cost to it, and I, I can't remember from the top of my head but it's up there close to a million dollars give or take just do a testing for one year um, for it to occur. So yes, we do have $1.8 million that we were given through our contracts from the state, um, but they're very specific of what we can use it for, can use it for communicable disease position, but it also we want to be half that money in case in the future something goes south and we have to readapt our operations. <laughs> that would be Sorry. better. <laughs> uh, we got to this thing up. <laughs> County Manager, would you recommend, we're talking about um, in salary for that particular position, $70,000 uh, per year for three years. Would you recommend we pull that or leave it? I, I would I would suggest you go ahead and pay for it from the county's ARP funds. I think uh, we, we have some concerns about what the state and feds have been paying for with health. They've been, they've been covering, as Tony said, the cost of vaccines, the vaccination effort, the testing. We have heard through some uh, uh, webinars that Mimi and Andrea have attended that the federal government may stop that. They may reallocate those funds from what they're spending locally to do other things with. If they do, that will fall to us to fund. I think Tony's funding that he has in, in contract and his addendums would be more appropriate to use for vaccines <clears throat> and those testing costs. It may not happen, and we hope it doesn't happen. And if it doesn't happen, it may be that we're able to use some of his contract dollars to do some other things. But this. This communicable disease nurse, I think, out of these three positions is probably the priority position here, uh, just because of what they're, they're still 
living the COVID uh, world right now, and I think this would help them significantly. So. We could do a memorandum of agreement to be reimbursed from health department funds if he gets a significant chunk of health department funds back to the county for that position, right? I, I believe so. I think once we know if the uh, if the feds are going to continue to commit to covering the vaccination and testing costs, we know that for sure. It could be that we we make this switch from. Uh, you have a comment on that, Andrew? Well, I was just going to add to that. What we found in handling the CARES Act funding is that what we thought we needed to spend money on often changed later. We found two months down the road that there's another funding source that would be a better option. Right. And we were able to manipulate within that six month time period uh, to make a lot of changes. And there were quite a few changes that happened over just that, that short time period. I think we'll probably experience that with art funding. So anything that the board approves at this point, if you're budgeting art funding for it, if we find a better funding source yes. for it, we would bring that back and ask for an amendment to use these funds right. differently in future. As we will do in your phase two coming up. Yes, that's correct. So if we, at, that's a great point. If we find a better way to pay for the communicable disease nurse, we would tap that and then return these funds to our art, our art bucket. A lot of pluses and minuses of that. Any other comments on this particular motion that's on, on the table? Mr. Chairman, my, my only other comment is that we, we talked earlier about about focusing ARPA funds on on things that will that are investments that have a lasting impact, rather than things that have reoccurring costs, which which these items well most of these items would outside of three years if we chose to continue them. So I I, I just want to be I just want to be cautious that you know, this these are for three years. These are out of ARPA funds. And I think the board at the end of that period will have to reassess whether we want to keep these positions uh, and whether we fund those out of county dollars or not. Um, so that, that's that's my only concern with it. But I understand these are these are needs, and I, I don't want to I don't want to start allocating too many of these ARPA funds before we have a real sense of what the county needs are. But I recognize that these are these are significant needs. So with with those reservations, I'd support. And I think the mechanism of tracking these costs through. The special revenue fund where they're all in one place will ensure that we're able to come back to the commissioners in three years and say we've been tracking the salary for the communicable disease nurse through the special revenue fund for the past three years it's now time to make a decision it, do we want to continue to have that right. position then it would be to tony to you know to tell us the benefits of having or not having the position so, and the board to agree well, well, I can I assure you that family b services and crossroads would not even be on this list if their grants hadn't have been hacked and uh, i mean chopped and uh, but I can also assure you that what they do has not stopped nor slowed down. If anything, it's increased, and they showed up every day when someone's child was harmed or someone's mom was harmed. So, uh, for us to be able to fill in for those because they serve the citizens of this county, I think we should step it up because um, they've always been there, and uh, hopefully, their funding will be increased and be back to what they're used to. And I promise you, they know this is a one time deal. So. I think it is timely. Uh, the conversations I've had with Adrian have been that when the kids come back, the kids have been out of school for so long, and I think groups like DSS, Crossroads, perhaps even Family View Services receive so much input about needs from the schools that you know those kids are about to come back, and I think you're going to see a significant uptick in um, in reports to DSS, need for Crossroads, and also for Family View Services. So. To make these allocations now is timely, and uh, we hope to be able to get these funds in place for them uh, as soon as possible. That's just more discussion. I call the question. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. So Mr. Haygood, it is now 1231, approaching 1232. Uh, I think we need to take a lunch break and come back at 2 o'clock. Would that be? Your recommendation? I, I'm at the pleasure of the board, so I, I can continue. Why are you hungry? <laughs> I'm hungry, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll do whatever the commissioners would like, of course. Of course. And any guests we have, we really Agreed. appreciate your patience. Absolutely. What time he has in this presentation? Uh, there's, I think, maybe. Phase uh, two would take how long, do you think? I think the next slide will probably be pretty quick because I, I don't know. Uh, I can quickly explain it to you. It's the key piece of this, um, if you'd like. If let's, you'd like. let's continue on okay, for this phase two and then get a lot. So, so um, I mentioned this reimbursement piece in that uh, 
the legislation allows us to go back to March of 21, this past March, and reimburse ourselves for costs that the county incurred in response to COVID between March and June of 21. We've looked at one-time costs and also payroll that is eligible through ARP uh, for that period. Uh, these one-time costs or the payroll was originally paid by general fund revenues as part of our budget, or we did use pandemic response. And pandemic response funds are uh, CRF monies that came from the state that we spent on eligible purposes, but reallocated uh, because NC Pro basically became so restrictive on what they would allow the county to spend. Their final recommendation was spend these monies on eligible purposes and then bank your own dollars, which is basically what I'm about to explain to you uh, that you could do if you wanted to. So you could take, uh, I'm, I'm suggesting to you, you may want to consider uh, using ARC funds as reimbursement, and then you could take these funds and designate them any or not but you could designate them for any use that you want. So from March to June of 21, we found $240,000 worth of one-time costs, sanitizing, PPE, some call center staff payments that we made that are ARP eligible. Uh, we also looked at payroll for the health department and EMS because we know the health department and EMS were just all about some COVID response and having to continue to respond to COVID-related problems. That payroll is $3 million. So what the board could consider to do under the support public health category of ARC is spend $3,240,000 of ARC funding by covering those costs, but basically reimburse the county. Then you could, if you wanted to, take those three, that $3.2 million and designate it for ARC uses, but without the ARC restrictions. It basically becomes county dollars, right? You don't have to designate it. You could put it in unassigned fund balance if you wanted to, or you could once you spend the ARP money and do this reimbursement, you could spend the 3.2 on anything or put it in the bank. It's totally up to you. Again, if you want to use it for ARP related efforts, this, the good thing I would tell you would be, it would be out from under ARP legislation. You could use it on anything that the state would allow us to use it for. So we come out from under the federal, uh, the federal restrictions and it just falls to our normal state, state uh, restrictions. How does that affect our budget for 21-22 so what we would have to it, it would affect 2021's budget uh, and so what what we would need to do if the board wants to do this or is interested in doing this we would need to contact our auditor right so uh, we would want to talk to them and the LGC because we feel like our uh, preliminary discussions with the county's auditor have been they have received no guidance on how to audit this we can do it it is eligible under ARC guidance it's okay with the state but the audits auditors have not been provided with guidance on how to audit it, it could make our audit late with the LGC for last fiscal year. That's not a tremendously big deal to our operations, but we want to stay in good standing with the LGC. So if the commissioners are interested in this at all, I think we would want to uh, hear that today and then reach out to the LGC and say, how, how are you going to feel if the commissioners want to do this? Uh, and wound up reimbursing ourselves, designating the money, are you going to be upset with us if our audit is late? Because it probably will make our audit late if we do that. Well, does this include the expense for uh, Eric Lane? Uh, no, the expenses for Eric Lane, I think we booked to FEMA uh, because it was vaccination um, clinic costs and actual vaccination costs. So, so we will reimburse from that through FEMA? We have we are working on that. So we have we've been running all costs to FEMA. Some I think we may have gotten some reimbursements from FEMA, but uh, I'm seeing head shaking no. But these funds are ones that were spent on payroll for health and EMS. So the employees that work in health and the employees that work in EMS, under ARP guidelines, we can reimburse ourselves for their salaries. But right? they're just regular budgeted salaries because they were working on primarily COVID-related issues. Was there any risk we won't get reimbursed? on that from FEMA? There is? For the, uh, mm -hmm. for the Air help, Lane uh, for Air Lane, I guess it's possible. I think we feel like it's pretty solid. Right. We feel like it's pretty solid to receive that reimbursement. Um, but anytime you question FEMA, if something is allowable, your response is always pending final review. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so we will submit those costs and then wait for their final review and receive reimbursement. What was the final expense on that? Do we know right off? Oh, costs are still ongoing, and I don't have that figure with me right now. So, one, this would be a, if you wanted to do this, if the commissioners wanted to do this, the benefit could be you could 
bank this money, this 3.2 million, out from under the ARC pile of 16 million. It would have to be uh, separated from the ARC funding. You could use it for any purpose. It doesn't have to be for ARC purposes. You could bank it uh, for a time to see, to make sure our FEMA reimbursement costs are going to be honored. Uh, Andrew, you had an idea? I just wanted to mention that there's, there's uh, a possible reward and there's possible risk involved in this. And part of this is related to the fact that we're operating under interim guidance. So under interim guidance, this appears to be an option to us. But the local government commission and the U.S. Treasury will be able to tell us better if this is something that is likely to be um, uh, fall under the final guidance. So we may so, take action or, or think about taking action at this point and may find out later that it has to be reversed. I think the important thing I wanted to communicate to the board today was, you know, we've talked about committee, not a committee. If, if the commissioners were going to go to a committee and start our committee thinking about how to spend $32 million, if the commissioners are interested in doing this, uh, we need to check with our auditors. You don't have to vote to do it today. We need to hear, is this something you're interested in us doing? If so, we, we will be calling our LGC and the auditors to find out, are they okay if it makes our audit late? The other piece to me would be, if you're going to go committee or not, it may mean this $3.2 million is off the table from ARP spending purposes if a committee is trying to figure out what to do with ARP money. You might put it back on the table and say, we're going to take this money, reimburse ourselves, and put it right back in the mix. But the commissioners also have the ability, if we do this, uh, to put it anywhere you want to. It could go in you know, our unassigned fund balance if you chose to do that. I'm, I want to be transparent with the commissioners that you don't have to spend it on ARP if you do it this way. You will be spending it on ARP. You'll be spending it in an eligible way to reimburse ourselves. Um, but I think the main thing we need to know today is not a vote to actually do this, but if you're interested in this, we need to call the auditors and see. But we could do it subject to those two items, could we not, the audit and? I do think there is one other piece that it need, would need to be done at least at the August 16th meeting because it has bearing on our last fiscal year budget. So if you are not prepared to vote to do this today with any any criteria about the item and you want us to call the LGC first and report back before the 16th, in order for this to be applied to next fiscal year, my understanding is it would be best if it was uh, action was taken to make this happen uh, either now or at the August 16th meeting. Well, I think it's a good idea for us to look at reimbursing ourselves. We had a lot of extraordinary expenses due to due to COVID, and to just look just to, just to overlook getting money back in our budget, back into the county for our citizens. Um, I just don't think that would be the right thing. I think we need to look at taking this money, put it back in, and then figure out how we want to spend it. Um, I'll make a motion to reimburse I'll ourselves, uh, considering that we, uh, the audit process and the other other things that we have to make sure are okay. I'm fine. I'll make a motion. I'll second it. Excellent. Any other discussion? Uh, just a question. Is, it, uh, is the motion that we, that we determine if it's auditable or that we do it now and then I, I'm, I'm just subject to an audit it. subject to the I'm, audit written information I'm good with time what kind of time frame are you talking about just no no correct. I just want to make sure that it's it's correct well under the guidance right and then under the uh, under the audit principles mm -hmm. so too. so what we're hearing is uh, the, the board would be moving to reimburse ourselves with art funding subject to the guidance from our auditor um, but to, to do that, and then we would uh, designate those funds at least because uh, it's going to come out of the special revenue fund. We would designate them, and then the board can determine the purpose for those designated funds at any time, whether it's ARP use or anything else. But we would reimburse ourselves and then designate those funds. Or we could just hold them until a future use. And we could put them in unassigned fund but it, Whatever we do, it would be, <laughs> we would have to have a budget amendment in our next meeting to approve this, I presume, right? That's going in your checkbook. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go shop. <laughs> Mr. Eagle, when is the final guidance expected? I think we're looking at uh, in the next possibly month, we six to eight weeks. I think you said like October, late September, October, or something like that earlier. We hope for September. We don't know. For whatever reason, guidance would discourage this. We would just reverse it. That's correct. Mm -hmm. As long as you're not spending it immediately. Right. 
then if we were to find out that this was not in compliance, we put it back into the, uh, we come back to the board, explain that, ask you to vote to put it back into the special revenue fund. Any other comments? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank it you. is now lunchtime. Yes. <laughs> yes. We'll re uh, return at 2 o'clock. We're back in session. Well, thank you, commissioners. I think we had uh, maybe uh, only had two more slides, I believe, left on this section. And Scott, I think you're going to have to you have to advance me. Right now. Okay. Yep, there we go. Uh, so for premium pay, that was one of the options you heard uh, Andrea mention. Also, uh, well, while the state regulations don't allow us to expand that out to uh, private businesses. Uh, premium pay for county employees or uh, other groups uh, that are kind of under county type umbrella. I could foresee uh, uh, maybe I think uh, one of the commissioners had mentioned teachers have been considered in one locale. Uh, maybe some of our authority uh, employees, something along those lines. Um, what we would suggest to the commissioners if we decide to look at a premium pay plan um, we want to make sure that folks were eligible for ARP. You heard that uh, to use ARP funds to, for premium pay, you can't telework, and there's some other restrictions. Um, and we would suggest that the commissioners might want to think uh, retroactively and make that a bonus as opposed to, uh, and you don't have to do this way, this is just a, a thought, trying to avoid it becoming something that uh, is funded beyond the terms of uh, how long we have the dollars. Yes, sir. Quick question. Can we use the ARP funds, for example, we have frontline workers, law enforcement, uh, EMS, health department, sorry, um, various frontline workers. Can we, if they were to come down with COVID, can we use frontline or that money to reimburse that the department for their time out if they're out beyond their normal sick leave or to re uh, reimburse them for the sick leave? So you could, I think we were, we had originally uh, put an item on this agenda or thought about an item for this agenda because of the uptick we're seeing in COVID cases. We're also seeing COVID in uh, several county departments to reinstate the COVID sick leave where the employee is not charged for sick leave if they're tested uh, right. positive for COVID or they're waiting uh, results of a test or they've been quarantined. So. Uh, we took that item off and delayed it till next time because I think there needs to be some more discussion right. around county departments about it. But yes, it's possible that uh, ARC funds could be used for that or your pandemic response funding. I think that's what we were thinking we could use uh, was the pandemic funds that we banked from CRF. Um, and as I put here too, it's something for the board to consider. Uh, you know, you, other non-county eligible agencies we believe could include our fire districts or some of our authorities. So if uh, the board wanted to do some kind of premium pay, I would just suggest to the commissioners, you may want to think about if you do that, a bonus uh, as opposed to uh, an actual pay increase that you may be dealing with later on. But it, right. the board can do either. Very well. I think if there's not any questions, I know we kind of hit that in two pieces around lunch, but if <laughs> there's any other questions about the funding, the immediate funding concerns, I think uh, we'll be reaching out to our auditors and the LGC to get input about the reimbursement model that uh, that you've, you've blessed here today and make sure that the LGC is not going to have some issue with our audit being late. But I think this probably will be a common problem around the state because I wouldn't be surprised if many other jurisdictions choose to do that too. So. Now, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to move right into the next item. Yes, sir. Thank uh, you. So we had, the commissioners have talked some about the possibility of forming a committee to help think about what to do with these ARC funds. This is not a requirement. The legislation doesn't require that a committee, either at the state or federal level, but uh, it's been discussed at commissioner meetings about the possibility of forming an ARC committee. Um, you know, if, if the board wanted to do that, I'd suggest to you that the committee would be, it'd be really important that they identify priorities that the board agrees with also and part of their uh, function would be to invite and uh, take community and stakeholder participation and input. And if, if the board were to do a committee, you could expect that part of the committee's responsibilities would also be to communicate um, the art plan that they come up with, the priorities, uh, and recommendations for spending to the commissioners. And it's something, something to think about just to try to uh, keep a group on task, right, if you do a committee, maybe to think about a deadline to have 
some level of spending recommendations, maybe by January of this uh, of 22, just to keep things moving. Uh, and it also around that time would start dovetailing into our normal budget process, right? right. So, um, if if uh, if the commissioners were going to do a committee or not, if the commissioners do a committee or they do not, I would I would suggest that these priorities are co good to consider. These are examples. Uh, this is a very board-driven process, and, and, and from staff's perspective, so when we put some of these priorities to you, we're taking things we're seeing from the state of North Carolina or from other jurisdictions and saying, here are ones that seem to resonate with us as staff. Do they resonate with commissioners or not? If you had a committee, I would suggest that some of these type of priorities for spending, what will happen at the end as we're being audited and having to justify the expenditures is we'll want to have some overarching guide from the commissioners that says, we would like to see ARC funds uh, spent to support workforce and small business. So when we, if we do that, right, if, you know, one option could be you may want to put some of these funds in the small business loan program, right? It's, it's been successful. When we go to uh, meet with our auditors and justify the expenditure of funds, we would point back to that core tenant and say, the commissioners were interested in workforce development and small business support with these funds. Thus, uh, this expenditure fit within one of our own criteria. These are not ones that you would have to do, but just suggestions. Some other things to think about if you, um, again, committee or no committee, but particularly if there's a committee, we're being urged by the LGC to take our time, as we've talked about a little bit earlier, especially for larger projects, this, the transformative type work, to see what the state uh, is going to do, and also to get that final guidance from the uh, federal government. And uh, as Andrea showed you, we have created a website uh, online for people to be able to go to and give feedback to, to the county government or ask questions about uh, our art plans. There are also products out there. There's a, a balancing act, I believe, is a software that some of uh, some other, I think, some of the other local governments around the state are using. It's specific for public outreach. If the commissioners wanted to do that, um, I would suggest for if a, if a committee was going to be formed, it would be very helpful to that group to have county staff at least liaison to the committee. So um, I would suggest Andrea and, and Mimi be involved in their discussions just to help keep everybody on the same page from an eligibility standpoint. I'd be happy to meet with them too, not to force an agenda, but just to try to help answer questions and keep, keep things flowing if, if we go that route. And the final consideration, uh, I believe, for a committee is, you know, if the committee or the commissioners too were to come back and say, we do want to um, get into water sewer projects, some of those very specialized type projects might take uh, bringing in outside help to, come, to contract with. We don't generally do water and sewer, for example, so we wouldn't have county staff to put on managing a water sewer project. It would need to bring, uh, bring in someone else. And as you think about a committee, if that's something that you are interested in, obviously you would want to have a presence of the commissioners anywhere from one to five. If you go with five, then or three or more, we'll notice it just like we do any other uh, uh, meetings where there are three or more commissioners. Um, and the commissioners could uh, appoint individuals to serve on the committee if you choose. And we usually do that by uh, either you each appoint someone or you go through an application process like we do for planning for it, where we actually put out an application and solicit and bring all that back to you. So, um, I think that's the end of the committee discussion. Do understand that it's not required. And it isn't something that you necessarily have to do today, but I know the board has mentioned it and talked about it. Seemed to be an interest in it, so I wanted to present you some info because we're starting to move into uh, spending these funds or at least planning to spend these funds. Well, one of the uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier too is we have a number of local partners in the other communities that are going to receive funding, and if there's some way for us to work together, I know you you. One of the projects we talked about was water and sewer to the uh, Public Safety Training Center. Mm. That's going to be an issue. Water and sewer to other entities. We can't do, according to ARP, we can't do water and sewer unless we're already doing it, from what I've read. So if we can't do it unless we're already doing it, then piggybacking with Haw River or whoever might provide water and sewer to that facility uh, and helping them finance it for them, because it may be outside of the capacity that they have, would be something we might want to look at and then there are other other activities going on in the county where we can partner with burlington or mebbin or graham or whatever on uh, on other projects as well so i think it'd be a good idea for us to include have some sort of partner meetings with 
you know, either you and the other uh, town managers and whatnot in, uh, as a group to, to bring us up to date into what's that or include the some of the commissioners in something. I, I would uh, say I, I agree, Mr. Carter, if the board does a committee or not, it would be wise to, on a regular basis, reach out to some of our other partners, particularly the municipalities, and, and at least have dialogue so people can, if they do nothing other than report what they've got going on <laughs> and what they're considering, then obviously commissioners could be there, city council could take part in that too, management, right. uh, and it, as I say, it may be valuable just to hear on a regular basis, what are you thinking you're going to do with your art funds, does it cross, because we have we have more conversation with some of our municipalities, Burlington, Gray, Mebane, than we might with Alamance or Ossipee or right. even Hall River. So it's, it would be uh, beneficial, I think, to at the, at the minimum have those type of meetings. We all need another meeting in our schedule each month. <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> Mr. Turner, you had ideas? Uh, I do. I, I think I think forming a committee is a good idea. Um, we're set to receive about thirty-three million dollars in funding that I, I see as like a large grant that the county hasn't had access to before and probably won't have access to in the near future. Uh, I think a committee makes sense for a couple of reasons. Uh, I think you can get citizens who are interested in this process and are interested in, in providing input to the county on how to spend such a large amount of money in a way that benefits the entire county. Um, I think a group of citizens that represents a cross-section of Alamance County could provide ideas that we as commissioners couldn't come up with ourselves, that staff couldn't come up with itself. Um, and I think those ideas could be both large ideas that are transformational, like the Division Center, like broadband, uh, and they could be also small, small outlays of money that could impact individual communities all over the county. Almost like a microcredit kind of idea. Um, I, I, think you, I think if you have a group of citizens involved, you can get those robust ideas that we might not otherwise have. I also think that because it's sort of like a grant process, I think that the process that the United Way has and how it how it gives out its grant money might be instructive to us um, where folks who have ideas about projects, folks who are looking for funding for particular projects can come present those ideas. It could be a music municipality mm -hmm. who says, I've got this great idea for water sewer, I need some help. That's an example. Uh, and it could be like a, a one source of accumulating all the different ideas for the county uh, in one place so that we everybody knows what everybody else is doing. So I, I would see it, it would be beneficial to have both, both citizens and a, perhaps a group of, of entities who have given out or who distribute funding in the past based on projects that they've seen before. I think some kind of hybrid would work. Maybe commissioners. I don't know that we have to have commissioners, but but you know maybe commissioners on that as well. We got to be careful not to make it too big if we do it. Um, but but I, I do think that that those are some considerations that I think would a, a committee would benefit us, and they could do a deep dive into these potential projects that the commissioners just couldn't do unless we had another you know another series of in-depth meetings for the commission. Ms. Thompson. Well, I know whenever we had our budgetary hearings, your dad told you it'd be the worst two days of your life. It was extremely overwhelming, but it was also extremely important to me to hear from everybody that was part of our budget. Um, I think anybody that is going to be interested in these funds need our audience. I think they need to speak directly to us. That's why we were elected. And when it comes right down to it, we make the decisions. I totally respect what uh, Mr. Turner is saying. I don't like it when it gets complicated and so many people get involved in this. It can really be distracting, and but it can also be very positive. I know how that works. But I think anybody that's going to be applying for this in the grant fashion, so to speak, as Craig said, I think we need to hear them. They need to, we need to hear them directly because nobody knows their agency or their business or anything like that better than they do. Nobody can speak for them better than they can. And I respect that because um, I, just, I just don't like it's, uh, the more you get sometimes the more opinions you're going to get. And that's good too. We need to hear all the opinions. But if somebody is applying for money to save their save them or to get them back on track or to start them and launch them and, and we're going to be signing that I think we need to hear that because nobody speaks for them better than they speak for themselves and I don't want to hear about their company through the eyes and ears of somebody else 
I just don't. And I mean, that's just my opinion. And I think all of these opinions are going to be somewhere in the middle. We'll find a healthy balance. But if you're coming to this commission board who we were elected to govern this county, I really think we need to be hands on with this. That's what we signed up for and speak for myself, nobody else. But I want to hear somebody tell me why this is important for them and how this can really make a difference in what they do for a living and what they do for this county. And I respect all these folks that have been in some real dire straits. So I want to advocate for them personally. And um, like I said, nobody speaks for you better than you speak for yourself. Mr. Lash. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm going to, um, I, I, I like what Mr. Turner said. I think the only thing that I would like, I think that would give, I like the idea of coming to the county, having different stakeholders coming to us. I like the, I like, I like the ideas I just heard. The only thing that I think could be a hindrance to this committee is the size. Uh, the size could make it overwhelmingly difficult. And I think that's if we just focus on getting the number just doable, it's manageable. Because we all know, I mean, look at our look at our our, our legal system. They have twelve. Our uh, our um, I'm drawing a blank here. <laughs> hey, I, that's supposed to be me, well, not you. I know. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm 20 years ahead of you, Steve. <laughs> right. We know our jury system and everything else is is set up with a, a, a manageable, and that's that's my only thing here. I think that it, if we get that that size too big, it could be a, a hindrance rather than a help. Uh, but I like what I've heard today. I like that a lot. And that's part of a real tough balancing act. Too. It sure is. I mean. If you make it too small, if you come up with a committee and you make it too small, mm -hmm. you can get criticized because you left somebody out. Yeah. You make it too big, it becomes unwieldy, but you've got a lot more people involved in it. So you're, yeah, it's a tough one. Yeah, it's a, a really, 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 really tough balancing act. Yeah. We've got this art money. We don't have all the guidelines yet. Uh, we may not have until even October mm -hmm. of this year. Uh, that's point one. Two, the infrastructure bill that the United States Congress is talking about, both on a House and Senate basis, we have no clue whether we're talking about a half a billion dollars, or three and a half trillion, or five or six trillion dollars. I mean, that's, it's just a shot in the dark at this point. And we'll know more about that within the next few weeks. Uh, and I hope that, th that that's not done to our federal and state and each of us as taxpayers. Um, I really truly hope that, but we don't know at this point. Um, third thing is we have time. We don't have to make a decision today. Um, and we've got time to think about it when we have a lot more rules, regulations, guidance, whatever. Um, the fourth is other funding from, and as Mr. Turner said, uh, municipalities from other agencies we're talking we just hired a grant or getting ready to hire uh, a grant writer and so all that's unknown at this point but information that we truly need and then the last thing is the size of the committee uh, gentlemen you both mentioned <clears throat> the size of the committee uh, I totally agree if that committee gets so large Ms. Thompson, you, you indicated that it would be totally worthless at that point. Um, I would encourage us to table this matter until our meeting, with next meeting is the 19th, is that correct? And so then that would give 16, us 16. as county commissioners time to meet Mr. Haygood with you individually, give you our ideas and so forth, um, and maybe put together a, a better defined proposal for a committee at that point. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, do you agree? Yes, yes, Mr. All right, so we're gonna table this at this point and I really would encourage everyone to get with Mr. Haygood, um, Adrian, uh, all the players here, um, and let's put something together more concrete for the 19th. 16th. 16, whatever date it is. Two weeks from today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. okay. And I would just suggest, Mr. Chairman, that if, if we do that, if we do go ahead with the committee in some form, that those meetings could be public. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and broadcast, just, just like 
just like this meeting is, so that there would be time for the for the commissioners to see everything that happened, even if the commissioners weren't there. Oh, Indeed, and yeah. uh, any any recommendation from the committee for its final approval and for funding to be spent is going to come back to this body. So, uh, but yes, we would make sure that those meetings were advertised and people could tune in and watch them if we can figure out. A, we'll try to figure out a way to do them live stream, but at least they would know location and date. Indeed. Well, thank you. No, like getting with Mr. Haygood and Andrea and so forth was not trying to, it was just simply give him our ideas. Oh, no, yeah, right, point. right. No, I, I didn't mean to suggest yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Madam Clerk. Who is not here. Uh, not here. Tori, Tori had an appointment, but she gave me the uh, information about the next item, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have sat down so, so quickly. <laughs> I believe the Get your uh, up and down exercise for today. <laughs> yes. uh, your next item is the consideration of an appointee to the Mevin Planning Board as the ETJ member uh, representing the county on the Mevin's, uh, Mevin's Planning Board. So uh, the city of Mevin solicited applications uh, for this position and uh, received applications for uh, Mr. Larry Tigg. Mr. Tigg is currently serving on the board of ETJ as the county's member. Also received applications from Mr. Roger James, Jonathan Webster, and Virginia Gale Miller. City Council reviewed all these applications also, and they have recommended reappointing Mr. Larry Tigg. So anytime we have more than one applicant for a seat, we always bring it to the commissioners for a vote. So, And I might indicate that um, in the ETJ, we as the county nominate two uh, people to their board. And so this is one of the two vacancies, uh, the vacancy out of, of the two that we appoint. Yes, sir. I just appreciate the other folks stepping up too. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Oh, absolutely. We typically defer to the, the board itself mm -hmm. when they look at an individual like this, that they would suggest an appointment. We often support that appointment, so. Is that a motion? That's my motion that we <laughs> accept their appointment. So your motion is to, uh, for Mr. Tigg, is that correct? That's correct. All right. Do we have a second? I'll second. All right. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, let, let me explain one thing. Uh -oh. I keep referring to Mr. Johnson as the high sheriff, uh, and that's because we go. honor him. He does such a good job, and he is the ultimate law enforcement in our county. And he kind of looks at me and shakes his head as if I mean something else. <laughs> Terry, thank you. Well, thank you for your comments. Uh, I'm going to start off. I have a young lady that's, that's uh, been with us all day. I'm going to let her go first to set, set, actually set the stage of, of what I'm going to be talking to you, commissioners, uh, about is our drug problem and uh, especially uh, one area. And I, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce Miss Penny Fogerman, who will give you a story that will probably leave you in tears. And it's only one of hundreds that we hear every day and every week at that sheriff's office. And I'm gonna be before you today to see if we can't come together to do something about the problem that's taking over our county. So I'm gonna introduce them. And I do not have slides. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you so much for inviting me. Special thank you to Pam and Terry. Um, this is really hard for me to do this. I do not like public speaking. Um, I'm not shy, but I do not like to get in front of people and speak. So last night I decided to type out what I'm gonna say and read it pretty much so, okay? So um, anyway, I'm gonna share my story of a few nightmares and highlight just some of, some of my experiences in the last 10 years of my life and continue to live at this present moment. And just please keep in mind that many families right here in our county are going through the same familiar nightmares as me and my family and probably worse. And they have been through worse. Um, so anyway, I have knocked on doors and windows all alone in some of the most crime-filled areas in Burlington and rural parts of Alamance. Some in Charlotte and a couple of times in Greensboro, but mostly here in our county. 
I have ridden for hours on our streets that some would consider no place for a lady alone, asking strangers questions with my car window partially down, seeking out my information that I really needed and wanted. I stood on a front porch a couple years back where I had been told not to go without an escort from the police, but I did it anyway. I knew the police in this county would be there in a heartbeat. I admire every one of them, but I had to go alone for several reasons. At this particular house that I went to, I knocked, I knocked again, and then again. I waited for someone to show up while they were staring at me through a curtain, and I am sure I saw a shadow of a pistol, pistol in their hands. I was determined to talk to them. I noticed other people walking in and out of the back side of the house in the back, kind of ignoring me, and then finally someone came to the door while a person inside was yelling, she looks like she just might be at the wrong place. But a young man finally opened the door just enough to put his head out, not showing his hands or his legs. He at first was very agitated that I was there. He started out <coughs> rude. It was a very cold day. I had on a big coat, so I made sure to keep my hands out of my pocket <coughs> so he could see my hands. Then I started talking to him. He finally got a little relaxed and spoke to me and hesitated for a moment, looked down, took a breath, and then he told me some of what I really needed to know. I said, thank you so much, and I hope your family are having a very nice Thanksgiving. And he looked at me very confused and said, um, okay, yes ma'am, you too. No, this was not a smart thing for me to do or a place I needed to be, but I got my answers. I have been in a few of our most dreadful motels in Alamance County, begging the attendants to tell me what I was there wanting to know and which door to knock on, begging to give me information that I knew they could tell me, but they wouldn't. I have delivered food and clothes to some of these drug infested motels on occasion. I have driven through parking lots. I have been inside. I have picked a person up several times behind some of the motels where I have seen with my own eyes probably drug dealing and probably prostitution. But I had no choice. I have probably been on some surveillance videos seen in hallways or sidewalks by doors in mild conversations, yelling matches, maybe an angry push or two and maybe even some hugs and some tears while I was pleading and pleading. On one occasion in the past, while on one of my missions, I got in an argument with, I assume, the owner of one of Alamance infested hotels, motels, and told him I know exactly what's going on here and you're turning your head because I know you want to make your money. He absolutely started yelling at me in a foreign language that I had no idea what he said, but I am sure that I got cussed out. <laughs> I stood there and then I said, well, go ahead and call the police if you wish. I will, if you don't want to, I'll be standing right here. So then he looked a little stunned and he told me right then without looking at a computer, without looking at his book, bookings or calendars, and he told me exactly which door to knock on. Isn't that odd? I am sure the motel where I visited that day had some bizarre events that involved drugs, dealings of drugs and prostitution and no telling what else. My cell phone used to have so many cell phone numbers in it that it was hard to keep track of. I didn't rid of them for a few years because it used to help me with some of my missions. I had to keep the phone numbers for several reasons. I had many conversations with, I am sure, human trafficking pimps, drug dealers, lots of addicts that I didn't know, thieves, perverts, and more, just to get what I wanted, information. I used to, I used to sit and text these numbers for hours of the night when I couldn't sleep. 
People I had no business getting involved with just to get my answers. I have had calls from strangers telling me things to throw me in a panic and found myself actually doing so-called armchair counseling with criminals, addicts, or people that I had no idea who I was speaking with. And I got drawn in for a few moments at a time sometimes because they had information I wanted. And sometimes I felt like they really actually just needed a person to talk to themselves that cared. I at times found myself on my front porch doing things like this on my phone until 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning because I couldn't sleep anyway. An event that took place around four or five years ago, you know, you kind of lose track of time. I was driving into my driveway from work when my cell phone rang and it was a Greensboro policeman asking me if I knew a certain person. And I said, yes, yes. And uh, the police officer actually told me some news that threw me into a very dangerous situation with my own driving to get to the destination where I needed to go in Greensboro. Someone almost died that night and Greensboro police injected Narcan to save that person's life, a precious life. I am not a police officer. I am not a paramedic. I am not a detective. I am not a preacher. I am not a counselor and I'm not a social worker. But I am a very desperate loving mother that chases, searches, or hunts down my daughter at times. My daughter is a heroin addict living in and out of strange houses, dangerous motels, and on the streets. She has been a victim of abuse. She has been used and taken advantage of in many ways that I can't even imagine. It all started around 10 years ago from pain pills and bad boyfriend choices. It escalated for years and kept me, her dad, and my other two daughters in stress and sadness along with anger and heart-wrenching experiences again and again and again, and it hasn't stopped. I've had her on missing persons for two, two times with law enforcement. Only when my missions didn't work when I was trying to find her or hunt her down or look for her in dangerous situations and horrible situations. She herself has been and is still going through this drug addiction disease that has taken over her mind and her body and her sweet spirit, her health. Her relationships with family are in ruin. The evil that has taken over my sweet, beautiful little girl who grew up in ballet, dancing, cheering, happy, competitions, and of course, yes, every Sunday, Sunday school, church, and youth group, and mission trips, all of it. Good grades all up until her high school graduation day. A's, B's, sometimes C's, but you know, she was kind of a free spirit. Didn't care about the A. She would just say, Mama, it's a C. It's not an E. Just be okay with it. <laughs> and I'd laugh and say, okay. So anyway, she's just the average girl that does what girls do. She is my daughter that is sweet, beautiful, and very compassionate. Deep down, she wants to be what she was meant to be at 31 years old. But the drug has possessed her, and she cannot find the way or the strength. But like my daughter has told me before, Mama, it's too hard, and it's just easier to stay higher to get a fix. Mama, I really want to. I want to, but I can't. Mama, you have no idea. I'm glad my daughter tells me these things. And she does share with me at times. She never, ever used to hold back from me. She always shared things. 
And I would always sometimes have to make promises not to tell anyone the people I worked with, the people that I was associated with at work. And I promised and I didn't because we didn't ever know what the consequences could happen. I have watched her sick, vomit, in hospitals and even in my bathtub, me trying to save her myself, trying to detox her because she wouldn't go to the hospital. She'd get violent and get angry. So I have put her in my own bathtub. It doesn't work. I've had to call people to come and help me take her to the hospital if her dad wasn't around to help, but he, he usually was always there. But I had to sometimes keep him at a distance because he's the father of a young woman that is very beautiful and he's very protective. And sometimes he gets very angry, just as I do. And sometimes I would have to do these things alone without even telling him at times. And I know I have heard so many times, it's like a voice that won't go away. Well, Penny, she has to do this herself. Penny, she has to want to get better. Penny, she needs tough love. Penny, you and her father enable. Penny, she's an adult. She has to do it. Penny, stop worrying. Stop chasing her down. Stop it before it gives you a heart attack. Penny, are you praying about it? Have you asked God to protect her? Penny, just give it to God. Well, I have over and over and over. We all pray in my family. Well, she is getting worse. She has had moments of being violent. In the last couple of years, she actually has started to get more violent. Talking out of her head. Family, we've had to call 911 at times. She has threatened. She has threatened herself. She talks out of her head like she's mentally ill. Screams. And we just stand there sometimes frozen and we just don't know what to do. Who knows? Can you imagine her having to live like this? And there are a lot of families like you and I being touched by this drug infested community and everywhere else. I am sure she or anyone else living on drugs really deep down wants a better life I, and cannot seem to get there. They need assistance. They need professional help. My daughter and a lot of others need a tremendous amount of help from our community. Experts, doctors, counselors, judges, attorneys, law enforcement, prosecutors, and of above all, Christ. Amen. None of us can do anything without God's guidance and strength. To be honest, I have grown very weary and sick to my stomach over this horrible drug crisis that affects all of us in this community in some form or fashion. I have been to counseling. I have been to support groups. I pray. Her dad and I and my other two daughters have been grieving and watching a slow death for many years waiting to hear the dreadful news. I'm scared that I'm going to hear my doorbell ring in the middle of the night. My oldest daughter says it's horrible watching your sister die a slow death. And by the way, the second OD event. She was with a guy friend that decided to do some heroin from Greensboro that he had heard about. He sent my daughter to get it in Greensboro all alone. She drove her car because she was desperate to. She wanted it. She drove her car alone to buy heroin from a dealer in Greensboro and decided to go into his bathroom and try it out. The person from Alamance that sent her to this address to get the drugs all by herself and to bring some back for him, shame on him. Shame on him. She OD'd in the dealer's bathroom. And to this day, my daughter still thinks that that drug dealer saved her life. Did the dealer save her life? The irony of this. A hero? Was he just an intelligent dealer? 
And you know, usually dealers do not do the drugs themselves. So, did he save her or did he do this not to get himself in trouble? I try to tell my daughter. He's protecting his own self. Well, he, the drug dealer, put her in her own car and drove her to Moses Cone and pushed her out on the sidewalk at the emergency entrance, entrance and drove away in his car. I mean, in her car, excuse me. He took her car. But he put her license and her cell phone in her pockets before he pushed her out of the car, I guess. But he kept her purse in the car. So when I got the call about the OD, I thought I was going to pass out. I was in food line with a basket full of items so heavy that it was cutting through my arm. And when I got the call and heard about the OD at the moment, I didn't know. Does this mean she's dead? Does this mean that she's dead at the hospital? Am I supposed to go there? Is she going to be alive? What's going on? So I dropped everything in food line. And excuse me, I hate to say this, I urinated all over myself and didn't even realize that I had done it until a few minutes later, I guess. So I rushed out to the car, went to Moses Cone, not knowing if she was dead or alive. And when I went into the lobby, the doctor, I guess they were waiting for me, I guess, for some weird reason. The doctor came out. I didn't wait. He took me back. And he told me she barely made it. We got her back. She is fortunate, very fortunate. She probably would have been gone in another 15 minutes or less if the drug dealer hadn't taken her to the hospital and dumped her out on the sidewalk. And at the moment, you got to think in your mind, I didn't know the events that took place prior to her being in that hospital other than that phone call. So I had no idea about her driving the car to Greensboro by herself at that moment. So I'm standing there in the hospital with her, you know, and I'm all panicky and, you know, nervous. When my daughter finally looks up at me, my daughter that almost died for the second time in her life, looks up at me and said, Ma, where is my car? And I said, what? Your car? And I just stood there again frozen. I didn't know what to say. So we started talking and then I discovered what had happened. She told me what had happened the best she could recall. At that time, I used my anger, my stress, my sadness, my grief, my fear, and my pain. I was going to get her car back. I guess that was supposed to make me feel better for some crazy reason. Her dad was at the beach with my dad trying to help my dad do something. And that is why her dad was not there at this time. I had a friend to take me to where my daughter described where her car might possibly be. My friend and I were in the places of Greensboro, just like some places in Alamance, where you absolutely just do not want to be. We were at a stoplight trying to find the place that she was describing, landmarks, everything, trying to find her car. And I don't know, maybe I was just losing my mind at the moment without street names or anything, no address. And we are at a stoplight talking and saying, just talking and my friend's saying, you're crazy. You need to call the police. Are you crazy? Call the police. I said, no, I'm not calling the police because we don't know who these people are. What if they go after my daughter in the hospital? You just never know about these people, these drug and drug dealers. You know, you just never know. Or who, or who they were associated with in Alamance County. So anyway, we're at the stoplight, and you'll never believe this. Her car goes right down the road 
and turns off in a little in an area well my friend looked at me in fear and knew what I was gonna do follow it they were driving I was in the passenger seat still controlling the situation <laughs> follow it follow it I got my car my daughter's car back without calling the police you see I didn't know anything about this dealer man and did not want them going after my daughter or family. We followed a man driving and a young woman in the passenger seat. The guy driving the car pulled in a driveway, went inside a small house apartment, and the car was in the back. I told my friend to park back and to stay in the car, and if anything looks really odd or starts happening, to please call 911. My friend was speechless, and I'm sure absolutely terrified. The man left the car running, believe it or not. The motor was running, and it was filled with smoke and marijuana. And I go up to the door and open the driver's door. The girl is halfway sleeping, nodding in and out, whatever, high. I got her attention and told her I was there to get my daughter's car. I said, this is my daughter's car and I'm here to pick it up. And she just kept laying there and I said, honey, are you okay? So I go around, open the door and help her out and she falls to the ground, but she's okay. She looks up at me and I'm sure we were being watched. And when she fell to the ground and looked up at me, I asked if there were any items at all that were hers in the car, any items of that guy's in the car, because by golly, I didn't want to drive away with anything in the car that belonged to them. And she said no. So I got in that car and I drove back to Burlington. A few months later, this guy in Greensboro was arrested for drugs, firearms, and trafficking. My daughter probably went back there, maybe, a couple of times within that next few months because she's the one that told me about the guy being put in jail and she was angry at me because she thought that I turned him in and called the police afterwards but I didn't. My daughter blamed me for getting him arrested and was telling me, my daughter, telling me I better watch my back she was angry. You see, when she left the hospital that time, she only stayed in a rehab two days and left. I could have been killed that day. My friend could have been killed that day. Anybody could have died that day. And I should have called the police. I was being very crazy and out of my mind that day, I guess, as several times that I have done in the past. But that's how sick and twisted drugs can make you and a family. The drug is stronger than the person. And yes, she's young and beautiful. And she has had many opportunities to get better. She's had a loving family that wants her to get better. Rehabs, several, six or seven. She has no insurance. And now it is almost impossible to get help. If you don't have thousands and thousands of dollars to send someone to a nice rehab, forget it. They're not going to help you. In the hospitals, last couple of years, she's been over at Alamance. High, out of her mind, escorted there, taken by the police, gets there and is evaluated by a psychiatrist and they let her go. My opinion, no insurance. How could she have been released when she was that crazy and acting just out of her mind and they let her go back out in the streets? And I'm not bashing the hospital, but 
maybe you need more than one psychiatrist opinion within 10 or 15 minutes of an evaluation. There are good places that can help addicts, but you need insurance or lots of money. She has a history of going to rehabs but leaves and has someone to pick her up as soon as she finds someone. Or she gets kicked out. She's been to six or seven rehab centers after long, long hours of paperwork, phone calls. You just, you just wouldn't believe it if you've never done it. It's just, it's horrendous. And then when you can get her in some place, and you leave and you get her settled and you go, oh, thank you, God, maybe this is it. You get a phone call six hours, eight hours later. Uh, Ma'am, we can't keep your daughter here right now because she's not totally detoxed. We're going to have to send her to the hospital. Well, so you know how all that goes. We'll take her back. We'll take her back when she leaves the hospital only if there's a bed left in our rehab center, believe it or not. <laughs> so, she has lost a bed before just because she was sent to the hospital to finish detoxing because she was so sick. So then, she goes back home with me or her dad, wherever, and then back on the streets. So, then the chase is back on for me, trying to find her and make sure she's alive. She is 31 and has never had much happiness in her 20s. She, I am sure, has been taken advantage of in so many ways. And she herself has done things that you can't imagine just to get that high that takes over and possesses her body, her mind, everything. I asked her dad out of respect if he wanted to say anything. He's kind of quiet and shy, but very smart. But I did ask him if he would like for me to say anything today on his behalf. I got a text right back. Quote, I think people don't realize that drug addiction is a disease. It starts as making bad choices with free will but at some point it takes over and you have no control and can't choose to stop without a tremendous amount of help. Most addicts have mental issues going on too, or too also, either from the drugs or issues they had earlier that were pushed down or issues that were never taken care of. Who knows? I think people need to start looking at it as a disease no different than some others that start out with making bad choices that can lead to other diseases and issues. People don't ostracize when they have those kind of issues. There needs to be some compassion and not turn a blind eye. I am sure the large majority of crime is drug related at some level." Unquote. So, my daughter has been in trouble a few times in her early 20s, then in her later 20s, and now at 31. This is the third time. She is over here in jail since July 21st. And I have to tell you, a lot of people cringe if they see me say this. I am so glad she's in jail. I have prayed for something crazy to happen. Not her life. I don't want her life destroyed. But I have prayed and prayed for God to use these situations to put my daughter in that jail. That's awful to say about your own child. But when she's in jail, she detoxes. And I'm hoping and praying that she's getting her mind back together. You see, she goes in these places and she's this big around. And she calls me the other day, Mama, please get me out of here. I'm getting anorexia. 
from being in this jail, <laughs> caged like an animal. I know better than that. Her problems did escalate because she needed help along the way. She couldn't follow through and didn't get help. They have to get that high so they are going to break the law. And they are willing, trust me, they are willing to do anything. And I mean anything. She has kicked me so hard before that it took me to the ground. kicking your mom like that. But I'm a mom. I'll do anything to save my child. I am asking you to please do some research, please, and some readings on drug addiction. First, study drug addiction if you really have never been touched with it in your life. Study it. Familiarize yourselves with the North Carolina Judicial System drug courts. You can go to nccourts.org. I think there are 32 counties in North Carolina that have implemented drug courts. Some call them recovery courts. And from what I have read so far, because I'm still reading and I'm still researching, but what I have read so far, they can be very successful. They can be successful even for the county financially. We can lift these people up and help them. We need the beds at the jail for not the petty little drug addicts, but for the violent offenders that gave my daughter those drugs. So. Anyway, just please read and research. We can try this. We can do this. You can do it. My eyes were open today just coming to this county commissioner's meeting, and I'm so glad that I did because I had no idea. I had no idea what, what kind of stuff that you guys had to do, and I really appreciate you. I appreciate all of you. It's a hard job, but as a community, and you work together as a team with Christ in the middle of it and with everybody, our, our law enforcement. By golly, what would we do without them? The Bible says each one should use whatever gift he or she has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. And the word grace, I hope everybody really truly knows what grace means. Read about that too if you don't if you don't really understand what grace is. First Peter, it says in First Peter, it is in our service that all will see God's grace in action as we demonstrate our faith. Service is the embodiment of Christian love toward others. And I'm not standing here trying to say keep addicts out of jail because by golly, if they commit a crime, they need to be held accountable for that crime. My daughter has been in trouble and we have tried to get her in rehabs that wouldn't even take her because she had a petty pending charge or a little, I mean, some people might call it petty, some people might call it big. But my daughter, when she's my daughter that I raised and she's not on drugs, she's awesome. So it can happen to anyone. And I'm just asking for you to come together and let's do something about our drug crisis, too. Um, and on top of every daggum thing else you got to do. I mean, it's so much. And But I just, um, and hey, I would love to help in some form or fashion if I can. I might have a couple of gifts. 
<laughs> so that's it. Just wanted to share my story and uh, and just understand I'm not the only one. Well, Ms. Fogelman, let me share something if I can. Yes, sir. My daughter's middle name is Grace. I know really? what it means. It <laughs> is. Oh. And thank you so much for what you had to say today. You're very welcome, and thank you so much for having me. Let me see, I understand we have somebody else on the line, Michael Graves, is that correct? Yes. It was supposed to be here and talk. Yes. Uh, let me tell you, that's just one of hundreds of families <clears throat> here. Got him online? Mr. Graves, are you online? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Okay, Chair Paisley, uh, Commissioners, uh, County Manager, Staff, Chair, uh, thank you for this opportunity. I will be brief because I have an appointment that I have to get to. But uh, the ad program started about four years ago, thanks to the Sheriff with a meeting uh, in his office, and I told him that uh, there were a lot of people in the, the jail um, some innocent, some guilty, but they deserve their time to uh, go in front of a judge and tell their story. That sometimes we sit in language in the jail for months, not even getting a visit from their attorney. And I told them, and the sheriff used to tell me, well, you know, Michael, about 80% of the people in that jail is in there indirectly or directly because of drugs. I found that very hard to believe, but he's a friend and I trust him. Um, but uh, he's wrong about that, I think. I think it's up to 85 to 90 percent of uh, people that's in Alabama County Jail are there because of drugs, indirectly or directly. In the four years or more that we have dealt, act has dealt with uh, inmates in the county jail, I've noticed a couple of things. One, our judicial system is broke. It's absolutely broke. But that's about you guys pay grade, ladies and guys pay grade. Nothing you can do about that. But I noticed two other things. One, there are people that's in the county jail that should not be there because of the mental illness. I've been in the healthcare and been employed, uh, self-employed in healthcare for over 22 years, only assisted living in rest homes and group homes. Um, I've seen individuals who, because of whatever reason, go off their meds. I've seen individuals uh, who have family members that are mentally ill that may have an argument. The police has called. The police come there, the person, because they're off their meds or not even diagnosed yet, goes off on the police. The police have no, no uh, alternative but to arrest the individual. Take the individual to jail for a petty charge that probably he would be in there for about maybe 30 days if he was convicted of anything but sometimes sits in there 60, 70 days, I'm 60, six or seven months. Um, the average stay of a, a person in Alabama County Jail is 192 days at $77 per day. Those people should not be incarcerated. They need to be evaluated and they need to be in a place where they can get the medical attention that they need. Housing people that they are they're in the mental ill, I mean that are mentally ill causes several problems. One, if we want to look at it from a standpoint of how much does it cost the county? Seventy-seven dollars a day on the average of 192 days. That's how much it costs every taxpayer in Alamance County. Another thing it's cost me is my staff is trained to deal with mental health issues. My staff, they're trained. It's not an overnight training that you can get. It, it's a, a continuous group of trainings that you go through. I do not believe that the Alamance County Detention uh, officers are trained in those things. And so it can become overwhelming. It can become stressful for them to be dealing with these situations. So what would that do? That would cause you to have a person say, I didn't sign up for this. And then they will leave. Now, again, the county has lost an employee 
but you have to then train another employee to take that position. And all the while, you're dealing with an individual that's mentally ill. And all the while, somebody that may, again, may get a 30 day sentence is in there for 192 days. They are not getting the help they need. So what happens when they leave? They'll be back. And going through the same sad process again. That person never receives the help that they deserve. And as a society, we have failed them. We have failed their families. Number two that I've noticed is that, again, as the sheriff has stated, and as the lady uh, spoke, it really touched my heart because I have worked with hundreds of inmates. I've heard those exact same stories. I have, uh, unfortunately, have family members that were on drugs. In the last two years, my mother had buried two of her children. One who was actively addicted to drugs, and another one who was drug free, drug free for 20 years, but the damage that was done to her while she was out there on drugs took her life in the form of a massive heart attack at the age of 52. You don't know the pain until you have to sit beside your mother at a funeral staring at a casket that contains your sibling but her child and sit beside her after losing a husband and two kids in less than two years. You don't know that pain and you don't want to know that pain. But this is a pain that I think is inflicted not just by the drug dealer. Mr. Sheriff is doing everything he can to get rid of those individuals. But you have to understand you will never wipe drugs out of this county. It is too big of a business. You're going to have to try to limit their customers. And to limit their customers, you're going to need drug programs. You're going to need drug court. Do you know anybody that wants to be a cancer, a cancer patient? You don't know nobody that wants to die of cancer. There's nobody that wants to die from drugs. Nobody wants to die from drug addiction. Those people want help, but they cannot find help because they are stuck in their misery. They're stuck in their addiction. And until we as Christians realize that we are our brother's keeper. It will continue to happen to my family. And please don't get it twisted. It could happen to your family. Drugs is a demon that will transcend all race, all social and economic status. It has. I have met people in the Avalanche County Jail from all walks of family, and I know what type of family I come from. It's not that those parents were bad. I had wonderful parents, wonderful grandparents that kept us in every Baptist church in, 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 in Alamance County. My brothers and my sister was raised like that. But we in this county give her county housing as a drug court. I looked into it, it's very successful. If we save just one family, the lady that spoke, if we could just save her daughter, my brother, my sister back in the 90s. If we could have saved one family from this grief that we experienced, or they experienced, we have done our job. 
I hate to appeal. It seems like everything that we deal with now has to be broken down. If, if it's conservative belief or is it a, a liberal belief, it's sad that we arrived at that. It, maybe we should just be conservative. Is it a Christian belief or is it the right thing to do? But we have got past that in this world. But I will point out again that this will save you the county money. Because if you continue to allow these people to go to jail, come out, still drug addicted, I guarantee you, and unfortunately with the lady that just spoke, if she get her daughter out today, tonight, if she doesn't have the help, she will be at another drug house. committing another crime or crimes somewhere down the road that will come back to the Alabama County Jail. You haven't solved anything. You haven't done anything. And when somebody commits a crime, there's a victim. A citizen of Alabama County is going to be a victim. My brother had many victims where he would steal things from citizens of Alabama County. So you are also protecting the citizens of this county. And so I was impressed upon the committee uh, that foundation is putting together a, a, a program which I talked to Commissioner Carter back in the, in the sheriff knows about. But I would I would impress upon the commissioners to please do some research on the drug, drug court. Please do, do some research on the center that will uh, deal with the mentally ill that's currently at the jail. I think again that it is a thing that we have to do that will satisfy the taxpayers of this county, but it's also something that we can do that will satisfy the Christians in this county. We are our brother's keeper. Our brothers are suffering daily. I see it every day. I hear it in their voices. And, and so much that the lady talked about with insurance, I, my family experience, and I guarantee you, families that we don't know have experienced the same time. So I, I would implore the, 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 the leadership of this county to please investigate uh, the drug court. Uh, please investigate the first center that will deal with the mentally ill. It is worthwhile to put some time into this, to put some money into this, and to help our citizens who right now at this point cannot help themselves. But I will say this in the end, some of those individuals that, are, uh, that I've seen in the past that cannot help themselves now when they got the help that they needed, and, and I'll say this to the lady, there is hope. If they get the help that, they, that, that is needed, my sister was one of those 20 years so. So I, 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 I will tell you, I'm praying for your daughter, and I'm praying for others like your daughter uh, that, that will be a success story like my sister and, and be 20 years clean. But they need help, uh, uh, county commissioners. And I hope that you can sit in your wisdom and your leadership to uh, provide that help and, and work with the sheriff's department to uh, get these people the help that they need. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Okay, I know it's been going long, but let me just say this, folks. What they're saying, what both of them said is absolutely correct. We have got to do something in this county. Drug court and a diversion center. I've heard for three and a half, four years about diversion center, diversion center, and where are we at? Nowhere. I'm probably going to make some people mad, but all that federal money come here can be used to get that diversion center going in this county, and we're working with Judge Brown and the, uh, a group that is looking at the drug courts in this county. There's a whole lot of these young people that could have been saved that is now basically hopeless for them. Uh, I can tell you, I am not a liberal when it comes to drug dealers. I'd want to lock every one of them up, let them stay in a wretched life. And I think we need to do that. But there's those individuals that are drawn into the drug world that are used as prostitutes, human trafficking around the country. And I'll guarantee anybody uh, that you see has been drawn into that 
Uh, they didn't want to do what they did, but they had to. That's the only way they get their neck fixed. And let me tell you something. You are leaders here. I'm a, a leader here. And I can tell you that we have been working. We went to Texas. We've been to, to Buncombe County uh, to look at their systems and stuff. We need that here in Alamance County. Not tomorrow, but today. And I'm telling you, many, ain't many weeks I go by, I don't have five or six in my office with problems with their children, just like this lady right here. And I have to look at her and say, well, right now, I guess the only way she'll get off or he gets off is if he wants to, to get off. We got to provide a system to help these individuals do that. So that brings me to my main presentation here. It's called the Maple Avenue Corridor, Corridor, excuse me, where we're having major problems, as the lady said, with the hotels, with prostitution, uh, with drug dealings, uh, and we'll give you some information on that as we go through this. In 2016, 8.2 million adults had co-occurring mental illness and substance abuse dis use disorders in the past year. They go together, folks. Something has happened in that person's life that, that gets them to turn into subject. Alcohol and drug abuse can make symptoms of mental health issues much worse. When they come in their jail, like she said, some of them come in there on misdemeanor, drug paraphernalia, post a bond, then next thing you know, they get out, they go straight back, get worse and worse, continue to, to, to commit crimes. And like I say, I, you know, I have no uh, sympathy for the drug dealers and the major criminals in this state. Substance abuse may sharply increase sense of mental illness or even trigger new ones. This is one of our problems, and I want you to know myself and uh, my chief deputy uh, met with the chief, uh, acting chief of Burlington and the assistant chief, uh, Eric Kearns, uh, the chief, and Brian Long, the assistant chief, and they too agreed we need to get together and stop what's going on in these hotels. And I can give you some statistics in a minute. But these have been major problem areas for us as far as drug, prostitution, human trafficking, and we want to work with the people running these motels. Now I can tell you now, you probably go in, they ain't gonna show you the register. And if they do, they're gonna show you names that, that people go in and check, they don't even ask for the ID. We're gonna work with the owners of these hotels and with the managers of these hotels to be able to get what we need to, to do our job and clean this corridor up. I can tell you there's options, and I certainly ain't threatening them, but you know, we can work to do a nuisance and abatement on these hotels. Right with just a number of arrests that's been made there. But we're going to try to work with these hotels to try to stop this stuff. And uh, I can give you some statistics right now. On these. This is my brand new quarter hotel. This is just Burlington's statistics. And then I'll give you mine. But if you'll look at the 2021-94 arrest, uh, sexual offense 6, robbery none, aggravated assault 12, you can see, and I don't have to tell you, you can see that up there, what's going on here. And that's just the, the quarter. Now, I'm going to give you the drug arrest that we've made uh, so far from January 1st, 2020, July 15th, 2021. We, made, we have made, uh, not just there, but over 1,096 drug arrests in Alamance County. Oh, in the whole county? No, that's just the county. That's just the county. That's not Burlington, Mebane, Hall River. Just in the rural part. That's exactly right. We've made 82 arrests in these hotels. And what our people do, we have two officers here. I'm going to let, let them tell you in just a minute. But they work these hotels religiously. And a lot of times they will follow the cars or the individual once they leave out into the county or on the interstate. That interstate is a problem for us. Uh, and stop and find a lot of drugs. As you can see up there, the arrest that we made, something else that's really alarming to me, overdoses, Alamance uh, EMS response. This is just Mercy Medical Service. 
445 since January 2021 through J July 28, 2021. This does not include, uh, you know, your unconsciousness, cardiac arrest, etc. We, just the, sher the uh, sheriff's office, since January 1st, 2020 through July 16th, 2021, Alamance County Sheriff's Office have responded to a sheriff's office, 102 overdoses, 10 fatalities, and utilized 56 cases of Narcan. Folks, we got a problem here. And this is just what we know about. This is just what we know about. Sheriff, can we shut this place down? Can we go to the owners and say, hey, look, you're causing a health issue? Blade may they'll see the sheriff face when we start this operation. Because uh, th this is ridiculous. Well, these, I'm telling these, you. These owners know this is going on. Oh, yeah. So they're, they're culpable here. Well, I don't want to bad mouth the hotel. I, uh, the, I do know there have been some problems. But I can tell you we will utilize whatever it takes within the law. Clyde may have to do like he did with Dockside Dolls and the uh, French Quarters down there. <laughs> oh, boy. He needs, some, he needs some help now, boy. <laughs> uh, but I, I think we can if we do follow the right protocol in getting it done. And nothing is off the table. Good to hear. You understand what I'm saying? Good to hear. Okay. Uh, mental health commitments. This is something. You know, 2016, we had 1,919 mental health commitments. The reason I'm doing this, mental health and drug addictions go hand in hand. 2017, 1861. 2018, 1845. 2019, 1864. 2020, 1762. And if you'll notice, the 2020, that's when we started having our people trained, answering calls, trying to de-escalate. Burlington had co-responders. 21, uh, so far, as of July the 15th, there's been 1,004 mental health commitments uh, here in the county. And that, I'm telling you, that takes money, that takes officers' times, and believe me, the officers don't mind dealing with these individuals because that's part of our job. But when you look at them having to be there versus out on the road stopping the drug traffic versus having the mental health commitments. North Carolina, and this is interesting too, I pulled it off, the uh, Center for Disease Control Overdose and Death Data. North Carolina's ranked 12th in the nation for overdose. 2020, 3,260. 2019, 2383. Increase of overdose deaths, this is death now, 877 increase over a year. That's somebody's child, that's somebody's daughter, that's somebody's mama. And I can tell you, our mental health system in this state is broke. When it was taken out of state control, buddy, everybody's in it now for the money. But we got people dying. We got people with mental health disorders that could be saved before they die or before something else happens. Uh, we, we were at a church conference, training conference. We had a panel of shirts and the cliff members it. I asked the question, what would you say, and I knew what the figure was going to be, I said, what, what would you say the percentage of people in your jail with mental health issues, and that involved drug substance abuse, percentage was? You know what it said? 75%, every one of the shirts. That's a lot of people. And just think, could we be saving some of these people? Could we? And I think we could. Then guess what? We'd be saving seventy-seven dollars a day, or more than that, if there's medical issues with these inmates. And I'm gonna open it up for any question, but I would first like to call two of my officers that work these hotels, special operations. Please step up here. I want you to explain to these commissioners what what y'all have to do every day and what y'all see with your own eyes. Uh, I know they probably don't want to hear me, but they may listen to y'all. <laughs> Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the of the panel. Uh, my name is Lieutenant Chris Crane. Uh, I'm the supervisor of the street crimes uh, unit at the sheriff's office, and our primary mission is to uh, investigate drug activity in and around Alamance County. Um, and the things that the sheriff has shown you, I can tell you from first-hand experience, is true. Uh, 
stories like Ms. Fogelman has shared is absolutely true. I've seen it too many times. Uh, and one thing I can tell you is that we're not, uh, we're not fighting a war on drugs because wars end. And this thing's not ended. So we've got to figure out a different way. We've been doing this thing the same way for years, and it's just not working. Um, I don't know what the answer is. If I, if I knew that, I wouldn't be here. I'd be somewhere else making a whole lot more money. So, uh, but I do appreciate the raise we just got. That was good. Thank you for that. But anyway, um, I can tell you that um, we spent a lot of time. Some of the numbers that, that you shown that were, you were shown about the drug overdoses uh, are, are low. Uh, we've had three more deaths in the past week. Uh, and if you look at 10 over the past uh, 18 months and you got three in a week, that's an alarming rate. Uh, so we've got some fentanyl that's starting to come in now and also some suspected car fentanyl that's starting to come in. It's being pressed in the pill form. People are taking it and, it, and it's killing people every day. So uh, it's, it's a very real situation, and this opioid crisis, in my opinion, is what's driving it. Um, so if you have any questions for me before I pass it off to my, my partner here, Craig, uh, I'll be happy to answer them if I can. Well, um, I came to see y'all a few weeks back. The suit, I'm so impressed. Um, <laughs> Looked a lot different today. You, you do, but either way, you're awesome. And um, and I, I'm just, we, we just had a, uh, um, I just, um, I know what you work with because I work with it at the jail. Um, it's just not about getting high. And um, it, when I come to see y'all about these motels, I come in there like on a broom just ticked because we've got several clients that have been involved over there. And I know there are children that live over there sometimes. And I had someone tell me that their Bible school picked up kids at Econ Lodge one time for Bible school when they went in to get two children and the parents were just so stoned on heroin he said, we could have just took those kids and never known it. But the fact that they went in and got kids for Bible school makes such a difference. I think we have to realize that um, people have families that this is involved in. Because if your family has a drug problem, a, a kid and your whole family has a problem. And, and I'd sit there and, and um, you showed me people who had been killed for um, drugs. Because you don't really matter unless you pay it up or you settle your... Um, I had a really bad rape one time of a male that was out of not paying a drug dealer. I've never seen anything like it. I'll never forget him for the rest of my life. But the thing of it is, is you showed me people. I saw a girl with one shot in her shoulder and her back. That was somebody's mother or somebody's daughter. I saw a boy with, he was hit underneath the piece of metal and the only thing sticking out was his legs. How disgraceful to treat somebody like that. We had a teacher that was in a shootout, a highly respected teacher, a coach in Nova County. And it's like Penny said, it crosses all boundaries. Drugs doesn't, it's not selective, it's just whoever it can get to devour. And um, it's just, it's so crucial that we work on this as much as we can. And um, it's so crucial to have motels that you stay in for vacation or on your way to another destination. Not to come here and sell out somebody's body or pimp out somebody or get high. I was in court two Thursday ago and everything before Judge Hanford, even the 17 year old defendant with a murder does now 21 getting sentenced. Everything was the core was drugs. This is, this is an evil that owns your bones. I see it with what I go to interview at the jail and I can, the first time I meet somebody, and then the next week and the next week, I slowly watch that scum come off somebody because they can't get their hands on it. And But the minute they can walk out, it's waiting on them. And the thing, we have such a hard time finding placement for a rehab center. It's, it's just unbelievably difficult. We can't have that difficulty. We need our own place here in Alamance County to take care of our own people. And, and because regardless of how you want to hear people say, just, just get rid of them. I've heard them say that about teenagers that get in trouble. Just get rid of them. You know what? We need to all look in the mirror and realize that we have all been in situations where we made really bad choices and we just happen to not get arrested. So um, I can't. I know what you guys, I know a small part of what you do. And um, 
and I, I don't know what it's going to take to shock this county to wake up to realize that people are dying before they die and young people are getting this younger and younger and and kids with this crap in their house do not do well in school they bring it with them to school we see a lot of their disciplinary problems and and I you know these motels these motels we're watching you because that ain't what you're supposed to be doing and sometimes homeless children are housed in these motels and that is not safe for them and you must always open your eyes to realize that you've got to look under every rock to make sure wherever you put a kid they're safe so um guys just you, you know you just you just need to tell us and tell this county how it is how it really is you don't have to hold back you don't have to be pretty they need to know because it's not down the road from us it is the road and uh, you want to know what streets you shouldn't drive down because you don't want to get in trouble none of them because it's everywhere it goes to church every Sunday you know before you well, gentlemen sit down I don't think he's finished yet you finished no I, I want to address all three of you uh, Lieutenant can. Stevens uh, thank you for having me here today I don't know what else I can say um, that Chris hasn't hasn't already explained uh, he and I work hand in hand every day um, we talk about on all the time um, we refer to it as the wake you can see the destruction that it you see these people from start to finish basically and you see the destruction that the um, that the drugs are having on I uh, feel for her um, it's it's a it's a bad deal I don't know how else to explain it in my in my opinion we've seen um, I don't think it's heroin so much anymore. We've, I don't remember last time we saw brown powder heroin. Everything we're seeing now is white, which lends to either cut with fentanyl, pure fentanyl, or far fentanyl, and again, depressed pills. So I think that's the cause. What the solution is, I do not know. How about telling us what it does to you to face this every day? The nights you work, the crazy situations you face, and you just shake your head why do people do this to each other or to themselves? What's the wear and tear it has on you? Because you're away from your family. I mean, it's, it's hard on the heart of anybody that has um, children or loved ones, anybody has any kind of empathy or compassion at all. You know, it, it's, hard, it's hard to watch that. Sometimes you just have to, to switch it off. I don't know how else to explain it. You know, Alabama County, early in your career and my career, had the Alamance Council, one time it was a three county mental health authority. Uh, at that time, the mental health authority had psychologists, psychiatrists, all kinds of facilities right here in Alamance County. Governor Hunt came along and the Democratic legislature at that time wanted to outsource everything and they did away with all the mental health authorities. Mr. Albright and I worked sort of together <laughs> in dissolving the Mental Health Authority uh, here in Alamance County and because it was under a statutory mandate that they go away. And ever since then, everything's been outsourced. And I'm not trying to put down the outsourcers or the agencies, but things have gone downhill dramatically every day since that day. Uh, We've got to go back to some type of, the diversity center is just a start. And we've got to have that. And right now, we've got the next thing on the agenda, Mr. Albright's gonna tell us about the opioid settlement. And we're talking about dollars. Earlier in this meeting, we talked about the ARPA money. Again, millions of dollars. We've got the money. We've got to have the determination and the willingness to spend the money in the right areas Absolutely. and solve some of these problems. Ms. Haygood, my thought is, and I guess I'm a little emotional because I don't know any family that hasn't had this problem. We need to get this group, the four of you 
folks right there, this gentleman right here, or his person, and some of us, and then Larry Brown, I think uh, either Tom Lambeth or Brad Allen, and we've got to determine what we can do to solve. And the drug court is just one option. Diversity Center is another. There are all kinds of options, but we've got to put the money in the right place to do what we need. And I just want to add to that, John. Um, I've met with Andy Hampford, because I've told you that Andy Hampford and Larry Brown said they wanted to lead this in a recovery um, court. And I've met with Judge Jay Bryan, and Larry and I are going to Orange County September the 8th, Bryan, and um, to what observe Orange Counties. But Vaya is also going to come here to meet with us to help us get the diversion center going and look at a recovery court because that's what they do. Because as much as I want this, and I know everybody in this room is, we need the professionals that know how to start this. Because Orange County may be one thing, High Point may be one thing, Buncombe County may be one thing, but it needs to be Alamance counties because we are our own county. We just can't go take something and think that will work here. But it's got to fit with everything. And, it, and it's um, the, the way, it's just, it's economical. But the thing of it is with drug addiction, alcoholism, anything, it is going to always be there. You don't fix people, you fix buildings, you fix roads. But this is a lifetime commitment with someone that walks in these shoes because it's chasing them like anything that has us, it chases us forever. And that's what the community's got to get around is this isn't a fix quick, you know, quick fix on something and money's going to fix this. We've learned this with schools. Another million dollars does not fix a kid. And I'm not throwing off an ABSS, I love them. But I'm just saying, we got to really open our eyes wide to understand the trauma behind doing all these drugs. You just don't wake up. It's like, it's like human trafficking. It's like prostitution. There ain't a five-year-old girl in this county wants to grow up and be a prostitute. She wants to be a fairy princess. But depending on what happens to her or him along the way can determine that choice. And it's a nightmare. It's a cancer. It is a real cancer. And there's no chemo that can fix it but it's going to take the whole sport of the community and to realize that it is ugly and you have to fight ugly because it's going to kill us. Sometimes I feel like we are the television show, The Walking Dead, because people are just walking around and know what they're doing. Just just go to the jail one day and just go meet people and go to, go to the motels and just watch. I went over and sat in the parking lot. I know I'm, I've lost it. I'm in the parking lot taking pictures thinking, what is going on over here? I drove to every one of those motels. I thought, why are these parking lots so full at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? Is this a big <laughs> destination of tourism? I don't think so. And I'm on the phone with Terry calling him just, Arr! and I'm thinking, that I'm going to be kidnapped, but that's okay. God help them. But I'm just saying, we've got to go to war on this. This is a war. And um, we, we can't, we cannot keep acting like, or just, we just can't keep not doing this. And there'll never be enough officers. There'll never be enough nurses. There'll never be enough teachers. But we got to give them everything they need. And, and our commissioners have got to get on board. We cannot be a group of five that all we do is vote. We got to fight. And that's the big difference. And I know everybody at this desk right here are fighters. And we've got to really lean into this and stand by our law enforcement. The whole county, Burlington, Hall River, everybody, law enforcement. It's a community county problem. It can't be left on one law enforcement agency. Well, I'll say this. Uh, I can tell you, uh, Acting Chief Kearns and Assistant Chief Long has dedicated to us coming together on our help because they're short officers, we short officers. Yeah. But together, we're gonna make it rough on some people. I can tell you that. If they don't get out of Alamance County, if they keep dealing dope, stuff like that, we're coming after them. And I want them to know that. Yeah, I do too. It's power and unity. Well, I may have some news that might help. Uh oh, what's it? <laughs> <laughs> I met with a group last week who's considering donating a facility to the county. I'll find out more probably later this week or early next week. Well, they would, if they if they do it, they would probably want to donate it to the county and let the county determine what organization might run it. Well, I'm telling you, we need a diversion center and all these nonprofits. I think the commissioners need to look at them hard 
who is accomplishing exactly. what they should be accomplishing and who is not. Exactly. And I can tell you, it's hard to put a price on a human life. Folks. Oh, definitely. Well, by, uh, when we all did the interview with them, a big issue was the divergence. Center. Right. Uh, we wanted to make sure they were going to be part of that. But your daughter, until you get her into a three to six month center, is not going to make it. So I've got a JD, not an MD, but I've been around the JD business long enough to know that. And I was, you know, chairman of the mental health board and so forth back when it was a mental health board. And I've seen it over and over again. So somehow we've got to have the facilities and the resources to do that sort of thing. Wouldn't it be nice for everybody to visualize something really big? The corridor. Think about it. The motels could be a positive corridor. And I think Burlington <laughs> is looking to try to work. I've got information trying to clean up some of that area and make some changes, which I think is fantastic. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I get sick from time to time hearing mothers like this lady right here come in and there's nothing you can do but catch them and put them in jail. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's all I can do. We have, we have monies coming in now, and I'm not trying to take any COVID money, but I'm telling you. Yes, he is. If, well, yes, I am, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. If we can get a diversion center, we're going to keep some people out of that jail at $77 a day. And what was that? It said uh, 100 and some days in jail or whatever it was. That's a lot of money, folks. And I'm not counting the medical expenses on these people. We got one right now, I guess still over at the hospital, is that correct? That uh, come in on drugs, and guess what, seizure, boom. See, over at the hospital, we're having people set with around the clock, around the clock. Folks, the people out there need help, and I'm telling you, we need help and law enforcement. And I know everybody in here feels the way that I do about this lady's situation. If it didn't touch you, you're not a human being. But that's just one of hundreds in this county that we deal with every day. And I know we've gone a long time, so we're going to sit down and shut up. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you, gentlemen. And we thank you. Mr. Hey good, but we asked the four of you on this front row right here and some of the others to come back with us on the uh, 16th. Yep. <laughs> I said the 19th earlier. Uh, on the 16th with some proposals and maybe a committee what 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 your suggestions are sure yeah thank you mr. chairman I've had an offer for if they decide they're interested in donating this facility an offer for the for us to take a tour of the facility and see what we think of it before we have to accept it so where is this facility I'm not at liberty to say right now and I don't know either. <laughs> the decision's not been made. It's just being considered. Okay. Mr. Chairman, one thought is that uh, in preparation for this meeting, I had some conversations with folks. Guilford County has established recently, in conjunction with Cone, a mental health facility that includes a diversion center. That may be a good place to start just to look and see what was re recently created. Mm -hmm. I know we want to have something that's tailored to us, but that might be a starting point. Because right. they're sisters, mental health and drugs. They're really wicked sisters. It's one cause and effect. I hope they're going to be quick. Okay. You're good. Mm -hmm. Mr. Albright. Yes, sir. We're going to give you three and a half minutes, but other. I'll take all two. In 2018, we got together with about 4,000 other attorneys across the country and decided we had enough of the opioid crisis and that <clears throat> lawsuits were filed with the big manufacturers Cardinal, McKisson, Amersource Bergen, and Johnson & Johnson, and Purdue Pharma. <clears throat> Purdue Pharma filed for bankruptcy, and we have filed our proof of claim. We think that might generate $100 million. Um, the big four settled 
or proposed a settlement for $26 billion. And according to the National Settlement Agreement, the states have 30 days to sign on to it, and we, as a local government, have 150. But the County Attorney Association and the Association of County Commissioners and Josh Stein, in a, in a rare move of cooperation, worked with us and came up with a memorandum of agreement, <clears throat> which I'm before you today, I ask you to authorize me to sign it. And what that does, the memorandum of agreement, as outlined in the document itself, gives 15% of this money to the state, $750 million is North Carolina's share. The state will get 15%, 80% goes to county governments and local governments. I think there's 17 municipalities that qualify. It's all laid out in Exhibit G to the agreement. I think all of you have a copy of it. Kevin Leonard emailed it to you. It's 383 pages, so I thought I'd save you some time. Uh, <laughs> We, uh, we think it's the thing to do. About 53 local governments have signed on and others are signing on at their meetings this week. So let me tell you what dollar amount we're going to get. We get a percentage, it's 1.378 percent of $750 million, which totals $10,335,217.25. I was afraid you'd ask that. <laughs> Ten million three hundred and thirty-five two seventeen and twenty-five cents over eighteen years. Do the math, Thomas. Um, it's seven five hundred seventy-four thousand one hundred and seventy-eight dollars and fifty and seventy-three cents per year. Give us that to money. Alamance County. Five hundred seventy-four thousand one hundred and seventy-eight dollars and seventy-three cents. Thank you. Doesn't include the hundred million we expect from Purdue. I'm not sure how that's going to be divided, but I don't expect that will be a great amount coming to us. We'll just have to wait and see. Um, but I think this is a very favorable uh, agreement. Uh, if we don't sign it, we may get something a lot worse. Mr. Albright, is that the net number after f attorney fees, court, everything? Well, our else? attorney fees come out of that number. And that's another source of contention. The national firms have signed on to this. The local firms are, are crying that they need more money. They have an agreement with the national firm. We have an agreement with the local firm. And um, this MOA addresses that. But I think it's 25%, uh, and if you include their cost, 35%. But the attorney's fees... As we collect it. Mm -hmm. The national agreement includes $1.6 billion to pay attorneys. $1.6 billion. So, we feel like sign up, signing the MOA would be the thing for the county to do. So I ask that you authorize this resolution. Or authorize me to sign it and, and then give the manager, I think the resolution gives the manager and me authority to uh, receive the money and then we'll spend it in uh, addressing some of the concerns of addiction. So now, we can turn that money around to go into the very yes. issue we were just talking about? Yep. Yes. Okay. So 18 years? Five, what's wrong with them people? You well, paying them lawyers all that money up front? Why can't you just go ahead and pay counties up front? These, that's what I just asked, and we not get to pay them as them. we collect no. it. it was one, is that the chicken people? No, no. there's another family. Oh. You should go see how much no, money they made off the opioids. If they're willing to give the uh, given uh, the lawyers one point one billion dollars, one point six billion, they made a boatload of money on this thing. Well, and it's you got to remember these law these big firms are going to continue in business. Mm -hmm. So as long as they continue in business, they can pay the settlement fee. But anybody that's struggled with addiction, I don't think there's anybody in the room that hasn't or doesn't know someone. Absolutely. Um, it's my own personal thoughts. Maybe I should shut up, but we spent $5 million on an animal shelter. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Well, how about we can use that money to best serve this group of a population of people that struggle 
And I mean, everybody says, just don't take it. I'm sorry, it just don't work that way. It's, it's, it's put, put toward the operation of a divergence center, right? Right. Sure. To combine it with the, the maintenance of effort money that we already spend by law annually to pay for diversion center hours, to uh, expand those hours, or to find other programmatic uses inside of the diversion center or something else along those lines. But absolutely, yeah. It, it, would, uh, it would be a good funding to have. Uh, you know, we've been struggling to try to take the diversion center from its current number of hours to 24 hours a day and to add these chairs where individuals can stay for 23 hours. And uh, mm -hmm. I, whenever these funds start coming in, They'd be dependable funding for 18 years. So it would be, it could be a part of that sustainable funding the VIA folks were here speaking about, about mm -hmm. how do you find this money to keep it going. If we're going to get half a million dollars a year for 18 years, that's a reasonable way to consider to use it. That's a lot like alcoholism. Once you're an addict, you're always an addict. That's right. And simply taking you, putting you in jail, punishing you, and throwing you right back out, it's not going to solve the problem. You just hold your breath in jail. That's what you do. I'll make a motion that we accept, let, let um, Mr. Albright sign this, or however I need to word it. Well, need, the board needs to approve and sign the resolution. Do you have a copy of it? We need to have a second. I second. Any other discussion? I thought we already had. <laughs> Thirty-five percent of ten million three hundred thirty-five thousand two hundred seventeen dollars right. twenty-five cents is. Three million six hundred and seventeen thousand three hundred and twenty six dollars and pennies. Right. Payable over eighteen years. Mm -hmm. When we get paid, they get their share. Still an incredible number. Yeah. It is. But mm. you know how those lawyers are, Mr. Chow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm getting a little uncomfortable here, guys. <laughs> are you surrendering your license, I feel like sir? <laughs> mayonnaise on a sandwich here. What well they they did fight a tremendous fight at a 15 week <laughs> trial in West Virginia that produced the settlement. So, as you know, being an attorney, you, you have to apply heat at the appropriate spot in order to get a settlement. And these are big firms that had their own lawyers that put up a fight. So. Like Aaron Brockwich. Any other discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 You know, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, we've been asked to do a 10 minute break. Okay. I apologize. <laughs> okay. okay, that's fine. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, okay. I'm back. We All promise right. not to stop you this time. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, I am before you to talk about a compensation plan for DSS. Um, you probably have heard that we have been. Um, We've had so much turnover there. Right now we have um, a 20% vacancy rate. Um, I looked at our stats this morning and just on Friday we had, um, it was six of our staff last day. Just, so we had six people to leave just on Friday. Um, so so what this is- What type workers were they? I'm sorry? What type? So some of them were social workers and some of them were our income maintenance workers. Um, so we have been working with uh, the county manager's office to look at just some creative ways, some strategies that we can address this turnover um, problem. I will tell you in speaking with my colleagues from other counties, it, it's pretty rampant in DSS across the board. Um, so we have looked at three um, bonus plans. Um, and so you can see we have looked at uh, a retention bonus for our staff who have been um, with us, who have stayed dedicated and um, who are working lots of hours right now. We're also looking at a sign-on bonus. Um, some of our um, neighboring DSSs are doing the same thing, looking at sign-on bonuses for some of the hard to hire um, positions. And we're looking at a referral bonus. Um, we thought that if we could um, have our staff who are with us now refer people um, potential candidates for employment that would be um, an incentive to be able to give them a bonus for referrals 
Um, and, and in these three bonuses, we um, looked at some compression issues. So we do have um, just a small amount of compressions. It just involves five positions that we're looking at in this plan. What? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Compression. Compression. So, yes, yes. That's what I thought you said. That's okay. right. So when, when um, so if workers receive um, increases, but their supervisors don't, or if supervisors receive increases and their managers don't, then you have them bumping up right there at each other with salaries. Mm -hmm. So we have to address some of those compression issues there. Do we have some of what going on in DSS or with what similar to what happened with the sheriff's office? Uh, yes, we did. We did last year, I believe it was. We implemented a targeted raise program for DSS using their budgeted funds. We operated inside their the department's budget. Mm -hmm. Same issue, tried to target high turnover positions, mm -hmm. but that did not target everyone. So we had some supervisors that now uh, employees are catching up to. So Adrian's uh, suggesting that we consider, I believe it was five individuals right. that are, their employees are getting near and set and pay to them that they be included in this, uh, in this plan. And this plan, as we did in 1920, Will, would be paid for through the existing DSS budget. There is no request here for additional funds. This is done through the salary budget of DSS uh, for this fiscal year. And we're certainly hopeful that this will help DSS. Uh, we know that the turnover they're experiencing, uh, Cheryl does turnover reports uh, through HR uh, every quarter, and DSS out of the top nine positions is at least in the top five every time particularly social workers and income case workers, mm -hmm. uh, that's just an unbelievable amount of turnover. So the idea would be these are these are bonuses for the most part. Bonus, uh, as, as Adrian said, bonuses for everyone in the department, uh, bonuses for the folks that are signing on in these uh, tough, tough to fill positions uh, to be paid at after six months completion, they get through their probationary period, they receive a bonus. If they get through another six months, because what we see is the, the turnover really happens between years one and five. That's when people are leaving Alamance County Government in general, particularly DSS. So. Where are they going? So um, we're seeing in these top five turnover positions, they're either going to counties, surrounding counties, or they're leaving the field. Um, and that's, that's pretty much what we're seeing. Um, and, and uh, like, let me stop you one yeah. more. The, you talked about the 2019 2020 budget and the funding then. Did that not help any at all? Uh, I think uh, the raise that we did was in 2021, was it in was. the last it was, fiscal it year. It was February yes. of this year, mm -hmm. actually. Um, and it was a 4% increase for our three top turnover positions. And we're, we has what? provided information. I don't believe they've seen help from that move. And uh, the, the information we have that compares us to Orange County, Durham County, and Randolph County, um, where uh, average pay for social workers is a little over forty-six thousand dollars, and the the lowest of those three is Randolph at a little over forty-eight. So even with the the four percent, we're still low, and it doesn't seem that that action didn't seem to have the effect that we desired. Well, and I think I think the difference here is that we have traditionally been a training county. So we tend to hire staff who don't completely qualify as social workers. Uh, we our highest level social worker is a social worker I, A and T, and that's our investigative assessment treatment social worker. Um, most counties don't hire them unless they're fully qualified. So they come to Alamance, they get fully qualified, they get some experience and then they can go next door and make four to eight thousand dollars more um so while their starting salary may be somewhat close to ours that's not what they're leaving for i mean they're leaving for much more than that because they do have that experience so they can negotiate their starting salary and i have a friend who has a daughter a friend who has told me that her daughter did exactly the same thing mm -hmm. Trained, I hope that, uh, experienced I'm next sorry. door i'm sorry i'm sorry so I do, that should I, we be addressing salaries mm -hmm. or bonuses? Well, I had hoped that our uh, merit program and even the merit and cost of living this year would be of some help. I think it's just we may be moving slower in, in the uh, increases that we've done. We did try to speed it up with mm -hmm. the 4%, but that, that didn't help either. So mm -hmm. at this point, you know, th those are funds, uh, salaries uh, realized over the course of the year. So the thought here was, would a thousand dollars at higher of your six months plus another thousand in a uh, 
12 month period is that trying to get money a little quicker to the employee but uh, I think in the long run, yes, I think adjusting uh, DSS's salaries is going to be the answer to this. And this kind of what we looked at at budget and didn't approve? Uh -huh. Well, we, we no. the commissioners approved additional funding for DSS. Mm -hmm. I think uh, in 2021, DSS was funded in such a way that uh, they weren't fully funded. They had to leave on average 11 positions open throughout the agency. This year, the amount of funding that DSS received for salaries was more. I think they are on track right now to back, to make it through the year with a balanced budget that have to leave on average uh, eight positions open in DSS. But I think you have over 40 at this point. As of today, we have 46 openings. So we're getting to a level of uh, mm -hmm. real concern mm -hmm. uh, to be able to for them to be able to continue to meet their their mission, which uh, my understanding is some of the areas in DSS have struggled. I think child support, sure. uh, the child support agents have struggled because the mm -hmm. turnover is so quick. I think they're struggling to meet the goals of revenue that they collect on behalf right. of the kids because it takes training and know-how to do that work and when you're turning over as fast as they are they're not able to to get that knowledge so. and and right now we're seeing um the number one reason for staff leaving is just the amount of work that they're having to do i mean they're they're covering two and three caseloads so um and what we've heard is i'm burned out um i don't oh, sure. have a work-life balance and um so until we get some people in there that can share that uh, load, you know, that that's what we're seeing. We're not seeing um, that it's due to culture or, you know, training needs. It's it's just the amount of work right now. And the fact that if you're going to do this work, COVID has, has been a barrier um, because, you know, like someone said earlier, our social workers have continued to go into facilities where there's COVID or homes. Um, but what we're mainly seeing is the workload right now. Can this not be looked at as out of our COVID funds? Out of I our think funds? some of it might be able to be eligible for premium pay. Uh, if we use premium pay, ARPA funding, we're going to have to really look at the DSS employees' responsibilities to, to make sure we can draw some correlation to how much of, they, of their work are they doing to address COVID. So I don't know that it would necessarily help every one of these employees that are in the high, the high turnover. That is certainly a way to, to, to try to do it. I think if, if the commissioners were interested in looking at uh, this plus any salary work, yes, we'd want to look at uh, premium pay and sit down with Adrian and say, okay, let's look at each employee, each class, how much work are they doing today? Because uh, that, that's going forward. And the hope is going forward, the work with COVID will decrease, right? So we want to make sure we understand how to apply ARPA through pre premium pay to these folks if we can. Ms. Day, I think all of us, all five, want to help you. Mm -hmm. But I don't think, I'm going to suggest to this board that we put this over to the, the 16th to determine what's the cause? Why are they leaving? If it's solely salary, we're wasting bonus money, like $400,000 or whatever that grand total is. Uh, 393239 Yeah. I think we need to find out what the problem is um, and Ms. Hook and I guess Mr. Haygood primarily, uh, let's determine what the problem is and come back on the 16th with a solution that might solve the problem instead of put a Band-Aid on it. At least that would be my thought. I kind of thought you just told us it's it, workload. It's and, the uh, workload is the primary reason right we now. We need to get people that are going to stay there and if the salaries are so low, we're a training center we haven't helped anything. That was part of the budget. Yeah. I got a question. Yes. What are you are you having difficulty bringing people in with zero experience? Are you having people that has 10 years experience and applying for jobs? <laughs> no. Okay, no. so it is a salary issue. Yeah. Okay. I have an idea. What's your starting salary for a person if you bring them off the street today? What would you what would you offer them? Would you would it would it be uh, would you have a parameter? Okay, they have this experience but they don't have this experience you try to get an idea where they fall in your do, do you have a that is that is how we look at salaries so we look at um someone off the street so we are under office of state human resources so there's a qualification that we have to do so we have to see where they qualify if they qualify we look at someone um who's been at the agency for a period of time because again there's this whole compression issue that we're always dealing with as well um but it, we do try and negotiate. If someone comes in fully qualified, they don't start at starting salary. 
Um, so we do look at that. There. We do. Mm -hmm. Because my suggestion to you is just a suggestion because I've had this problem before, mm -hmm. and this is how I solved it. And it was not a problem that I solved in a year. It sure. was a multi-year issue. Sure. I got a budget, and I made sure that every dime of that budget I spent on salaries. I went out and hired people and paid them $20,000 more than I normally pay them just to get the person in the seat. And I gave them such a good deal that they didn't want to leave. And they didn't want to leave for two or three years because I had signed them up in such a way that they realized that if they walk out the door, they're going to lose money. They're not going to be able to go to the next job and make more money because they are making more yeah. money than they would at the next job. Now, I know this is a situation that is a little bit different because this is government and it's mm -hmm. not corporations. Mm -hmm. But the same issue applies. If you can, if we can sit down and maybe let's, it's up this salary. If we have a salary problem, let's up the salary. Okay, let's do that first. And let's give them a signing bonus. And let's give them another signing bonus after they stay there for a year. Let's make it such a way in which they will think twice about walking out the door. Mm -hmm. Now, I know this is going to cost us some money. But I think if we don't use the money that we have allocated for salaries in a way to get a person in the seat, mm -hmm. then the money's actually doing us no good. We can have $10 million, and if we can't, if we are, you know, well, we can't pay this person $5,000 more a year because, well, well, we're not doing ourselves any favor. I'm saying let's go ahead and let's, a, it's a, it's, let's attack the problem that we have. Let's throw some money on it and see how that happens. Because you know as well as I do, that everyone gets up every morning to go to work. It's not because they love their job; it's they get paid every two weeks. Now, I love my job, but if you didn't pay me every two weeks, I probably wouldn't show up. <laughs> but I'm saying there's ways we can do this. I'm just not certain. After I looked at your proposal, I understand what your problem is, but I'm not certain that that will solve it. I think it could be a combination of that and some other things. I think we can solve this problem. So I think we were looking at it that this would somewhat be an immediate, could have some immediate effect. Absolutely. Um, and that's what we were looking for, just to really stop the bleeding right sure. now. Um, that, and so we, we have worked quite extensively with uh, do you the have, county manager's how, how office. How many people do you have applying for these jobs? Very few. Very few. So positions where, um, our, I'll use our income maintenance um, caseworker position. On average, we would get, you know, 100 applications for a vacant position uh, for one because because those are really entry level sure. um, I think two weeks ago uh, HR said that for one we got 20 so it's wow. it's yeah we're just not getting the application do you think it might change I know I hear things on TV you know uh, certain but our state's not that way so it really shouldn't be that way uh, people waiting to you know they have um, work issues that alleviate themselves and you know, like some people get I know I know several people who aren't going back to work until the end of September because that's when their benefits run out. I wonder if that may help you at all. That that could potentially um, be the issue with those um, I, I think entry level positions be, because they, the salaries for those aren't. Well let me ask you again because I think I forgot. What is the salary? What's the what's the Entry level salary that you're bringing these people in. I think you said forty six thousand was what you were. That's the, uh, that's social, social work. Oh. That's social work. That's not my income maintenance. Gotcha. I don't have to, I don't, Who I don't sets the salary to. ranges? Does the county set them? No, um, Office of State uh, Human Resources that's what I was sets thinking. our ranges. So we don't really have local control over the ranges. So the state sets your salary? They, they do, but we can operate within those ranges. Right. And the county's been uh, very eager to help us to be able to operate within those. So the state sets the grade that the position is in, but the county sets the range of the grade, okay. the salary. Can you say that again? So the state sets the pay grade that the position would be okay. in, but the county sets the range with the salary, range. Right, the number. Mm -hmm. So we can increase those salaries. And other counties have higher ranges. Well, I think it's a combination of other other counties have higher ranges. Other counties, not necessarily have. Some of them have higher ranges, but also some of them are giving more credit. Mm -hmm. for years of service, for education, and that sort of thing. So she has a base 
salary and then she can add on to it based on qualifications mm -hmm. and I think other counties maybe are adding more on for qualifications and we have had this conversation before because she's at a place right now where we're not able to find qualified people so we're bringing them in a dollar under the, the minimum and saying we're going to work against the qualifications mm -hmm. and once you get a year in then we'll give you the extra dollar mm -hmm. and you'll be in that pay range well once they get a year in they'll go they're somewhere gone. else because now they've got a year and mm -hmm. they're qualifying for more mm -hmm. somewhere else mm -hmm. Um, and not all um, Department of Social Services are under um, Office of State Human Resources. There are some counties really? that are consolidated, mm -hmm. so um, they don't have to follow OSHR uh, rules and regulations. You find consolidated. So in, in some counties, uh, the public health and DSS is under uh, one director. You mean two departments? Yes. Okay. Yes, and so they, when they consolidate, they're not under Office of State Human Resources. Are they consolidating to save money or to? I, I don't that know was an option the state gave counties a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember right. I think the counties can. It's where the board of commissioners become mm -hmm. the authority. Right now, the, the the DSS board is the authority board over DSS, and the board of health is the authority board over mm -hmm. the health department, and a consolidated model. You have a number of things happen that the board of commissioners suddenly becomes the the takes on the responsibility or can for those boards it it, it pulls the employees of departments out from under office of state personnel mm -hmm. puts them under the county's uh guidance or personnel uh policies those, those kind of things mm -hmm. so it was done to my knowledge in a couple of locations where commissioners had issues with, with staffing at uh DSSs or health because those department heads do not report to the board of commissioners. So the few that I knew of that actually happened, uh, it was uh, usually a rub between the commissioners in one of the bodies, and they did that to say we need control of this agency for whatever reason. Um, so um, obviously here we have great folks, great missions uh, being met. I think with DSS, this this pay issue is the real the real bear and uh, you know uh, Commissioner Issa you're correct we can have lots and lots of money budgeted but if we're not getting it to the employee mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's if we no, can't put a no person point. in the seat we're we're failing mm -hmm. that's what I'm saying so let's 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 maybe uh, incrementally start raising these raises and the, on the on the front end and uh, don't be I think a thousand dollars is not enough for a signing bonus but I don't know how much your starting salary is if your starting salary was 45 and you gave someone a five thousand dollar bonus spread out over six months. Would that help? Would that help that employee? Would that help your situation? So I think you would get someone in the seat. I don't know that we'll be able to retain them. Retain them because so, of salary. The, well, so so I, I think we'd have to see because when we look at where um, where we're seeing vacancies, it's it's within that first year. Like most of our recent vacancies have been. With people who have been with us probably less than a year. Could we um, could we um, really up our salary games? They go from forty five to fifty five, and sign them for two years, and give them a bonus every year for those two years. I'm trying to, to think of a way to keep someone in a seat for seven hundred and thirty sure. days. Sure. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm trying to figure out how yeah. much it would cost to keep them in that seat for seven hundred and thirty days. Yeah. I think we'd also have to look at the ones who have been there too, how to keep them in that state. Absolutely. Because if you start giving five thousand sure. dollars of signing bonus. Well, maybe five grand's too much. I, I don't know. I don't I know don't what either. the magic number I is. Don't but but I, I like that. But thought. I would like to uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, well, you know, I guess the next time you um next time you bring another person in to that you think you might want to hire, uh, let's talk about it. I mean seriously. I, I hope mean, that's tomorrow. Well, let's do it. Though. My, phone's today, my phone right? works 24 hours a day, so as long as you don't call me at 3.30 a.m., we're going to be fine. Because uh, I think there's ways we can do this, and it's just a matter of maybe we may have to think uh, outside the box sure. as far as the money that we have available to hire people. Let's use it. Let's get some people in the seats. And let's think of creative ways to keep them in the seats. Yeah. Uh, and people, we all know people are motivated by money. Yeah. And it I think would be we nice if other people came here yep. instead of going and leaving mm -hmm. us to mm -hmm. go other places. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can create something in such a way people want 
Mm -hmm. I remember when there was um, a shortage with nurses because they got tired of doing all their job mm -hmm. and not making a whole lot of money. So they decided, fine then. And then all of a sudden, they could just about set their their salary and where they were going to go. Yep. So, um, you know, everybody is super important, especially in this field. And um, this is hard work, but it's, it's a calling. It really is. And it um, is. It's, we just got to make it worth their while. So are we as a board suggesting we put this all to the 16th? May, may I ask a question that, that, that will inform me of my decision of that, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman? Um, Director Day, I'm seeing five. You have recommendations for five high turnover positions. Yes. What 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 kind of worker are in those five high turnover? So our social worker I A N T. Those are our social workers in child protective services, mm. okay. foster care, adoption, those positions. Um, social worker threes are our adult protective services. Okay. So um, a guardianship. Um, that's another area where our numbers continue to increase. Um, and, and if you notice under the social worker three, I put child welfare and adult services only because we do have some social worker threes outside of um, adult services and child welfare, but those aren't our high turnover positions. Okay. Um, and our income maintenance two um, workers, those are our um, Medicaid and food and nutrition services workers. Um, and then our income maintenance supervisors, we're really having a hard time um, uh, finding supervisors and some of that economic services the qualification is very different so you don't qualify as a um, income maintenance caseworker too unless you've done the job for a year and and most agencies don't have income maintenance caseworkers one so most of the people we hire we hire them in a work against but you also have to be an income maintenance caseworker too for two years before you qualify as a supervisor so that also is some of the problem okay. is the qualifications. And then um, the CSA is our child support agent two positions. And so those are the ones who are establishing um, child support as well as um, enforcing child support. And these are people who are, I mean, rubber on, I mean, feet on the road. That's right. Making That's right. Things happen. Um, That's right. One uh, question is, as I understand it with the, the budget that was passed um, a couple months ago, DSS could hire 23 people with the increase that your budget allowed. If we if we add more money to this plan, it would seem your ability to hire additional folks within your current budget structure would go down. That would be correct if, do, if we were able to hire, yes. Do you have a sense of, of how many you could hire in your current budget structure if we accept this plan? So I think given where we are in um, in the budget year, I mean, it just started, but because right now we have 46 vacancies, right. so they're not going to come in overnight. So, um, you know, I feel like, and and we always have vacancies and attrition. So I, I really feel like we could get to a point that we could hire those those positions within this budget. You could, okay. I I really think so um, because of if you look at history with turnover, hopefully that's not going to happen, but. Um, it's kind of hard not to look at what we've traditionally seen. Um, I understand. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my initial thought was that we might, you know, tweak this a bit. I, it seems to me that there's a, an immediate need and that we have to stop the bleeding. Yes. And that, and that this does that uh, to an extent, but that we also take a long, hard look at, at DSS, its its pay structure, its mm -hmm. um, its retention, root causes, uh, so that we have a I think a more in depth look to to not just stop the bleeding, but but to allow the agency to to, to excel. Um, so I would support this today, and that we look long term. Okay. Uh, what, we, what really needs to happen? Okay. Putting that in the whole motion. Um, Yes, and, 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 I, and I therefore so move. I'll second it. <laughs> I'll second it. The only comment I've got is I think we're putting a Band-Aid on and not solving the problem. Well, he just said we didn't want to I, stop here. It. Yeah. Um, well, we have definitely been working well with the county manager's office, and so we will continue to um, look at this issue. Especially in light of the fact that this 
you're not asking for additional funds. I mean, That's these right. are, this is within your budget. That's right. You know. Let me ask you one additional. The visitation, uh, supervised visitation center for children, has that been reestablished or? So that is not under DSS. That was under Family Abuse Services. Okay. All right. I have one question too. What's an IMS? An IMS is an income maintenance supervisor. Uh, and then an income maintenance caseworker. Caseworker. What do they do? Um, that's our Medicaid and food and nutrition services, our food stamps. Okay. I don't think people in general really know what all DSS does. No, they don't. And I think nobody would have had a clue about the public health department if we hadn't had COVID. Mm -hmm. Because during times like this, you really get exposed as to what all you do. And, and I'm, I'm with you, John. I just. Um, this, it, I, I mean, I'm on their board and I hear it and I see the look on Bob's face every time he does a human resources. I mean, it's just really debilitating and, and everybody's kind of spreading their self to help everybody else. It's a real team effort and, and that kind of work, it's a lot of burnout. And, um, I, and I, it goes with it no matter what, but until you really get their wages competitive with who they keep flocking and leaving the county for, I, you know, I'd rather have a wage that's competitive so I can stay in my own county than to get a one-time bonus because that one-time bonus is like the stimulus thing and what you spend on is your business. But if I have a wage that compares to where I would have left for, then I, I'm going to stay right here and do everything in this county and, and I'm going to make a living that I deserve. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I just don't, and I don't want Adrian to feel like she can't ask for that. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying, because we just came to keep inching up to it, but as we're inching up to it, they're getting thrown away from us. So um, I just think we really need to look at the salaries of Department of Social Services to where they are competitive to who they are running to, because it would be a really great thing for other counties to start running to us, and we get a full staff so we can really serve everybody that needs the service in this county. I have to admit I agree, Pam. I mean, you know, I've, told, I've said before, I got an adopted grandson in another state who came through this process, and it's, it wasn't pretty. Wasn't, in particular, it wasn't pretty for him. And uh, I just, uh, I think we're looking at a theme here that I, I think we're all five enough, five smart enough to figure out there is a theme. But not just DSS, mm -hmm. not just the sheriff's office, but other departments as well. Our job is to make sure our citizens get serviced. Mm -hmm. Make sure that when they need something, they can go to the Department of Social Services, or they can go to the health department, or they can call the sheriff's office, or they can deal with the tax office, or whatever the department it might be that we're responsible for. Our job is to make sure when they show up at the door and make a phone call, they get the service they need. If they can't, there's only one place that the fault falls, and that's for sitting right here in this dais. Well, this agency plays the role in so many other agencies when it comes to intervention, and um, and it's a, it's a very difficult area to work with. But thank God for them because I'm um, like DSS Court, Jamie Hamlet, CPS workers, all kind of stuff like that. And I'm telling you, the very people that we've heard about today with the sheriff talking about drug addiction and stuff have had the same trauma that DSS has had to step in and try and save children from. So um, it's all connected. It really is. Ms. Day, I'm going to vote against this, not because I don't want to help you, not because I, I, don't re I do recognize there's a real need, but because I think we're putting a Band-Aid on and not solving the problem. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to hopefully get another shot at, at this on the 16th, but that's the reason I'm voting against it. Uh, okay. What's, what's, can you, you just, comment? Yeah, can you just uh, um, tell me what your motion is, Mr. Turner? What's your uh, motion? To accept this plan. To accept what I see on this screen here, $231,000 in bonus. Yes. Okay. Can I ask Well, there's a second page, too. Uh, oh. the, yeah, the, the yeah. total. Is no, that's not correct. 393,000. Uh, no, that's what I said. Yeah, a second I'll just look at the too. top. It's actually that's what I'm voting $393,239 right. and 22 pennies. I was just looking at the top. Brian? Right? Yeah. Yes. Bonus. It's, 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 it's the plan. The motion is to accept the plan as presented by the department. How do we go about 
doing what we're talking about with salaries. How do we go about doing that? I mean, really doing that? I think we'd have to sit down, uh, myself and Sherry, uh, and Adrian and her team, and we've done some of this, looking at how to address this immediate, um, and look throughout their department. We know some comps to where they're going, Orange County, Durham County, Randolph County, uh, at least in the social worker field, they are paying more than we are. Uh, we want to look at, you know, this focuses, with the exception of the bonus for all employees, the rest of it is bonuses for the high turnover. We really kind of focused on high turnover. If we look at agency-wide, uh, we'd be looking at, okay, how do we keep everybody comparable, right? If you, if you take those high turnover people way up, you, don't, you can't take them above their supervisor, so we'd start having to look at the whole agency. What would it cost to implement? If you make social workers pay $55,000, who else does that affect? Who supervises them? That might put them above their supervisor. We'd have to look at that across the board. And then estimate what annual cost that would be. Would it fit within the department's existing budget? If so, the only way to do that might be similar to what we've done with the Sheriff's Department, where we actually froze some positions and said, we can implement this immediately, uh, depending on the level of raise that it would take. But we have to talk with Adrian about, can you stand uh, the possibility of fully hired being less than your number of positions, because we're reallocating in turn rate. If not, you know, we might, we'd be looking at, okay, how, how high can we go with this out? But they're, they're working with that now. And they can't fill the position. That's right. Now, currently, they're funded at a level to be able to hire all employees with the exception of eight, right? It's just the dollar amount is such that they could hire everybody but eight, but they got 46 openings mm -hmm. right now. So that points to salaries are too low, right, in, in various positions. Great. To bring up those various positions significantly, it might take uh, increases for other positions beside those ones because mm -hmm. of supervisors and trying to have some uh, comparable uh, pay internally, I think we would be looking at can it be done in the dollar amount that they have? And if so, yeah, we, it's, it's going to take freezing more than eight positions, and those would be questions that Adrian and her folks would have to live with or, or tell us to say, you know, if, if it went from eight to 20, where would those 20 be frozen? Could we live with it if everybody else was fully staffed because the salaries got up to a point where people would come to work? Um, might be possible to do that by the 16th. I think that'd be, we'd be moving, wouldn't we, Terry? <laughs> yeah. But I'll that's tell all you, you got to do. Well, well, I'll just say that <laughs> this it. is a crisis. I mean, I agree. Uh, when you're at 46 down, when the department is starting to struggle to, to meet the service demands that they have, and not because their people don't want to do it, it's just because when you got that many vacancies, you just don't have people to give the work to. The work's just falling off the table, mm -hmm. right? So uh, it is a crisis. I'm concerned about it. I hear very clearly that the commissioners are also concerned about it. If you don't implement this today, then we're going to have something back up here by the 16th, and it's either going to be your choices would be, if you're going to do anything, either this plan or something we've come up with that attacks salaries, but has to be in a way that Adrian's folks can deal with the possibility of froze positions until next budget year. Or so. well, can we come up with a hybrid? Absolutely, yes. Yes, you could be. Once you start getting into uh, significant, re the only folks in this plan that are getting salary increases are the five folks that kind of got touched by compression from mm -hmm. the last time we tried this, right? If uh, we go in and say we want to, if we know that uh, Durham County is paying 55000 for social workers, we can look at what if we paid 55000 for social workers. Because I, I agree, I think that would be a huge way to keep people here in these seats. We haven't run those costs and seeing do we have enough money to do that in this budget or not. But uh, it, it, it's so important to me to, to make sure we're doing everything we can to help DSS that we would have something back before you on the 16th. And you how also many, have open, yeah, opioid monies. We have ARPA monies. Uh, right now, we're as flush as we're ever going to be. Mm -hmm. We've got to look long term, but we've got to quit training other counties. I think that to use ARPA money uh, is possible. I would be counting heavy on uh, Andrea and Mimi to sit down with us also and look at each one of the positions we were thinking about giving a raise to and saying, Adrian, what of this? What time? What amount of time of this position do you think we could justify saying they're having a COVID-related work? And to me, that could be going into COVID. Uh, positive homes. You know, if you're a child protective service worker and you're having to, when you leave, you don't know if you're going into a COVID home. Uh, there for a while they did, 
when we were doing uh, 911 and tracking it and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I think you know we would try to do it in a way that wouldn't require freezing any position. That would be ideal, but I, I just have a feeling that the dollar amounts we're talking about that will work may, may have that kind of impact. I just don't want us to be a roof that's always leaking somewhere and we constantly are patching it because once you break that seal, it's over. Sir. You just If you go ahead and re-roof it, then look at the money that you haven't wasted until the point where you do re-roof it. So we just got to really think about this and doing something about it. Could we, it's 445. Yeah. Do we need to take a vote? <laughs> Go ahead. I so, so I will say that um, it would have to be my assistant director who would be here on the 16th as I am on vacation Good on for the you. 16th. So. You need, need some time. <laughs> hmm? Any other discussion? But this is the plan right now with these bonuses that we're looking at voting for. That's correct. All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. No, just because I think we need to look at salaries, not bonuses. Well, his motion included taking a look at that. Yeah. So. And she did say that she thought that she had money in her budget to hire the folks that she needed to, along with this. this. That's the only reason I voted for it. With I didn't this. want to vote for it either, because I want to focus mm -hmm. on salaries, because I think that's the problem. Mm -hmm. And I think we could use our money more wisely as we go down the road. Now, I'm not talking about this budget year. I'm talking about next year. Mm -hmm. I think we could use our money a much better way and help her out and get that department up, but we're just going to have to bite the bullet. And this is what I was going to suggest. Could we do something with DSS like I suggested with the sheriff with these positions? Now, if you get on a hiring spree because our salaries are up, people want to come work here, I want to help you get those folks in there. So we're going to have to come back here and mm -hmm. get you some more money mm -hmm. to get those folks in the seats. I'm willing to do that to, as, as I see you perform, as I see you put mm -hmm. these people in the seats. Okay, she needs our help. We need to fulfill her up, help you out, and there, there's money here to do it. As we see you start to do it, and that's what I told the sheriff. If he starts hiring folks, we will go get the money to get those people in the seats. Okay. Guys, okay, we're at 447. Hold yes. on, hold on, hold on. Don't, don't do the no, don't do the vote. Okay. No, we've already voted. Yeah. It voted past 32. <laughs> I want That's your better. salaries high. That's what, higher. I, I, I want to. I want to help you work on this too, and I think I got some ideas that can help you. All right. Well, it passed three to two. Yes. Yeah. Thank so you. So we're good. I'm on <laughs> your board. You need to know I want your salaries better. <laughs> I don't. I, I mean well, that. That's the whole point of this whole issue is to pay people. <laughs> okay. Ms. Hook or uh, you. Brian? Thank are you. you. I think Ms. Hook's going to speak to the health clinic. All right. Mr. Day, thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you very much. Very informative. And Mr. Chairman, I think we all agreed on that, just in term, just in style, I guess. Yeah, just we <laughs> want to get a, we want to get both of these things done. We want to sure. get our people, our, <laughs> our uh, <laughs> help. He's got to go home and do his crunches. Oh. Department of Social <laughs> Services. <laughs> Either that, or have him handcuffed and brought to uh, remove the room. <laughs> I, I'm just telling you what you told me. <laughs> okay, please go. It is true. Um, so I am back before you guys because the last meeting we talked about the contract with Everside Health. This is about the employee health clinic. Um, we took this out to bid. We did have a, um, a proposal from our current provider, but we have looked and we are um, recommending going to Everside Health. This uh, cost is approximately $456,980. $456,908. It's a little bit less than the proposal from our current provider. And then next year, it'll be about $83,000 less than our mm -hmm. current provider. Um, what you've got in front of you is a contract for one year. And um, I'm just here to ask you to approve the contract and answer any questions that you might have. I had David Young from Everside. I don't know if he's on the call, on the here or not, and then Cheryl Ray from County HR is also available. So I think the commissioners had some concern last time to make sure that this contract was for a one-year term period, which it is, um, and the contract that is in the packet is the contract that's been reviewed by the county attorney's office and the company, so it would be the one that uh, the chair would sign upon approval if the board does. 
Is the 456 included, including that 75,000 to upgrade building? It is. That's why it goes down so much next year. It is. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying hi. Aye. 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 Thank Unanimous. You. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Haygood. I think uh, Ms. Evans has two budget amendments to uh, propose to the board. Good afternoon, Commissioners. The first um, budget amendment before you right now is to increase our DSS trust fund, which is Fund 774, by $1.3 million. You'll remember we um, processed this at the end of fiscal year 21 due to GASB 84 regulations, and we need to repeat that now for fiscal year 21-22, and from this point forward, it will be included in our annual audit. I'm sorry, annual budget. So this is no county funds. These are truly funds for DSS clients that we are guardians of for our adult and children. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And the next budget amendment before you is the Home Care Community Block Grant. Um, during our fiscal year 21-22 budget, we were working off of estimates. We now have received our final allocation, which would be an increase in grant revenues of $38,296. Um, there is a required county match um, for one of those programs, which equates to $546. We would do a transfer from the county manager's budget, so there would not be an increase in county funding. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous here. Thank, Thank you. you. Do we have any other public speakers? No, Mr. King. Thank be you. Crazy to wait till now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, I assume there are no commissioner responses <laughs> to the new speakers. Okay, our county manager again. Uh, commissioners, I will just briefly say that uh, we've done a lot of work through the technical review committee and the capital oversight committee. We have uh, worked closely, uh, particularly with ADSS, to come up with uh, information to post on the capital projects website. Uh, Scott, if you could pull that up just real fast. I'm not going to walk through it. I originally tended to, but not at 5 o'clock in the evening. But uh, I wanted to encourage commissioners and the listening public uh, to go to alamancecapitalprojects.com. You can, we've streamlined the website. We've made it very easy to just click on schools, college, county, and then you go to one website piece that uh, you can see, particularly ABSS and the commissioners had an interest in um, uh, their, what the plan was for their 3.3 million a year. And I think they put three or four years on there. Uh, so it's specific to the dollar amounts, the schools and the projects. They've also uh, posted their, um, uh, unfunded list, their list of unfunded projects, a top 10, as well as information about ESSER funding for projects that they would like to do. And uh, that's the same case for ACC and for the, uh, for the county. So really, Scott, if you'll just real quick, go over and click on that, click on that right there. Scroll down and click on uh, five-year CIP PAYGO and click on fiscal year 21-22 PAYGO CIP. There you go. So this shows the commissioners that uh, these are the projects that the schools are planning to, to do this uh, fiscal year. Painting, electrical work, roof work, safety, that is uh, not school specific, but that's at the school's request, right? So uh, security. This is a, yes, just uh, for security purposes, uh, they are planning to spend uh, 1.1 million. The school system wanted to be sure we understood at the county that these are fluid projects, that if something happens, if, a, if something breaks and they reallocate, that, that can happen, right? But it's the same thing for, for our CIP. We have a plan, we're working on those projects, but if something goes down, it's more important than what's on the original plan list. They reserve the right to change. We would expect them to do that, I'm sure. Um, and really, if you go back, Scott, I'm sorry, I can't, I just, I can't resist. Uh, if, you'll, if you'll click on Alamance Burlington School System again, please, just right there. Scroll down, we've got some definitions there. That has been a real problem for folks, myself included. What, what do these terms mean? If you'll click on uh, unfunded projects, Scott, the big question mark, thank you. So there are their top 10 unfunded projects. They, you know, so they have the education bonds, they have five years of 3.3 million in PAYGO. They have a couple of capital reserve projects. Commissioners, uh, they have 70 million, which is on this page too, of unfunded 
But the commissioner specifically asked for the top 10. These are the top 10 that the school system uh, has listed. You scroll down a little bit, Scott, just on that page. There's their uh, projects that have come out of that $73 million list that may be able to be funded with ESSER, which is their ARP type monies. And you scroll down just a little bit further. There is the comprehensive list of all unfunded projects. That's big. It, it, it's, it's really helpful to have this information from the school system to be able to give the commissioners. What I hope to be able to do is visit this. We'll talk about these projects at every TRC and OSC uh, meeting that we have. But then at the end of this fiscal year, toward the end, I think it would be appropriate to ask the school system to give us information about how these plans panned out, which of these projects were actually able to be done. Obviously, not all will. Something's going to break. It's going to mean some funds got diverted to the, to the crisis. But it's, it's really helpful to have it from ABSS and ACC. They have very similar data on the college. And we've, we've done the same thing with the county, although we're working a little bit on ours uh, to, to make sure it's updated with some of this language. But I'm very pleased. I hope, I hope this helps the commissioners see this. I think the school system is pleased with the plans and information that they've given. And we'll keep this very transparent. And we'll keep this website updated. But just uh, at your leisure, peruse it. If you have any questions, for the school system, you, you, at me or Dr. Benson or Todd are happy to answer. So um, I know it's a very quick flyover, but I wanted you to see it and, and for the general public to know it exists. Because I know you get questions about what are they doing with the 3.3 million? What, what are they doing with the bond projects? It's all right there and as, uh, it's pretty well updated. I think it's very timely information. So that, that's all that I have, Mr. Chair. But, uh, you want to mention uh, the legal department and uh, Mr. Albright's news about a position in his office. I think I'd defer to Mr. Albright on that. I'm not prepared to discuss that at this time. I'm still All right. Working. We just want to thank that individual for exceptional work. He's, um, still, he's still here. He hasn't left, Joe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, he's been a tremendous asset to Alamance County, and I just personally wanted to say that. Mr. Chairman, a quick question, Mr. Hager. Mr. Hager, the, uh, with respect to the top ten for ABSS, um, I noticed there's there's not a schedule there on when those are requested to be to be done. Do you expect that through the technical review committee process, the oversight committee process, that there will be recommendations on when these things need to be done by? Absolutely. I think uh, Scott, if you, if you wouldn't mind going back that real fast to the to the top ten, you got to go back to the ABSS sure. page. There we go. So. Uh, yeah, this, we, we've just seen these, so now is the time. It's the great thing about this, as you get more data, you can have better conversations Absolutely. about how to address these problems. Right, right. So I think one thing we learned uh, about the top ten is, if you'll scroll back up just a little bit, Scott, right there, three of those are traffic concerns. Uh, I think uh, the school systems indicated they would be fully, we believe, fully reimbursable by DOT. Right. So I think at our next TRC meeting, we'll be talking about, at those three schools, it, I wouldn't be surprised if schools may want to come to you to, once we confirm that is fully reimbursable. They may want to use some of their capital reserves to go ahead and get those in DOT's hopper so we can be reimbursed and have that work done, right? So we may be able to knock a few of these out really quick, which I don't know what really quick is when it comes to DOT. That could be another year. <laughs> but at least it would start. It, sure. DOT has said, from what I've understood from ABSS, they really won't earmark any DOT funds until they know the upfront money is there. That may be something that we want to look at. The other projects we'll be talking with ABSS about how do we intend to fund these, uh, you know, what, what's the next step. But just having this listed this way, able to present to you, uh, enables these conversations to happen. So. And then we can have a conversation about the next 10. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which can change at any minute. Yes, absolutely. Do we, we have a motion to adjourn? I'll make that motion. So moved. To adjourn. Second. All in favor? Uh, Say I and leave. That's a hopper word. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioners Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. Typically, the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on LocalGovTV. 
Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.